Hello, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to day two of the ACCEF 2022 conference. Yesterday, we took our entire time and we focused on addressing the issues surrounding education within the continent of Africa, and our array of speakers brought to the fore specific solutions that they believe us as Africans can begin to adopt if we must create the Africa of our dreams. And from yesterday's sessions, we learned so much. I did have so many people in the comment session sharing with us their take homes as to what they will begin to implement. Today, we're doing it again, but today we are going to be focusing on youth development. If you'd notice, the theme for Access 2022 is restructuring education and youth development for the Africa we want. So today we're focusing on youth development. My name is Just Amomo Ibe, and with me is our co-founder, Edith Njage, all the way from Kenya, East Africa. Edith, it is great to have you here today. Thank you so much, Just. Thank you so much. Edith is going to be our, um, she's going to be the one to open up today. But before we go into the intricacies of today's conversation, as you've noticed, one of the first things we usually will do is start with an opening prayer. So if you are here, please do well to tell us in the comment section what part of the world you're joining us from. Tell us how excited you are. We would love to know in the comment section because we want to travel this journey today with you. We want to be certain you are listening. So yes, we would love to know in the comment section what part of Africa you're joining from, or even if you're not joining from Africa, anywhere in the world, do well to share in the comment section so we can say personalized hello and welcome to you. That being said, we will start today's conversation by an opening prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you because you conceived a thing and you transferred it in the hearts of your daughters and we ran with it for the sake of the continent of Africa. We thank you because we know that at the center of your agenda in the world today is Africa at the focal point. We ask, oh Lord, that our daily movements like this or daily initiatives or daily efforts to bring to birth the things that you see for Africa, we ask that you crown them with success. That as we consist consistently deliberate on matters affecting the continent of Africa, that you continue to give us the grace to implement it and create the results that we must create for our dear continent. We also ask, oh God, that by conversations like this, you are waking in the hearts of Africans at both home and abroad, a patriotic and a pan-African spirit so that they would see their personal responsibility to their continent. And so that when it is time for the troop to consistently gather, to move an agenda forward, their hearts will be knitted to the vision. We ask, oh Lord, that you create that seed, that seed that will germinate and to come like wildfire across the continent so that all of us hearts will be towards the same thing because when a people's heart agree upon a thing it shall be established so we ask that you plant the seeds across africa and let that seed begin to germinate until we birth the africa of our dreams we ask that you take control of today's conversation let every speaker speak the things that we must hear we must know in order to advance this agenda in jesus name we have prayed amen amen all right, everyone, welcome to day two of the ACCEPT 2022 conference. Today, we are speaking around restructuring youth development for the Africa we want. To lead us further into today's conversation, we are going to have my dear co-founder, Edith Njage, have the opening speech. But before she goes forward, I would like to just read just a little bit about her. Hi, Edith from New Jersey, in the United States. Oh, fantastic. Say saw the updates from Honorable Treasure Dominion. Fantastic, it is from New Jersey. It is great to see you here today. Oh, you, you share the same name with our yeah. co-founder. So it's great to see you, Edith. <laughs> it's great to see you. Um, Edith Njage is a social and serial entrepreneur based in Africa. She holds a Master of Science in International Business with a major in Disruptive Innovation and a Master of Science in Finance, both from Health International Business School. It is holds a Bachelor of Business Administration with a major in finance and a Bachelor in Business Management with a major in economics. She's a mentor to 3,655 young people in Africa as a director and chief servant of Westlands Job Creation Limited, which has gently managed to create over 200,000 jobs 
across 13 African markets with a joint venture partners. That's so impressive. Edith is a co-founder and chief steward of Ariel for Africa Limited, which aims to create over 100,000 jobs in Africa through business support, disruptive business models, mentorship, and funding for entrepreneurs. They are currently working with entrepreneurs in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Libya, South Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana. She's also the Ambassador, East African Business Council, and Vice Chairperson for the Independent Continental Youth Advisory Council on the AFCFTA, ICOYACA. Edith Njage, it is great to have you here today. Please take us away. Oh my gosh. You know, sometimes when people read your bio, you're like, is that me? <laughs> I'm always like, is that me? Oh my God. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I think I'll start by saying, first of all, to our esteemed panelists, to our speakers, our leaders, our experts, and of course, our audience and invited guests. Welcome, 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 and good morning. Um, I am feeling so blessed to have you all um, at AGCEF Day 2, right, of this conference, which is a joint collaboration and a birthing um, from the Association of African Startups, the Just eBay Company, and Ariel for Africa. Um, and for us, I normally say the mission at AGCEF is very simple. What we aim to do is so, it's so simple. I think anyone, even a child can understand it. For us, we are basically attacking the root causes of all the problems that Africa is facing today. What does this mean? A lot of conversations, a lot of deliberations, a lot of focus is normally put into uh, the symptoms that Africa sees, right? So a lot of people will try and attack uh, poverty, we'll try and attack hunger, we'll try and attack um, what you're seeing on the surface. But the question is, what is the root cause? What got Africa to that it is, position? It is, is, it, is it just me? I think that it's something, I don't know if that's just me, your network. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, it's better. Go ahead now. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I think, okay, I think I'm fine now. Um, so for us, it's attacking the root problems of everything that we're seeing on the continent. And this for us starts with this year's conference, which is, you know, restructuring education and youth development for the Africa that we want to see. Not what we're seeing today, but what we want to see. So Africa right now, even if we look at the statistics and we look at everything, we have the youngest population in the world. So more than 400 million young people right now are between the ages of 15 to 35. And 70% of our population is under 30 years old. This is interesting. Why? Because at the end of the day, the majority are what are young people. However, when you look at the key platforms, when you look at decision making, when you look at leadership, when you look at uh, influence, impact, wealth, it's not the young people that we're seeing. So what does this mean? It means 70% of the population has been excluded from the table that is Africa. And we talk about when we talk about the Africa that we want to see, Vision 2063, who will be there for it? Who needs to work on it? You know, who is the engine for this vision? It is those between 15 to 35. Because right now they're at their peak. By the time we're getting to 2063, they'll be handing over to the next generation. So the question is, if we, between the ages of 15 to 35, are the people that should be pioneering the Africa that we want to see, then the question is, where are we in these conversations? Where's our seat on the table? But first, before I even get too far into this conversation, the Africa that I want to see is very simple, and I want to describe it to you because I want us to look at it together. The Africa that I want to see is, number one, run by the youth. What do I mean? I mean, I want to see young people at every strata of society. I want to see young people 
in politics. I want to see young people in leadership. I want to see young people in the investment space. I want to see young people uh, running universities and institutions. I want to see young people in decision making. I want to see young people in specialized areas. I want to see young people in entrepreneurship. Number two, not a seat at the table, but realization that we are the table. Young people on this continent, we do not just deserve a seat on the table. I think it needs to dawn onto us that we are the entire table. We are 70%, meaning we should be occupying 70% of the table, whether or not permission is granted. I always say some of these things we must take by force. And that is why AgSef is here. No one invited us to host this platform. No one encouraged us to do this. We have done it by force. <laughs> there was no please and thank you. It was, <laughs> it was a decision that was made. And then finally, number three, I want women, young women especially, and I hope they're hearing me today. I want them to understand their place in business. I came across a statistic that I feel is very important to share. When one invests into a business owned and run by a woman, the return on that business is 112%. Versus when someone invests into a business run by a male founder, the return is 48%. What does this tell us? The return from women-owned businesses is more than twofold what male-owned businesses are doing. But if you look into the investment space, if you're a black woman, you're only getting 0 0.02 of the total funding available. So what does this show us? It shows us that women on the continent, and when we talk about youth development, guess what? It spills into entrepreneurship. It spills into money. It spills into investment. It spills into business. So what I want women on the continent, and young women, right, under the age of 35 to understand is that when you start these businesses, because this is under your development, you are more profitable already based on history and based on statistics and based on facts. So the level to which you must carry yourself is the same excellence as that which you will deliver. Finally, I want decent work. Decent work for the, for, for the youth, meaning what? Decent, humane, and must be purpose and passion driven. These days, young people were willing to settle for anything and everything. And I understand because we must eat. I understand. But at the same time, governments need to stop move. They need to move away from, okay, let's get young people to collect trash, which is good. It helps the environment. And let's get into decent work. How do we get them into professions that will feed the continent long term? I mean, sustainable professions that are purpose and passion driven. What do young people want to do is the question. Not what do you want young people to do? What do they want to do? What do we want to do is the question. And then finally, I think having wealth. And when I say wealth, I'm using this word very specifically. I'm not talking about riches, okay? Because riches is you open the bank account, it will tell you how rich or poor you are. I want to see wealth amongst young people. And by wealth, I mean, I want to see economic wealth. I want to see political wealth. I want to see social wealth. I want to see emotional and mental wealth. That we have young people that are stable, that are all rounded. I know all the time in platforms like this, people talk about money, 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 and it's important, but it's only one element of the wealth that I am talking about. It's only one fraction. So I want to see how does the wealth inside us as young people evolve. It's good. Get your property, secure your bag. I am behind you. But as you do that, what is your emotional intelligence like? What is your social capital like? What, what does your circle look like? That's the value that you're providing to the world. And even as we're talking about this, are you passionate about what you do every single day but because when we talk about youth development you cannot develop in an area that you're not passionate about so then the question becomes do you love what you do every day when you wake up 
do you wake up with that zeal, that excitement of, I am so excited to get the day started because I love what I do? Or is it something where you're doing it for the coin? You know, I asked someone a question. I said, okay, so what's the point of us going to work? And they said, um, so I can pay my bills. Okay, so then I asked another question. So you're basically existing to make money, pay bills, and then die. And after that conversation, the person, I think, was very surprised because it's, it's, it's not something that they had considered for themselves, that at the end of the day, they were doing what they were doing simply to pay the bills. Can we as young people get beyond paying the bills in our thinking? And I remember one of the speakers yesterday, um, he mentioned this. He said, it's about your mindset. And he really emphasized it yesterday. So where is your mindset as a young person? I want to see young people leading in STEM and in innovation. I know a lot of focus has been, okay, we're young people in leadership and politics, and that's fantastic. But I also want to ask, where are young people in STEM? Where are young women in STEM? Where are they in innovation? And then to the policymakers, are you listening? Because a lot of times it's policy that works against the innovation that we create. We innovate every single day. There are so many fintechs that have come up. But when you come and you look at it, they put all of these strict and stringent uh, um, policies in place and all of these red tapes and all of these things that you must take, must do. And the thing is, it's not publicly available. So you have to hire the who's who for them to explain it to you. And then you have to start lobbying entrepreneurs we don't have time to lobby that's a different profession altogether so save us our time people in the policy space and listen to innovators then the other thing is that at the end of the day i want to see higher paying opportunities for young people i know not everyone can go and become an entrepreneur not everyone can go and become an innovator not everyone can go and build from scratch right it's a gift it's for few me i don't lie it's for few it needs a special type of thick skin right to become an entrepreneur but one of the statistics that we found as access is that up to 50,000 africans who have secured, okay, PhDs, 50,000, so that you understand what sort of capital this is. This is the human capital that I'm talking about, excellent human capital. So up to 50,000 of them are working outside the continent. What does that say? It says that the best of us is not even here. Africa was so good. We get so excited. Okay, so and so has been accepted to Harvard. Everybody's clapping, shouting, running. You know, we raise the money. We send them to Harvard. And then what? Then they stay in the U.S. and they serve the U.S. But yet they were born in Africa, built for Africa, but they're serving in the wrong location. Can I blame them? No, because I understand that they need the opportunities. They have a lot of mental capital, but they need that to be utilized. But are they being utilized on the continent? No. Why? Because we still have the who's who that are running the continent. So it's hard to make space for different thinkers, for people that challenge our way of life, for people that challenge what we have seen as the norm. A lot of these people who are holding these PhDs, they're not normal thinkers, right? They're coming to challenge us. But a lot of times that challenge is uncomfortable. And so for me, I say, let's provide opportunities, but not only that, higher paying opportunities. Let's begin to pay people what they are worth. That's really important. And this starts on the institutional level. And it trickles throughout the continent. But even as I continue to talk about this, I know that the only barrier that we are facing today is as young people, number one, your habits every single day, your grit and your diligence. If you're able to address these three things, meaning what do I do every single day and does it develop me as a young person? Youth development is not the job of government, is not the job of outside providers. It is my job first. My development is my responsibility. Your development is your responsibility first. 
the government cannot come and do what you are not doing in your own life. The NGOs cannot come and do what you are not doing in your own life. AGSEF cannot come and do what you are not doing in your own life. So start within yourself. The habits that you have every single day, the diligence that you carry in yourself every single day, and then the grit, meaning what? The resilience. I normally say bold audacity, meaning don't ask for permission. Take it by force. You must be bold, you must be audacious as a young person to get anywhere. And on that note, I would like to thank the speakers for today. I know they are going to come through with a lot of thoughts, wisdom, knowledge that they're going to share with you. I would also like to thank the entire team that is running this inside AgSef, led by our very own Just Omomo Ibe, who is the best leader that we could have asked for. And then finally, to the Almighty, because I believe it is a new day in this continent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much with a rousing round of applause. I mean, we may not have an audience, but I'm going to clap. I am going to clap. Thank you so Thank much, you. Mr. Jage. I, I see your passion for the young Africans. It's unflinching. I have seen you push boundaries. I have seen you shatter ceilings. I have seen you pull deals from places that were not possible because of young people in Africa. I have seen you attract foreign investment for our young people in Africa. And you know, um, beautifully so with the Pan-African spirit. I have seen you consistently do that. I've seen you truly see fantastic opportunities and you're not swept by the names, but you're focused on how can this truly be beneficial for my people. I've seen you do that again and again. And so it just makes sense to see you actually speak to the future of youth development in Africa. Africa is blessed to have you. Africa is honored to have you. Africa truly cannot wait to see you institutionalize platforms like this that will allow them thrive seamlessly. And I always wanna say, I always say to people that when, when I count my blessings, I can't eat it. It's funny how we met. <laughs> you remember that conversation? Yes, <laughs> on how, something like this. <laughs> yes, we both were not meant to be on that platform, but some, so for some reason, God disrupted our plans and we had to be on that platform to meet each other. And the rest, they say, is history. We have partnered together to build several things. Accent is one of them. Yeah. And that means that, guys, um, from synergies like this, it is and I have not seen each other physically, but we have built things again and again and continue to build things. Like the speakers who spoke yesterday, collaboration is the way forward for us in Africa. And she said something I truly want to quickly speak to about the fact that most of the best minds or the brightest minds we have in Africa are shipped abroad. Not necessarily because it may be their fault, but of course for better opportunities. And we understand that. But you see, it's important that we begin to awaken the hearts of young Africans, a patriotic and pan-African spirit. It's important. When we speak to things like this and people don't understand it, it's because they don't understand the economic advantage of patriotism and pan-Africanism. The economic advantage is such that if we don't understand this for the rest of our lives, we would keep living a life of exploitation, both at the colonial level and the neo-colonial level. It means that if we do not believe in the future, if we do not believe that our contributions matter to our dear continent, you would find that people will consistently take advantage of the resources we have, whether it is natural resources, whether it's mineral resources, whether it is human resources. So it's important that we as young Africans begin to think patriotism and pan-Africanism. Africa is ours today, tomorrow, forever. And the legacies we're going to pass down is dependent on our understanding and our preservation of that patriotic and pan-African spirit. So if we don't understand and preserve it, we cannot pass it down as legacies that our children are going to take. And for the risk of building an Africa that may go extinct, we need to begin to enforce it at this level of conversation. Say so what you're building, you need to think about how to build what you're building for Africa and by Africans. It doesn't mean you cannot serve the global market. Of course you should serve the global market, but that's not going to be extra expert exporting. You're exporting your expertise to different parts of the world. At that point, you're serving your people and then you're exporting your expertise to the rest of the world. It's not as though everything you know and do and have and be is simply to serve 
the entire, I mean, to serve the West and all those other um, developed nations and your own home is left unattended to. I think that as Africans, these are conversations we should begin to have. Thank you so much, Edith, for really speaking to a lot of these things. Um, it's great to have you, Dr. I mean, Dr. Christian Danla, the African lecturer at Princeton University, New Jersey. It is great to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I see there was also somebody from New Jersey who joined earlier, Edith from New Jersey. It is great to have you here today. For those of you who didn't join us yesterday, today is day two of what we call restructuring education and youth development for the Africa we want. One of the things we want to achieve with this is create singular systems, frameworks, and institutions where all of Africa can adopt and begin to function from that singular framework. And the reason why this is important is because as developing nations or as a developing continent, you would see that in order for us to bridge the inequality gap on the African continent, we need to begin to look at different um, cadres of society through the same lens. It means that a youth from Libya should have access to the same kind of opportunity a youth from Nigeria or Ghana or Nairobi should have. Until we have that level of equity, we will find that our youths will not have comparative advantage. And what that continues to do is it begins to consistently mar our ability for peace and unity. Because if we don't have equal opportunities, one other person felt, feels left behind. And then when it's time for unity, they're like, no, why should I be one with you? You have access to more. If I get into an, an opportunity, you will get it and I won't get it. We don't want that in Africa. We are one people. And we must begin to create systems, frameworks, institutions that allow us to see each other through that lens. And it starts with conversations like this, education and youth development, which are the core pillars of the growth and development of any nation, Africa inclusive. So thank you all who, all of those who are joined right now. Please do well to invite a lot more people who should be a part of this conversation. You can also do well to, you know, um, share this link with as many people as possible. To move us further into today's conversation, we're going to be inviting our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is a young man who I met through one of our senior mentors. And she said to me, you need to meet Ambassador Hassan. She said, she said to me very clearly, and then she made an introduction between us, the rest they say is history. Now I'm going to read his bio very quickly and bring him up to address us today. Ambassador Dr. Hassan Rengo is currently the president of the African Union Youth Assembly for Turkey. He is he is a serial and social entrepreneur and a humanitarian. He is a chairman and board of the Association of African Future Leaders. He is the founder and CEO of World Youth Summit, NPC. It's a youth-led nonprofit organization and member of the United Nations Global Compact based in South Africa and represented by hubs in USA, Gambia, and Cameroon. For the past seven years, Dr. Hassan has carried upon himself the task to contribute to the empowerment of young people, particularly the young girls in achieving intellectual independence. I love that and financial freedom. The ex-minister of youth at the State of the African Diaspora is an international partner to the World Business Angel Forum. And through this platform, he helps young entrepreneurs get funded or sponsored by angel investors. Dr. Hassan is an ambassador of the Commonwealth Entrepreneur Club and Federal Association for the Advancement of Visible Minority. Finally, Dr. Hassan has hosted the, has organized and hosted the World Youth Summit in five different countries so far since 2019, including Cyprus, South Africa, UAE, Ghana, and Nigeria. To help us welcome to our platform today, Ambassador Dr. Hassan Rengo Mfaki. Let's do this with a rousing round of applause. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. It is great to have you here today. Uh, thanks so much. A really wonderful presentation, I must say. Really, thanks so much. Um, I can only see myself and you and uh, Mr. Edith uh, Jange, but I believe that there is a huge uh, crowd, uh, crowd watching us now all over the world. I've been following yesterday through YouTube, and really, you're doing amazing. Uh, really, uh, it's my first time to deliver a keynote speech, you know, when it is not an event that I'm hosting, because uh, most of the time I'm always engaging young people in session uh, because there I have the opportunity to share uh, my own life story and inspire them then through that. So uh, thanks so much. You said it all. So I'm uh, Hassan, Dr. Hassan Rengu. 
uh, I got my honorary uh, um, doctorate degree in humanitarianism for the work that I've been doing all around the world, uh, particularly also in uh, Africa and in the Middle East, to try to uh, let the people, let the young people know that it is time for them to discover their purpose in this life. Because whenever, when you don't have your purpose in life, you haven't discovered that then really... Um, I don't want to say this, but you are still moving around. So it is right time for you young people, uh, no matter what you have studied, no matter where you are now, to try to see if you can find your purpose. You can also do that through a mentorship, like the mentorship of Miss Joss or Momo is doing a wonderful job. So I prepare a, 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 a small speech, you know, a keynote speech for this, but I might be interrupting sometimes, you know, to explain myself why I'm writing this or that. Uh, but before I start, I would like to say something that, uh, this world is not working for African, for most of the Africans sometimes for something, for one thing. Uh, uh, the thing is that the world is designed in two ways. I mean, the, the economic world, the, the world of rich people, the world of poor, I mean, the world we live in, why the, the world, we are living a hard world, why other people are living so good and they don't feel it. And as the time passed by, these people continue getting rich and getting more comfortable. Why us, you know, I mean, the other side is getting, you know, a poorer and getting, you know, uh, um, and their situation getting worse. This is only because these people are in, uh, I would call it a resolve, or I would call it a, let's say a platform. Just imagine a, the world divided into two platforms. The first platform is made of those people who are skillful, and the second platform is made of those people who are not skillful. So this is the division between uh, the, uh, I mean, in the world that we are living in, because those people who are skillful will continue empowering the people from their own spectrum. And they will not want to, you know, take anyone uh, from the unskillful platform to add on theirs. So that is how um, uh, the, their world keep getting, you know, better and better, or, or why uh, the, the world of those who are not skillful uh, keep getting worse. So uh, it is very right time to encourage all of us, to encourage young leaders to do just like Miss Joss is doing in becoming, I mean, in helping others becoming uh, change makers not just changing the life of those people, but helping them as well to become change makers. So I would like to ask uh, for a request for Miss Joss, if she can allow me to be seeing her because I'm feeling like I'm just talking to myself and sometimes, you know, yeah, thanks so much. So it's better like this, yeah. So I was just saying that uh, what Miss Joss is doing as the change maker, she's also helping other young people across the world and across Africa in particular in particular to become change maker as well because that is the only way we can really solve the issue we are facing in africa that's the only way we can bring africa to the map of powerful continent like other nation because if we if i know the knowledge that helped me for example get hundred thousand dollars a month and i help somebody only with the money really it is not enough but if I give him the education that I'm having, that allow me to have that $100,000 a month, then I'm helping him to become a change maker. And if he does the same for other people, this is how we are going to develop ourselves. So I just wanted to stress on that to thank you, uh, Ms. Joss Omomo, for what you're doing. You're doing a great job and we are only looking, you know, up to you and following your steps, of course. You are a trailblazer and I can only pray God to give you longevity and prosperity in what you do. So... I won't share uh, of my story today because, you know, uh, it's a keynote speech. So all protocol observe uh, leadership of the organizing committee. Uh, it's an honor to have been invited to deliver a keynote speech uh, or keynote address at this life changing program. The topic uh, of my speech is youth development as a catalyst towards, uh, towards building a thriving and uh, sustainable African society. Uh, as we all know, the best investment in this life is human investment. And uh, if uh, Africa wishes to be developed, it is necessary to start investing massively, mass massively uh, on the best asset that it has. And that best asset is the youth. So it is the right time for all uh, for young leaders in Africa to start investing on their youth. This leads me to wanting to quote some words from Ms. Uh, Shiro Pemba Cleopatra, uh, who is the African Union Chairperson uh, Envoy on Youth. She says, Africa's renaissance cannot be realized if adequate investment is not made in the youth and their human capital development. And she added their educational capacitation matters. 
So everything comes from the education. That is why I love the, 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 the term of this conference, restructuring uh, education and youth development. So I will put here some bracket to just try to shed some light uh, in what I just said, uh, you know, in reference to uh, the, the quote from uh, Ms. Shido Cleopatra. The education in Africa is broken. And I will always say this wherever I go. It's broken because it is alienating us, young people in Africa. Somebody like me who is a proven, I mean, who is a, uh, uh, how can I say this, who is a, a true witness of two side uh, education, I am the right person to talk about that. Uh, you know, when I compare myself when I was studying engineering, electrical engineering in Africa, in Cameroon, before I move, you know, uh, to Europe, find my purpose and start doing something quite different, I realized that the education that we are having in Africa, we just following, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry for those who are from Europe or America here in the platform, but we just flow following the, the colonial master kind of plan. How am I saying this? I'm saying it because those people who are engineer, for example, let's just say somebody who is a mechanical engineer, who is normally supposed in the US, supposed to conceptualize and build machine and build cars. They are not doing the same. And sometimes when they do, you will find that it is not perfect the same way it is, you know, in the other side. So this makes an imperfection and, you know, a decalage and uh, a non-equilibrium before, uh, uh, you know, on the two type of education. Because the one from the West is more practical, you know, you touching everything that you do, you trying to, you know, uh, uh, implement, you know, or conceptualize whatever you're learning. But in Africa, you mostly learn. You mostly read and you mostly go and write the exam and pass. So most of us in Africa that study in Africa, the education we're following is not really designed, uh, you know, to solve the problem, the issue that we are facing daily on our society. So it is time for us to reform that education, to restructure that education in making sure that everybody who is studying in any field, whatever, should be able, you know, to implement that and try to make a living and then uh, empower and impact the community around him or herself. So towards the topic above, I would like to throw light on uh, engineering. Uh, at his, uh, it is part of the catalyst toward building a thriving and sustainable African, engineer, uh, African society. And when I mean engineering, I would like to stress on the fact that this engineering is not the engineering that we are studying now. It's the engineering, for example, in agriculture. And after you have learned theoretically, you were able to also go and implement it, you know, practically and gain that knowledge, both practical and theoretical. So I'm talking about that engineering from the reform, from the restructure education that we are working, you know, towards, you know, the accomplishment of that in Africa. So to start, Africa has the youngest population in the world with more than 400 million uh, young people aged between the age of 15 to 35. Most of these people are coming from the South Saharan uh, region in Africa. Uh, such a youthful population calls for an increase of investment in economic and social development factors in order to improve the development index of African nation or society. Youth development is a process that prepares a young person to meet the challenges of adolescence and uh, adulthood uh, as achieve his or her full potential. It is promoted through activities and experiences that help you develop social, ethical, emotional, physical, and cognitive competence. So when you come here, you see that youth development is uh, that factor that will help every young person here to be developed. Uh, anything that can help him, you know, uh, um, use anything that he got, you know, uh, uh, whether he, he was born with that, whether it's a talent, whether it's a skill that he learned, use that thing now to develop himself, impact the life of the, the community around him and also excel. So uh, towards a prosperous, and, a prosperous and sustainable Africa, it is important to consider building engineering capacity. The average number of engineers across country in sub-Saharan Africa is estimated to be less than one engineer per 100,000 people. And these engineers sometimes are not even the real engineer I'm talking about. They are not the engineer of the revolution. They are not engineer of the restructural education that we are all looking for. They are only theoric theoricians, I may say. And this report is coming from the UNESCO in 2010 in reference. Fewer than half of Africa's countries have professional engineering institutions. As population growth increases, the shortage of engineers is getting worse because uh, universities are not keeping up. Tanzania, for example, graduates only 1,700 engineers a year from its university. 
and many cannot find jobs because of poor quality programs. So you see, I'm referring to what I just said before. So in order to be thriving towards sustainability in Africa, the catalyst has to be an ultimate outcome of each of its two direct beneficial groups, beneficiary groups, engineering universities in Africa. So Africa has a large number of engineers whose knowledge, skills, and competence meet recognized international standards. However, most of these engineers are unable to conceptualize. To help making this a reality, for example, uh, the organization I'm leading, World Youth Summit uh, NPC, has developed a project to build the African Institute of Agripreneurship and Trade. This institute, uh, you know, uh, uh, which has the mission to build engineers, entrepreneurs in the field of agriculture, IT, and trade. These professional engineering institutions have to be effective in working for the public good and ensuring the accountability of Africans. Put in another way, capacity building of this organization is needed to improve both the quality and quantity of engineers in Africa. The key capacity building uh, is accreditation. Accreditation is what, is what gives the African catalyst concept uh, to its uh, teeth. Without accreditation of the education, uh, uh, its competence of engineer, a capacity building would leave Africa and universities will much be weaker offer to engineers and engineering students. This can be understood as follow. The overall goal is to build real professional engineering capacity by improving education and competence. A fundamental enabler of this improvement in university engineering courses, which can only happen if the engineering profession is properly regulated in each African countries. Proper regulation requires PEIs and accreditation bodies that meet recognized international standards themselves. Accredited African PEIs and universities will be more attractive to African engineers and engineering students because of significantly improved career prospects. As their registration revenue increase, the capacity of the PEIs and universities will further increase, creating a virtuous cycle in professional engineering. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, part of this, uh, you know, a program. Uh, this is a call to all our leaders in Africa, our political leaders, because whenever we are not here into uh, a leadership forum, but of course, uh, everything that we do here, you know, involves leadership. It is time that we really call on the attention of all our leaders, political leaders or leaders in all aspects to start thinking about uh, what I just, you know, said through my speech, that it is important to really reform the education that we are having so that we can allow our talentious, you know, young people from Africa to start, you know, uh, showcasing what they got, get the right education and be able to change our life with it. So uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, that was a short speak, um, a short speech, and uh, I'm looking forward for any question if there is. Thank you so much, Mitchell. Thank you so much. I would bring our co-founder Edith on so that we can both, you know, discuss what you have said, ask questions, and then be able to just arrive at a conclusive um, conversation so that we can let you go because it's important that some of the things you mentioned. I mean, some, one of the speakers yesterday, I think, spoke about it. The speaker that was from Kenya that was talking about building a platform where she creates certifications for technical skills. One of the speakers spoke mm -hmm. to that yesterday. And you were speaking today about accreditation of engineering for our engineering youth on the African continent. And you gave a very shocking statistic. One in every 100,000, that's a huge gap. We don't even yeah. have enough and yeah. we have so many of them leaving the continent of Africa. What do you yeah. think as yeah. a people we can do to make the skill, um, the technical skills in Africa a lot more attractive to our young people? So now I want to speak to it in two different perspectives. It's wanting to learn a technical skill and want to build something with it here on the African continent. And it's another thing to learn a technical skill and be thinking about the foreign market because of the reward that you would get for, you know, I mean, for being that skilled worker in a foreign land. I want us to speak to two different things here. How do we make the technical skill very attractive in Africa so that our young people are a lot more interested in learning these technical skills so that they can do something worthwhile with it here? as opposed to having them trained and shipping them out of here to go develop other nations. Do you see what I'm saying? 
Yeah, I get your point. Uh, what I want to add here uh, on top of the, uh, the, 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 the question, uh, I mean, this is discussion, so I'm feeling free. Uh, I wanted to say that, uh, first of all, the first thing is to, first of all, identify what we really need in Africa. For example, I will take an, uh, an example. If we are focusing, for example, in uh, helping uh, or giving the right skill to young people, for example, to start building cars in Africa, for example, does Africa really need those cars? This is a kind of, I would call it as a, 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 I mean, a, a light question, but this question is really deep when you try to understand what I'm trying to say. If we really need the car, then it is really very needful for us to start giving the skill for those young people, to those young people to be able to do so. But if we don't really need, it is time for us to identify the sectors and the areas which can help develop our continent and each nation in Africa. So I will take, for example, the agriculture. Or, or let me say on the, uh, how they call it again, Wally Somi, for example, did a survey and uh, on 100 person living abroad in Turkey, for example, who are Africans, when we talk about them believing in agriculture, 90 of them don't believe at all. So how do, we, how do we showcase that agriculture? Let them know to those young people that agriculture is really the, the change that we need. It's really the, the, the catalyst of change that we need in Africa. And it is time for those young people to start getting attracted to that. So everything depends on the way we're selling it. And we can only sell it through our education. We can only sell it through the leadership. So it is time if we can be able to develop and help those engineers, give them the skill to find some ways to see how we can, you know, leave from the traditional uh, 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 um, agriculture to a kind of revolutionary agriculture that can attract more young people in Africa to, to, to study uh, the field of agriculture and remain in Africa, then we will have succeeded. So, because when we talk about engineering, I was just talking, you know, to just, uh, you know, uh, you know, shed the light on uh, on the general aspect. But we have to identify the sectors of engineering. For example, I'm from electrical engineering. I'll, just to let you know, that engineering cannot help me in my country uh, unless they only take me like a, a worker who is just following, you know, and answering, yes, sir, yes, madam, and going and doing some, I don't know, electrical installation uh, in, in one house or another, which is not really what an engineer is supposed to do. An engineer is supposed to create. An engineer is supposed to, to have that knowledge that, he, that can be able to make something new. So how can we make things new for the fuel that are really necessary for Africa to be developed? So the, the identification of the fuel of development of our continent is necessary. And then bringing the education would not be a problem because we just know where to find the right education. We know that we have knowledgeable people in Africa, as you just said, who are running and going abroad to stay there because of the reward they are getting. So are we able to offer them those rewards or even more than that so that they can be able to stay and remain in Africa and build other engineers? So this go, uh, this send me back again to what I said from the beginning that if we can be able to solve the issue of the two platform that I said in the beginning, if the skillful can help others to become skillful, then we are going to have a developed Africa. But in Africa, we are having skillful, we are living, who are leaving the continent because of poor payment to go and get the reward abroad. And then they remain there. I like what you've said, Ambassador, but I'm, I'm also now thinking, just from what you're saying, uh, our teachers have a big place to play, right? Or a big part to play. If I think back to my early childhood years, um, they would say, you know, go become a doctor, a lawyer, uh, or an accountant. Those were the ones. So they would really push us towards the white-collar jobs or to those that fit within a certain image, right? And it's possible yeah. because those ones have always been exalted um, by Africans or, or by the West, right? So being a farmer is not something that's sold as a career, that's sustainable but yet this supports majority of african economies being an entrepreneur running an sme is not cool right when you're in school it's not even something that people think about until they're in their late 20s and realize this is the right way to make money um so i think then uh, is what we're also saying that perhaps there's a level of education or awareness that needs to happen for early childhood teachers mm. Mm. Yeah, the reform always come. I don't know. It's like Miss Joss was uh, disagreeing. Uh, I was just 
Yeah, I was just adding that, uh, the, yeah, the reform is coming from the base, of course. For example, let me take a funny, uh, a funny uh, example. Uh, when you go on t uh, on family, I mean families for, uh, um, I mean families home in Africa. Recently, after eight years, I was in my country, Cameroon. Before I was in Nigeria, then I went to Cameroon. And then at home, my sister uh, put a TV, and she has two kids. Uh, she has Camila and she has Taiba. Taiba is like a five years old girl who is going to a nursery school. She was fighting with mom that please give me the, the, the command of the TV. And then the mom said, well, I want to watch my series. She's like, I want to watch something. And then we were very curious to see what she wanted she wanna watch. And she already know the number on the, the keyboard. And she, I mean on the command. And then she went and pressed. And then what appears? What appears was uh the the the, the animation, animation from uh, our westerners. Let me say this. So she was so fun in watching that, those animation, and she is even able not to eat if she can just be concentrated, if you allow her space and her time, let that just focus on that animation. I'm taking this example because it's from, from what you're just saying. If we can be able to uh, try to teach already the beauty of, educate, uh, of agriculture, for example, uh, from the uh, I mean, from the childhood of these young people, you will see that they will grow up loving Africa, uh, loving Africa and loving agriculture. Without lying to you, let me just be truthful to you. I'm working with young people. I've been the CEO of World Youth Summit for like four years already, and I'm organizing com uh, conferences abroad. I'm not just saying that I'm uh, angry at it because everybody is master of his life, but through my program, young people found, for example, the opportunity to go, for example, in Europe to participate to a program. And then they wish there, when they reach there, they are fond of the beauty of Europe, for example, of that town. And they want to remain there. They want to take that knowledge that they got from Africa and then start putting it into practice. Even if it is an unskilled job, they are willing to leave their doctorate degree or their PhD and start washing plate just to get some reward there. So this is the problem. Leaving, Af leaving Africa and going to the greener pasture is already the mentality of people like us. Everybody who is 18 moving forward, I'm very, very, very positive on this and I'm very sure of what I'm doing. It is very hard for you to change your mindset. It's very hard. Just as a person, me telling my cousin that, please believe me, Turkey that you are looking to come from, you are going to come, come to, really is not a very good place for you. Really, you would have done this life better if you were living in your home country. And let me tell you something, money is coming from Africa. Most of the money that we are expecting and we are working, we are working and getting it from the African market. That is the truth. There is no money in Europe. There is no money in the West. It is time for you to know that where you are, you are, you are in the best place. But he will tell you that, but you're mad. You took the plane and you are in Europe. You've been there for like nine years and you telling me that me that I'm living in Africa, I'm better than you. So you, we can't change that mindset unless maybe uh, Miss uh, uh, Joss here is having another strategy that we have to develop. But we can count on those pupils. We can count on those young people who are still in nursery level to start teaching them what Africa needs not to start portraying what the best education is for. You, you are talking about becoming a lawyer. How is a lawyer is going to be changeable for your own self and help your family to fit? Because we can't be wishing to become a lawyer when our own family doesn't have food daily to eat. When you, I mean, we, we have to, that's what I'm saying about identification of whatever, you know, sectors that we need, then we put that into our education system and we build every engineer. And whenever they are out there, they know with the entrepreneurship mindset, they know that they can be able to get one million times better what everybody is getting from the diaspora. So uh, that's what I wanted to add on uh, uh, what you just said. <laughs> Dr. Hassan, thank you. I mean, I, I think we know that this is the late, this is a state of where we are at as a, as a continent. But I like that you were very solution oriented in your approach. You said, if we can infiltrate their cartoons at this stage, because yes. it may be difficult to change the mindset of those who are 18 and above, but we can go down and target them yes. from the ground up. Basic, and I love basic his approach. Why we will not stop what we're, yes, why we will not stop what we're doing with those who are 18 or 13, 18 and above. We will not stop the interventions we are, we, we continue sure. to create through platforms like this, platform like yours. We will not stop all of those interventions. But he's saying we need to be a lot more futuristic 
by going to the very bottom. I'm talking about our kids who are in kindergarten, who are in the nursery yeah. school, who are very interested in watching just foreign cartoons. Now, that's not to say there's anything wrong with foreign cartoons. There's nothing wrong oh, with foreign course. cartoons. I'll be it. We need to be deliberate about incorporating into our media and entertainment the things that prepare the minds of our children on patriotism yeah. or pan-Africanism. That's what yes. he's trying to say. We need to be more deliberate. So I feel like conversations like this, we need to begin to involve the media, those in entertainment to say, yeah. we need to start to say, how can we make animations that make agriculture look like fun for our children? Yeah. How can we create yeah. cartoons that make um, engineering in Africa look fun for our children so that they begin to aspire to want to become occupations or professions that are geared towards helping the African continent. So I like that he's saying this. At the bottom of what he's trying to say is we must embed patriotism and pan-Africanism in the minds of our kids from when they are little, nursery, kindergarten and so guys one of the very good ways to do this we may not be able to influence all other african um, um, nations at the same time to start creating this curriculum we need to go above it i like when it is said we're not going to wait to be given the table we we'll create the table we need to go above it and start creating the cartoons now infiltrate those cartoons into disney world infiltrate them into what's the other one Nickelode nickelodeon infiltrate those cartoons into all the platforms that matter right now and I know there will be somebody yeah. who's listening to me here who is already thinking of this idea or who is grabbing yes. this idea and wants to do something with it. It's time to run with it because the goal is Agenda 2063 is how many years from now? About 40 years from now. Your child who is two years is going to be the beneficiary of Agenda 2063 in 40 years. It means that yeah. actually they are our prime targets. Yeah. They are prime targets from one year old and above, one year old and above. The minute you are born, you are a prime target for Agenda 2063. And guys, I feel like what Dr. Hassan has dropped here is such a big deal. It's such a big deal. I need somebody to pick this. Infiltrate the cartoon system. Infiltrate the game system. The game system. The gaming yes. system. We need to infiltrate it for our kids. Very recently, I noticed that a new um, cartoon was created for, I think, that gave an African girl an opportunity to be the face of that cartoon. I've forgotten the name now, right? But I know I saw it all over the place. And I saw how that made our children, our African children, feel inclusive. Why that may be a good effort in the right direction, we need more. We need more. Mm. This time around, that make our children patriotic and, you know, develop the patriotic and pan-African spirit from as early as they are right now, so that we have a chance of achieving the Africa we want to see. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. That was such a big deal. I like that you brought that tweet. Before we go further into asking you more questions, I'd like to read some of the conversations we have here today. Somebody says, let me go up. Let me go further up. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dan from New Jersey. Thank you, everyone who's joined from New Jersey. Thank you so much, Ifeo Lua. Thank you, Noreen. Noreen says, great perspective by Dr. Hassan. Mental transformation and perception management. Sorry, I need, to, I need to take that again. Yes, and perception management are huge factors for transformation and youth development. Thank you so much. The interventions has to start from the grassroots from, by Morgan or Global. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Somebody says yeah. um, pushing the ag African agenda is going to be very capital intensive. Absolutely. We are aware. <laughs> we are aware. I think we, I want us to talk about this, Dr. Hassan. But before we get to that, let's move quickly and read the other comments. I want us to talk about the capital part of the change we are looking for, considering the fact that you have been in this. It costs money to push this into mainstream. If you, ca How can you start eating... How can eating our own food keep us fit and healthy, not selling what is being brought out there, what is being brought here? I love that. How can eating our own food keep us fit and healthy, not selling what is being brought here? I love that. She's trying to promote um, Operation Feed Africa, yeah. Operation Grow yeah. What We Eat, she's trying to say. Uh, and it yeah. would interest you to know that next year, our access theme is centered on agriculture. Next year. Well, great. Next year. Dr. Hazan has broken the table. Please, we are ready to come back to Africa. We just want a shift. 
I love that. Jadel J says, we are ready to come back to Africa. We just want a shift. Jadel, shifts are created by people. Nobody's going to create the shift for you. Shifts are created by people. If you were here earlier when we started the opening remarks, my co-founder, Edith, said, in Africa, you may never be invited to the table. You may never be given a seat at the table. You create the table. You create the table, make it so desirable. Everybody wants to be on that table. You institutionalize your table. After yes. creating the table, you institutionalize it. You are the shift Africa is waiting for. Thank you so much, Noreen. I love that. Thank you so much. Incorporating Pan-Africanism across all stratas of influence. Thank you, Oname. That's so fantastic. Jadel, you are the shift. Everything you have by any chance gotten to know or experienced up until now, it's an avenue for you to start giving back into Africa. And when I say giving back, I'm not just talking about monetary giving back. I'm talking about skills, talent, yeah. you know, experiences. Those things are intangible, but they are what we need at this stage, right? So moving on very quickly to Dr. Hassan again, let's talk about the capital part of propagating youth development. I mean, I have noticed that in order for us to do things that would move anything in this continent, we need some amount of money. You do need that. Yeah. Um, how do we begin to raise our young people in a way that even when we begin to think strategic partnerships, it's not at the detriment or at the expense of our people? <clears throat> That's what I mean. Because this is, a lot of times, before I go into partnerships, one of the things I'm always looking at, at every partnership, is the motive of the other person. I'm always interested mm. in the motive. Yes. So it's not just about the paper. I'm always about the motive of the other person. And I, 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 I emphasize motive because the West is about domination. Don't get it twisted. It's about power and domination for them a lot of times. So if you're going to enter into partnerships, how do we begin to raise our people so that they are focusing on not just what they get by way of deals, but be sure that they are not getting those deals at the expense of Africa? Uh, well, um, from my answer? experience, yeah, I, I will share this from from my experience uh, because um, it's just like it's just a breaking news. Uh, I've been promoted to lead uh, the Ashako uh, um, uh, leadership here in Turkey as well, and this organization is the biggest platform for social entrepreneur. Social entrepreneurship, uh, you know, uh, is the key is the key in answering to this question. I know uh, we are talking about capital, it means we are talking about money, we are talking about uh, investment, uh, but why don't we talk also about um, angel investment? Because let me tell you something uh, with, from my experience, you know, uh, most of our, the events that I'm organizing, money is always coming from my pocket. But they always ask me, Asam, but at the end of the day, what do you have at the table? I said, till my NGO become a type of NGO with an, a hybrid system in which maybe we can develop some kind of program that can be giving us money at the same time so that we can be running ourselves. I will be making the effort personally because I'm here to, to, to wait for you. 100 young people each year to say, Dr. Hassan, thank you through your platform, I got this. And then I remind them that as you got this, I hope that you will be able to also empower one other person who believe in what you do so that he can also be able to be to, you know, to empower another. And that is how the chain continue. I don't want to know how, uh, how many people this will lead to, but I'm, what I'm in, uh, you know, I'm interested in, in the, is the change, the change I'm putting in the life of people, the opportunity I'm giving to them. And, you know, this change your life. This change your perspective of seeing things. So coming to the uh, to the uh, the question, how do we get the capital? It's very difficult because when I developed uh, the Yatek program, for example, the Young African Tour for Economic Growth, I had uh, a very serious discussion with the the government of China, and then I saw that everything was uh, you know political. When I told them that no, that was the project of the African uh, Institute for uh, for Agripreneurship and Trade. So I told them that, look, I have a very good relationship with the kingdom of Eswatini, and these people are willing to give me lands. I have a very good relationship with the people of Cameroon, and they are willing to give me infrastructure. Same like South Africa, they are willing to give it to me. I just need funds so that we can be able to keep making this thing running and then take a, a, a you know, a uh, hundred first uh, African and, you know, take it like a, how they call it again, just to start with, 
and then show what we really got through them. And then from there now, we can be able to market everything. They told us that really we are willing to help, but just the fact that Eswatini is uh, uh, recognizing Taiwan as a country, we don't see ourselves, you know, being in, in this team and helping you. So I was like, wow. So uh, if you are, you know, uh, not helping, you know, uh, 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 you, you, you are not helping this project becoming a reality just because of your political, just because of the political situation that uh, um, uh, China and Eswatini is having, then it's at some, uh, uh, it, has, it is at some stage, you know, greedy. And uh, also um, the, the challenge that I faced, you know, in, uh, uh, in finding funds was that, Whenever you come to somebody who is an investor who want to put money in and you have a very beautiful project, he will always tell you that, wow, this is really wonderful and this is really implementable. But the condition that these people used to give sometimes is really huge that you can be here. And when you go up to the leadership of our nation in Africa, you realize that most of our countries are not developed because those who are having the power of money, the condition that they are giving to our leaders is just so huge to be here even on the simple uh, simple loan that they are giving to a country, to a nation, you can imagine. You can imagine what the leadership of that country is really blocking the country in. And they will tell you. They will not tell you. So these are the reality. Uh, really, to be truthful, uh, I can only share from an experience point of view. I, I'm not a finance person, but I can only say that the only way we can get the finance uh, is to get the loan for a very, uh, you know, fruitful program that we are sure can start giving uh, uh, rentability in the five years to come. And we can approach more Arabic countries because these people give loans without interest. Because what is killing us sometimes when we are getting loans is interest. The, uh, the, the level of interest is so high that at the end of the day, you end up even paying the money that you loan initially, but just as a form of interest and the capital is still there. And they have some time they right now to start giving you condition. Okay, your company now, your company now is fruitful, and we want, for example, forty percent share of your uh, of your company. So I think it is we can think this way. We can approach these investors uh, uh, like this. For example, I want to build a school, and I believe that if I implement that school in Nigeria, I count on the population of Nigerian youth, and I know that, for example. The name that I'm carrying, if I'm bringing this school there and I have the right accreditation, at least 100,000 young people from Nigeria can, can be in. Then I can tell the investor that, okay, you can, for example, have 20% of the share of this company, for example, for the five years to come. And the capital of your, the, the, the loan that I'm taking from you, if you are giving that money as a loan, it will be giving to you in this, I mean, uh, in the space of this time. But if you are going for interest, it's going to be very difficult because at the end of the day, you will end up paying double money or sometimes even triple. So um, how to get capital, how to get sponsorship? I haven't really gotten any uh, full sponsorship in my life since I've been working on, uh, uh, yeah, on non-governmental organization and non-profit. But I believe in social entrepreneurship, really. Social entrepreneurship is the only way because sometimes I don't have the money, but I have the people. Sometimes I don't have the money, but I have the relation. Sometimes maybe I just need an okay so that my project can attract one million people. And that okay come from somebody that I know from other somebody. So relationship, uh, networking, those are other value that we can also try to share. Because uh, everything sometimes is true that at the end of the day, we need that money. But the money always comes from somebody that know other, another person. To connect, for example, with the people of Qatar last year, with the, uh, the, the, the first uh, lady of Qatar, I needed to know somebody who knows somebody who knows another person. So it is networking. And sometimes this networking uh, is, you know, uh, network is cultivated in social entrepreneurship. Because it's through that social entrepreneurship that you have platform like this one that you can meet, for example, Miss uh, Edith, and then Miss Edith because of my wonderful prestation that other day during the, the conference, she just liked it like that. And then we kept that relationship. And then I have something that to propose to her. And she has a friend that can be willing to give the funds. But if we are going directly to apply for funds to be given those funds, everything is really very hard to, to the moment, really. It's really, really hard. Because it's a mafia. I will say it's a mafia because those who are controlling the money, those who are really controlling the money are really higher than us, really. So yeah. that is what yeah. I can from that. Yeah.
I love that, Dr. Hassan. And I think it goes back to what I'm always telling um, those of us in this sphere, um, which is that we should begin to create our own funds, our own angel ne networks. You know, it doesn't need to be that it's white people putting in money on the continent. You know, we can begin to rally our own capital and begin to invest together. And I think there's a lot of power in terms of finance on the continent because when we're able to put in funds together as Africans, then we're able to mobilize and do even more than what the West is able to do. But for us, it would look different because our angel investors are not those maybe who are coming with $200,000. It might be those coming with $20,000, which is still money and it can still do a lot and it can still save a lot of businesses and still do a a lot in terms of working capital for social enterprises and for SMEs. But I think it's to change the narrative of what angel investment is on the continent. I think I, I love everything you're saying. Yeah. Miss Edit, I wanted to ask something. This is just an idea and I'm just working on that. And maybe you guys can help me, you know, because as somebody said here on the comment, it's the grassroots. And you know, sometimes the grassroots, the ideas coming from the grassroots are not always formal, are not always very well uh, written. But when we work on that, we can, you know, find solution on seeing how to present it to the world. Uh, we are having very, very poor countries in our continent. I don't want to go to the topic that, okay, Africa, Africa is not poor. We have the resources that we need, uh, but we don't know how to transform it. And we still need to think about education and see. And sometimes also it is political. Sometimes our own nation don't want us to dig in that. They don't want us to dig our own gold because they think that the people from the West propose more money, cash. They have the cash, us we don't have. So I want to just focus on one side aspect, the aspect that we are poor. Let's, let's accept that fact that we are poor. But those who are in the diaspora, for example, this is just an idea that can help them and help the people of Africa who are living in Africa and help us as a society. How do we do? For example, when you go in Liberia, this is just a study. Liberia is really poor. Liberia is really poor and the young people of Liberia and Sierra Leone are these two countries because I work with young people from these two countries. They are really poor and they are really hungry of opportunities. And sometimes, let's not always look the business on the big picture. Let's look the business on the smallest picture. Because somebody just say, uh, used to say in the story that I used to watch on internet, on Twitter, that I started my business selling only one tomato. And from one tomato, I jumped to two. And from two, I jumped to 10. And from, from 10, I, to, I jumped to 1,000. And then I become a millionaire. This is just an example. If we look at the picture, uh, the, the business on the smallest picture, then we will look at the investment on the smallest scale. And when we look at the, the investment on this smaller scale, it's not small for that type of business because the business is small. So we did this study and we said that, for example, if you go to Liberia or Sierra Leone, 100 young people cannot even have $1 per day. Sometimes when they are even doing unskilled job, maybe their salary can be even that $1. And sometimes this $1 cannot fit them. If it fits a lot, it can fit only themselves. So this is really hard. If I go in Liberia now, this is for the people of diaspora. It's just a study that I'm working on. If I go in Liberia now with 1,000 US dollars, believe me, I will be able to change the life of 10 families. Or if I go to Liberia now and I meet just household of 10 children, let's just say that, okay, I meet two families which are having five children. And these children are already grown up students that are, for example, 25 with that entrepreneurship mindset. If I go with that $1,000, I'm becoming rich in a few days. I mean, rich, it depends on how you are interpreting because in entrepreneurship, every gain that you get in, in, is something. You don't always want to get the $1 million gain. Even if you are getting only one euro per day, it's an entrepreneurial, I mean, it's an investment and it's a gain. So gain is gain in entrepreneurship. This is first of all what we need to think because most of us in young, in Africa as young people, if I don't want to build, if I don't build a business of $10,000 or $100,000, then I didn't build a business. Any other money less than that is just money for change. No. If we start teaching them that making $1 a day is a profit and this will take you to another level in 10 years, then really with this mindset, really we change, we change a lot of things. So how do we do that? I go with that $1,000 and in each, house, each household, I give $100 to a child from that uh, household. 
that is 10 child having $100. If I convert $100 in, for example, the currency of my country, that would be 65,000 francs CFA. And with 65,000 francs CFA, you are able to do something. You are able to, to buy corn from the, from the farm. You are able to uh, uh, harvest corn from the farm, uh, uh, take the corn from the farm, cook the corn from the farm, uh, remove the, 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 the corn from that, uh, uh, how they call it again? Uh, the, the, um, the cob. The yeah, from, yeah, from that cob and be able to cook it and then sell it. And what is killing us, let me just shed some light on that in Africa, is the transformation system. If we have a transformation system in Cameroon, I mean in Africa, we will develop ourselves very quickly. What people are successfully successful entrepreneurs who have developed themselves and became very rich in Africa, they use that strategy. For example, if you take you harvest your corn from the farm and you just sell it, that price will not be the same as somebody who took that corn and cook it and sell. It happened even here. Those who are selling corns on the street, when they take it, when it is fresh, they sell it at one euro, for example. But the person who took it and cook it, he cook it and he sell it now at two euro. You see that the change, you know, it is growing. So let me come back to the topic. If I'm giving hundred dollars to one pay child in that true family home, and I tell them that, okay, go with this hundred dollars and believe me that in the business that we are doing, I'm believing in you. And I've given you, for example, one month to come back and check if that hundred dollars can give me twenty dollars profit. That is twenty time how many? That's twenty times ten. I've made another hundred. Uh, I've made another two hundred dollars. Mm. So if we think this way, uh, that was just the, the small. I mean, the, the the smallest scale. If we think on investment, looking at business on the smallest picture, and believing in the power of profit then we can develop ourselves. So we will not have any issue in capital raising. We will not have any issue because any person believing, living in the diaspora, let me take USA, for example, you cannot tell me that per month you can have a $1,000 that you kept away, just like that as your saving. So if you can take it and invest in these young people in Africa who are having skill, who are having a talent, who are having knowledge, but they don't have any way to start, they don't have anywhere to start or, or whatever to start with, then you are changing their life. You are you are making them become independent and yourself as well. You are growing your capital. I just wanted to add that, Miss Eddie. Thank you so much. I mean, thank you so much, Doctor Hassan. He said so many things. And just as I, I mean, speaking, I, I, I mean, I Miss George, really uh, even in my country, I, I'm coming from a kingdom. I don't want to cut you short. I just want to say this because uh, before I I forget, uh, the, the, I leave some experience in where. People harvest things from the farm, Miss Joss, and they see it getting getting bad in front of their, I mean, before their eyes, because they don't have a way to just pay the transportation and get to town and sell their crops. So can you imagine how poor we are? We are really poor at that level. So if you are giving 65 or $100 to that grandmother, who is able to harvest, but they don't, she doesn't have the way to transport her good to the town to sell it and get profit. I mean, we are changing our life and we are more making profit ourselves. So I wanted to add that on that. Thank you so much. And you just speaking to that is leading to the question Dr. Daniel Oshesson is asking. He's saying, how can we make agriculture attractive to increase youth participation? Dr. Daniel, there you have it adding value to the entire value chain system. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. And to do this, we need capital injection. That's what he's saying. So if we have Dr. Hassan, and this is me thinking solution, I usually like to think, how do we move this forward? So this is me Thanks. saying, you now have access to a kingdom where there are lots of farmers who have produces or products that can be moved to the township for, um, um, for sales. And then of course, increased value. Can we now yes. begin to create between people like Dr. Hassan, who has access to the local farmers, and doc men like Dr. Daniel, who feel like they can be part of those who may want to invest in helping us reduce and um, post-harvest losses just to increase the value of the products that are gotten from the farm. So in this conversation, mm -hmm. here you have it. You can reach us to us at, um, at accent, info at accent.org, send us an email, and then we can make a connection between men like Dr. Hassan, if you are in the diaspora, and you feel like you want to be a part of um, just helping us have more people um, and be able to, basic things, this is basic things. This is not even business at the top level. There are different levels of business. This is even before yeah. MSME, if you know what I mean. Yes. At this level, this yes. is before MSME. 
That means that at the very least, just to even put food on people's tables, we need to be able to cut yeah. the harvest loss. The entire value chain of agriculture in Africa, we can actually feed Africa and feed the world. But mm -hmm. because of the entire mechanization, digitization, technology involved in agriculture that allows people in the West get better value from their farm produces, we don't have a lot of that yes. in Africa. So yeah. if we could have investors who are willing to partner rapidly with people like Dr. Hassan or any more who have access to these farmers, we can cut post harvest loss and begin to give better value to the products and services I got in from our farm. I had a, I listened to one of the interviews of one um, university lecturer. I can't remember the school now. I can't remember which of the states, but I'll check it. I think I saw it on um, Oprah's page, I think. He's a lecturer and he started just saying, I want to create, I want to um, plant the food I'll eat. That's what he said. And all of a sudden, he started planting and planting. Before you know it, it became a very huge farm. And from being wow. a huge farm, creating tomato paste that he now started employing young people to say, if you're a student and you want to make money, he created something that looks like an Uber, but for farm produce, right? Or oh, an Amazon, sorry, for farm produce. So the young people now start selling the farm produce and all they do is send traffic to his farm and they make a buck or two or they make a percentage for sending traffic to his farm. The reason he's able to do that is because he's able to get investments that cut all the harvest loss and even end up transforming the entire product into wow. a lot more transformed product. So when I, I'm not using the exact terms now because I'm, I'm not necessarily in agriculture, but you understand what I'm trying to say. So I, I get it perfectly. Yes, investment, Dr. Daniel, to answer your question. But I'll let um, Dr. Hassan quickly speak to this as we... Um, um, we, 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 can, we can do that if we have a trustworthy people uh, in Africa or trustworthy people in the diaspora who are uh, able to do the descent on, of, on the terrain. Descent on the terrain means coming down on the field to check and make sure that everything, uh, uh, you know, become implementable. So somebody like me who can, for example, give time to that. You can, for example, say, okay, Dr. Hassan, this is 10,000 US dollars, or let's just say this is 5,000 US dollars, and we want to invest this in 50 people in Africa who are having, for example, farms. And then we go to those who are having those openness to farms, and then we tell them that, look, you are having, for example, you are producing this amount of food, for example, uh, per season. And sometimes the market where you are selling your product if we give you the opportunity to sell this product in the bigger market, then you will have bigger uh, a profit. We can start by there. And then by that, we shouldn't think on having big gain uh, from the very start. But on the long run, believe me, if somebody is living every day and making like only five euros every day, it is something. In one year, it is something compared to somebody who didn't make any investment. So how do we make it attractive? This is a question that we send us back again to, you know, uh, 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 mental transformation, as somebody say in the comment, you know, making the agriculture sexy. Like one girl said it at the African Union Summit uh, 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 recently. It's just to how we are marketing that agriculture. Whenever you are talking to somebody of 20th year of age now that go back and let go do the farm and do the agriculture, that is where our future lies. He will tell you that he won't go to something that dirty is clothed. It won't go to something that dirty is hands. But it is far more than that. They don't see the agriculture on the bigger picture. Because those, as I was saying, those who are making really big money and big deal out of agriculture is those who are able to take it, produce it, or transform, transform it to the second, third, or fourth level. It is very a big shame that uh, um, vegetable that we are producing ourselves, we rather go on the supermarket and buy those packeted uh, vegetables. The tomatoes that we are producing on uh, ourselves, it is a shame that we are going on market and buying a canned tomato coming from abroad. So it is in many aspects. If you are into those who are transforming at least to the first or the second level, or if you are into those who don't want any stress and just invest and have a signed contract with those people and tell them that, okay, you have this timing and I'm coming to get profit on this and then we continue and I will increase your capital, then it will be all also up to you. Thank you so very much. Edith, are you still there? I would like for, I brought you off because I feel like how your perspective will be needed here. Edith, can you hear me? Edith, can you hear me?
It is. Can you hear me? Okay. While we're waiting for her, um, somebody says, I realize that we young people blame the government for our own social and economic problems. <laughs> Earlier, I think it was, I can't remember who spoke to this, it was Edis or Dr. Hassan saying, the government cannot do what you have not done for yourself. And I think she mentioned something earlier like that. Well, Dr. Hassan, while we wait for Edith to come back, do you want to speak to that quickly? That young people are uh, always I, um, our own social and economic, our own social and economic problems. Uh, um, I will answer this straightforward as a young person and a youth activist. Even if they put us in the place of those who are now, we will not do better. You know why we will not do better? Uh, the, to Mr. To Miss Sharon, we will not do better because. Uh, Africa is into debts. Debts is killing us in Africa. When you are taking, for example, uh, uh, let's say a country like Cameroon, where we had a president, it's been like more than 32 years that he's a president. And uh, for example, if you evaluate, I'm not into, uh, I'm not talking politically. I'm just like sharing my own view of the situation. So in 32 years, he has been running a country. And in 32 years, he has seen many generations. So there is even his grandchildren who are, who are, I mean, who are now getting, but I mean, they are coming to life and they're discovering the same president. Well, we don't blame the leadership. Everybody is doing on his own. I mean, uh, the way uh, he believes is best for the country because you can't say that I love this country more than the president who is, run, I mean, logically. What I want to say is that we can do better than them because of what? Because sometimes this nation, I don't know about African nations so much, but sometimes this nation, when somebody becomes a president and is a position of leadership, sometimes the state in which he took the country is really, really bad. He can't just come forward and say that I can't make it because everybody loves power. Everybody want to be there. Everybody want to be that leader, that change maker, that person that will bring the light to a country that was in darkness. So because he can't do that, because of that, ego that every human being has he will try to make his best and when it doesn't succeed we will blame them of course but sometimes we are blaming them wrongly we are blaming them not understanding uh, uh, the state in which they took the country uh, they took the, the statue of leadership from the very beginning so we need to encourage our leaders in africa to first of all you know uh, solve our debts with the people from the west because with this debt that we continue accumulating and getting and getting and getting, we can be really free. We can be really developed. So as for young people now, it is their responsibility now to start, you know, strategizing, start uh, thinking, start, I don't know, uh, addressing even their problem in a very critical and ambitious manner. Because sometimes uh, uh, the issue that we are having, uh, for example, in DR Congo, uh, uh, in five years ago in Cameroon, in, in Nigeria with the strike, sometimes government answers violently to the uh, request of young people because the young people didn't know how to address the issue very well. So if a young person or a group of young people is addressing the social and economic situation or problem that they are into to a government in a very strategic, critical and ambitious manner, the government is likely to listen. Because let me tell you something, it's a very, a very big truth. You cannot be comparing yourself to people from the diaspora. I shared it on LinkedIn some days that don't see people from Denmark, from Sweden, from France going on the street saying that we want change. We want change. And then five days later, the president just come down on the field and say that, yeah, the change will be there and we are going to work on it and everything happened. No, don't always compare that because your country will never be like their country. Their system or political system, we are, it's true, we are copying and I've been criticizing that on Pan-African platform, that it is time that because... I mean, this will lead me to another topic or another program, another, I mean, another something. But I just want to say that we were not obliged in Africa to copy from the West. We were not in Africa, uh, we were not obliged in Africa to copy the ideology of that works for the Westerner, thinking that it will work for us. After liberating Africa and making African nation independent, it was the responsibility of our leaders in those days, which I'm praying for them every day, to do what they call the reform. Africa needed a reform. Even till today, who told you that democracy was the best thing that we needed, for example, in African nation? 
it's just a, I mean, it's just a question. I'm not, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm not against the ideology. But if he was working for the for the Westerner, he was not obliged that we should use that and adopt that and making some and make it make it something that we must do so that we can change. That kills us a lot. So let not, I mean, young people, let's let's not be fooled by what is going on on the West. Let's start, uh, I mean, examining the situation according to the society we are living in, according to the reality. If you guys want to, you know, uh, address the social and economic problem, don't go on the street. Because if you have even good manner, if you have even good vision of the strike you are about to do, there are some people who didn't eat for more than seven days, and he was just waiting for that opportunity to start go and loot on the, uh, 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 I mean, on the neighborhood or on the, the shop aside because he wants something to eat for his family. And then when he does that, and they show that on the media, where I'm condemning people from media, though me too, I'm from the media, when they will show only that. The government now will start over, I mean, reacting according to the action of these young people, and the reaction will not be really like. You see what happened a few days ago in DRC, where a, a policeman, uh, uh, I mean, he, he, he shot, he, he shot, he shot at the leg of one uh, uh, Congolese. But this did this make me laugh. You know what this made me laugh? Normally, I was supposed to feel empathy, sympathy, and like, wow, feel sorry because it is a young person they are shooting at. But that young person was having a, a, a machete. He was having a machete. For Imagine. So the, the policeman will defend himself that I was just trying to defend myself and make him out of being then uh, uh, i mean uh, out of putting people in danger that's why i reacted like that but imagine if that young person was just so calm and he was just having his back car like this addressing his problem to the government no matter how long he was going to stay under that sun for sure there will be a major outlet that we see that and address it to the government so guys please as young people let's not see what is going on on the west they have their mentality it's a land of freedom for most of us in africa sometimes that freedom that we are talking about is not really that easy and we can't complain for that our system and society is like that most of our country and nation in in africa first of all were kingdoms they were ruled they were ruled, and when I mean kingdom, I mean uh, uh, I mean hierarchy, I mean uh, uh, dynasty, I mean uh, um, uh, dictatorship. We were born like that. We grew like that. So let's not be fooled, unless we go and we reform the type of leadership and the type of ideology we are we are you know we are adopting now in our continent. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. This has been very. This has been a lot. I mean, he has said a lot of things that a lot of people need to sit yeah. and probably. Um, you know, you have to listen again and again yeah. and again. I tend to pick out the things mm. he was trying to you know, um, convey. Okay, mm. he said something that um, he said we used we before the before the colonial masters came, we had mm. a monarchical system. Yeah. So as Africa, we are still evolving from our monarchy into truly accepting democracy at its peak. We haven't got in there yet. So he's trying to say that one of the reasons why we get kickbacks from the things we attempt to do to create reforms, AKA protests and all the things we do, he says one of the reasons we get kickbacks is because there's still a monarchical mentality because we're a progressive people. That's not to say he's against democracy. I want us to get this clear. That's not to say it's against democracy. It's just trying to say we're progressive people. We're growing from a monarchical system and we haven't properly, in some parts of Africa, in fact, in most parts of Africa, let me be honest. In most Africa, parts of Africa, we haven't settled the democracy system, democratic system in our mind. So there's a lot of kickbacks when we attempt to use democratic systems to reform our society. So from what he's saying, we as a people begin need to begin to come into rooms or create rooms or create tables where we can actually create systems and attempt to infiltrate. That's how we create change. Like he says, protests may not get us to get change, especially in Africa where we are at now. Are there systems that can be accepted democratically? Yes, we do have those systems. But you say you want to enact change, move beyond the protest, go into you know, um, as far as policy is concerned, conversations like this, then policy, then we can begin to move the needle further. We are young Africans. There will be younger Africans who are listening to us. The Africa you see today is not the dream. Let me say it again. The Africa you see today is not the dream. It's not the future of the Africa we are going to touch. It's not the future of the Africa we will live in. I will live in an Africa where every African descendant is a treasure. 
I would live in an Africa where our resources should be harnessed, both mineral, human resources, to create immeasurable wealth. I would live in that Africa. But while today seems a bleak and doesn't look anything like that future, the goal yeah. is to harbor the dream of the Africa you want to see in your heart and every day show up to do something moving you closer to that Africa. I love what Jabiel said. He said, I've been studying over here in New Jersey. I have my country at heart and has jared me to put together 14 learner centered principles for school in order to catch them young and change a lot. Do you see this? So it's a dream he has in his heart and had made him start something even at his school level. You can see that. So that's what I'm saying. Let that dream be active in your heart, even when the physical circumstances doesn't look anything like that. We all will yeah. not give up. As a matter of fact, the things happening today, they are pointers to the fact that Africa needs you. If there are no problems, then there's no need for a solution. That there is a problem is because you are the solution and you were created for a time such as this. So those answers in your heart, those desires in your heart, what you may call purpose, you, this is the right time to begin to lash onto them to say, Africa has been waiting for you and today is that day to make a move. Dr. Hassan, this has been one of the most prolific conversations I've had in a very right. long time. Thank you for pouring out your heart. Thank you for opening up so many things. And thank you for showing us that here in Africa, there is a way. Thank you for passionately showing to the people how much um, the livelihood of Africans means so much to you. Until yeah. we we'll see you again and have further conversations from all of us here at Accept, this is a very huge thank you. Have a fantastic day and God bless you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Right. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. So very quickly, we're bringing on our next speaker. Mr. Joseph D. Adebodun, he is the Director of Youth Agriculture Training Center, Liberia. Wow. He's a dedicated professional with over 10 years of career experience in human resource, insurance and project management with private NGOs and public sector. With experience on various projects, notably youth training, event curriculum, um, training and development. He backs certificate of honor for valuable contributions towards Youth Capacity Building and Empowerment in February 2018 from the Institute of Liberia, Unities and National Service Learning Institute in Pesneville, Liberia. He's presently serving as director at the Youth Agriculture Center Training Center, YATC. And YATC is one of TVET centers in the TVET Department of Ministry of Youth and Sport, Republic of Liberia. To so make welcome, Mr. Joseph D. Adibodo. I think for some reason his network we may, him. yes, he just, um, we lost him, but I'm sure he's going to come back. He's okay. going to be, he's going to come back. While we wait for him, Africa is blessed yeah. because our youths are competent and not spoiled. But over here, they are still competent, but really spoiled. Ah. <laughs> I'm not sure how ah. I want to respond. <laughs> I, I will not respond to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I will not respond to that. But Dr. But Sharon, thank you so much for sharing your opinion. Why we wait for our speaker to at least come back on? I'm sure there has to be some, you know, technical issues from his end. I want to quickly, I want us to quickly go over some of the things Dr. Hassan rightfully poured out here, and you know, just to truly straighten some perspectives. He wasn't against democracy. He's not anti-democracy. I mean. He is also a leader who has been democratically elected several times across the different opportunities he's been privileged to serve. He was just trying to share with us the reality of the systems at hand here in Africa and how in order for us to beat the system or go ahead of the system, you have to understand the intricacies of your country slash continent to be able to enact change, right? Yeah. And as young Africans, I know that our desire is to have democratic reigns, democratic mm -hmm. regimes. Like when I say democratic, I'm saying democratic to the teeth, where everything is truly democratic. For us to have that, all of us must begin to think about our personal transformation. And I say personal transformation because it's easy to say, I want to be a democratic person. When I get there, I do my thing and go. And then when you enter, <laughs> at that point, when they tell you, come and leave, you begin to think, how do I? How do I? Right? So we at every point need to start thinking of our personal transformation. While we're doing that, we must strengthen our institutions. All mm. the different countries we move to, 
they are what they are because they have institutions and institutions yeah. with the right power to act. Yeah. An American president cannot dare, cannot dare to stay a day beyond his regime. It's not because it's not powerful, it's because mm. there are institutions that have been strengthened to take action even over the person who is the number one man in the nation. Yes, yes. So as it should be. That power, yes, that power at institutions level literally enables us to make difference within the context of all our individual countries. Mm. So I think that the bulk of our thinking, the bulk of our activity, the bulk of our advocacy, or the bulk of our brainstorming and strategy to start being geared towards how do we make a difference as far as strengthening institutions. Edith, do you want to share something? Let me try to get our speaker again. Okay. I think for me, it's just to encourage Africa to look for the solutions within the continent. Um, very often, we tend to run to look for solutions outside of the continent. So we look to the, the West, right, for, for the solutions. But we cannot have a Western solution to an African problem because the continent is very unique. Our people are unique. Our issues are unique. Um, and sometimes, most of the times, actually, it requires someone who has lived the problem to solve that problem. Um, it cannot be someone who has not lived through that challenge. So I'm a big believer so that we don't have, um, we don't have what? We don't have a situation where someone who has never walked a mile in a certain pair of shoes advising us to buy those shoes. So I think what really needs to happen on the continent is we need to start rallying amongst ourselves to begin building these solutions. But more than that, we need to have key stakeholders acknowledge that the true resource and the true solution is here on the continent and start listening to those solutions over what is coming from outside of the continent. And by this, I don't mean diaspora because we can have diaspora Africans who've lived through the African problem that can develop solutions for the African continent. By this, I mean people who are not African. So we need to begin to further support the African um, the initiator and solution. Sorry. No, no problem, sis. Where we need to begin to start to encourage that. And I think um, what we're going to go to is um, a video that further brings back the conversation from yesterday around education. So I think, sis, you can cue that because I think that adds to what we're saying in yeah, terms of yeah. yes. for I, Africa. I, 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 yeah. Absolutely. I wanted to bring that up because there's some comments here and questions that this video addresses. That, and I know that most of the people who are here right now were not here yesterday. So I just wanted to bring this in so that they could listen to it again and be able to draw inferences from it and then we'll move on with the um, order of the day. Of the African Government Stakeholders Engagement Forum, ACSEF 2022, led by Just eBay. Distinguished speakers and panelists, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fidelis Ekum, Project Director, Human Capital Africa. Dr. Obiagili Obi Ezekwisli, former Minister of Education, Vice President of the World Bank and founder Human Capital Africa has asked me to convey her gratitude and appreciation to the organizers of ACSERV 2022 for inviting her to present a keynote address at this event. She's unable to be here today because of several speaking engagement events outside Nigeria. However, Dr. Obiezekwisli looks forward to participating in your future events. To this extent, I will be representing Dr. Obi Ezekwisili in this all very important event, and it is with a sense of humility that I delightfully do. In accepting this invitation and ahead of this keynote presentation, conversations were held by the organizers to understand their work, target beneficiary, 
and what they intend to achieve through the ACSAF 2022. In the process, we found out that their target beneficiary is the tertiary level, while for us at Human Capital Africa, our work is focusing at the foundational primary level. Therefore, the big alignment between Human Capital Africa and what your organization is doing is the fact that you may not be able to achieve expected impact at the tertiary level when the foundation is not right. The foundation must be right. The organizers of ACSERF 2022 have asked my principal, Dr. Obi Ezequisili, to speak on restructuring education and youth development for the Africa we want. Dr. Obi is particularly pleased with the choice of this forum's theme because it aligns with the vision and mission of Human Capital Africa and the collective global community of policymakers government ministers and young people efforts at harnessing evolving discussions to generate greater momentum and shared understanding on key elements of transforming education, particularly in Sub-Sahara Africa. The question remains, where lays the problem? What are the possible solutions? And what are the possible policy suggestions to be made to strengthen actions and decisions. A World Bank data reports nine out of 10 children in sub saharan Africa cannot read properly. Education is foundational for countries' growth, productivity, and development. This certainly has levels of impact on individual and family incomes and welfare, health outcomes, participation in civics and political life, social cohesion, active participation of individuals and societies in the global economy. The implication, therefore, is for any country to make any level of wholesome development, it must, first of all, erect efficient education structures. In simple terms, a country is as good as the quality of humans it produces. As already pointed out, only 9 out of 10 children in this region can read properly. Surely, this means our children are not in school. Enrollment rates in the past two decades have only soured in Africa and actually only declined for the first time in a while due to the COVID-19 crisis. So the first problem is our education not educating. If 9 out of 10 children at the age of 10 are not reading at the levels that they should be able to, it is then evident where the source of the problem lies. If the quality of education at the foundational level falls below acceptable standards, every other level of education will follow suit. This reflects on the quality of human capital you develop in a nation. Research indicates that failure to read by nine years of age portends a lifetime illiteracy for at least 70% of struggling readers. Clearly, what this means is if you get it wrong at a young age, chances are higher that you will never get it right any longer. There is also the notion that children who do not acquire foundational learning skills struggle in school and consequently do not stay in school. A study from Rice finds that a child with a one standard deviation lower test score has 50% higher odds of dropping out in the next four years than his higher scoring pair. This is also dangerous because African children who do not remain in the school often fall victim to social evils like child labor and early marriages. Struggling students who do not drop out find it hard to progress in school. They also find it hard to benefit from other vocational or technical training. This also potentially reduces how much value they can offer to your society. 
Studies show that a lack of foundational learning and numeracy skills can have even wider far-reaching effects. Among children whose mothers have the same level of formal schooling, children whose mothers can read have a 28% lower risk of mortality compared to their peers whose mothers lack reading skills. The ability to read thus has an impact on child mortality. Failure to acquire foundational learning and numeracy skills consequently has disastrous impacts for entire countries' economies and GDPs. Despite these obvious reality, there is silver lining that prescribes solutions and actions that must take place now. Step 1. Data-driven solutions. There is need to disseminate relevant data to highlight the severity of the learning problem in South Saharan Africa and equip decision makers with the appropriate evidence to solve the problem. To end the learning crisis in our region, all decisions and actions must be data driven. These data must be made available, sought after, updated, far reaching, and relevant. Step two foundational learning and numeracy must be prioritized. Country leaders and decision makers must keep FLN at the top of their policy agendas and use evidence to design and adopt the right combination of policies, training, coaching, assessment, lessons plan and integrated catch-up that can solve the problem in their countries. Step 3. Gather necessary support. Policies are often unsuccessful in achieving outcomes because they are poorly implemented. Country leaders and decision makers will need the necessary support to successfully implement policies that tackle the learning problem. All hands will need to be on deck. Step 4. Allocate sufficient resources. Policies and efforts will need to be supplemented with not only sufficient but also appropriately allocated resources, funds, technology, human resources and technical capacity to be successfully implemented. We must spend on education enough but also intelligently. The Dakar Agreement proposed that every country spends between 15 to 20 percent of their yearly budgets on education. But at the moment, more than half of the countries in Sub-Sahara Africa do less than that. There is clearly a spending problem. We are in an education crisis that threatens our long-term survival as a people, and we need to treat it as such. Our approach must be on short-term fronts and long-term fronts, a multi-pronged approach that seeks to offer shock therapy to our dying education standards in the short term, but also has a long-term template to keep the standards healthy and global. These approaches will be wholesome and require active participation of every stakeholder in the life of African children. From parents to siblings to teachers, the community and the government, only then we will realize the Africa of our dream. On behalf of Dr. Obi Ezequisley, I thank you all and wish you a successful forum. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was from our keynote speaker yesterday, ably represented by Mr. Fidelis Ekom, representing Dr. Obi Ezequisley, former Minister of Education, Nigeria and of course the many other things that she wears today. We needed to bring that video back on because there are some things that she spoke to here today that those of you who were not here yesterday needed to hear just to answer some of the questions. And I'm happy that by from your feedback, you are now seeing that this was very necessary for us to play back. So to move us further into today's conversation, we have one of our distinguished speakers who happens to also be on the ACCEF organizing team. She's also here right now at the back, Maha Juni, 
Maha is representing North Africa. And Maha is the author and founder of the African Center for Artificial Intelligence and Digital Technology based in Mauritania. She's a PhD candidate in computer science and data sciences. She holds a master degree from Tianjin China University of Education and Technology in the field of AI and new technology. She's published several research and analytical articles in AI policies and the future of work in Africa in the AI age. She is a speaker and an analyst in her, and in her publication and conferences, she always highlights the technological impact on the African economy and how technology can be a leverage for women and youth inclusion. She advocates for free movement of person in Africa and the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Through leading campaign and delivering training sessions to African youths, she has worked as a media assistant to the African Union campaign to end child marriage in Africa from 2015 to 2017. In 2018, Migrant Voices named her as Personality of the Year after the success of her book, Lover from the Free Care. In 2022, UNESCO and the Asfari Institute of Civil Society and Citizenship at AUB considered Maha Drini among the top 20 women change makers pioneers in Nina, thanks to her commitment to women, digital rights, and economic inclusion, and her distinction in the field of artificial intelligence in North Africa. With a resounding clap ovation, let us make welcome Maha Juni to this year's ACCEP mm -hmm. 2022 conference. Hi, Maha. It Hello. Is great to have Hi. You here today. Thank you. Thank you. The, the honor is mine. And please accept my apologies for coming uh, uh, late. <laughs> I have I had just a time and confusing. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, having me. I'm truly humbled to talk today about uh, artificial intelligence, the future of new technology in uh, Africa. Uh, on behalf of my capacity as a tech woman, as a founder of the African Center for AI and uh, Digital uh, Technology. Uh, like uh, we know, uh, we are now at the age of the fourth industrial revolution, the revolution of artificial intelligence, of new technology. And now our conception about economy has been changing. We are not more in the time of the old economics uh, style, the old economic of, scheme, of commerce, of uh, buying and sell. Everything is changing. The mentality is changing. The words become online. We are in the age of uh, facial recognition, of footprints, of fingerprints, of uh, online passport, online visa. Now, the algorithms are the ones are controlling and decided which can give it access, which is not. However, in the continent, we are realizing that Africa is still behind. Despite of all capacities, resources, human capacity, which our continent has, but we are still struggling to move and to ensure a good, deep, correct digital transformation, which allow us to move into the next step, the age of artificial intelligence, where machines are conscious, where machines can take decisions under our controls. So whenever we ask these questions, why we are behind, why we have everything, the answer, it, it was always one answer, education. Education. We can't move to tech entrepreneurship, to, uh, to, to a digital economy, to any development field without education and I'm facing this for example in Mauritania, in Niger, in Chad, in the countries way where the rates of literacy is so high. 
the problem of digital transformation there began began very became, uh, began very difficult. So education, it's a kind of uh, uh, like it's the center. It's the pillar of digital transformation, the pillar of development. And today, like uh, United Nations S SDGs, among the most uh, uh, highlighted recommendation is to use the technology as a leverage for development. And in Africa, we cannot, because still, section, uh, section like uh, uh, Compute computer science, applied technology, and all related subjects to new technology. It we can consider it in some countries or in some region as elitist because it's not allowed for everyone. Why? You can ask me why, Omo. Because it's expensive. <laughs> it's yeah. expensive. It's expensive. Yeah. That, yeah. For example, if you want to learn uh, um, artificial intelligence, let me give you the cost in Tunisia. One, one month coding Python, it may cost you 300 dinars. For, for Tunisian average, it's expensive. So coding, programming, web designing, even buying the license, yeah. it's expensive. That's why we can't emerge tech education on the continent because we can't afford it. Second problem, yes. the infra structures. You, we don't have telecommunication in a rural region, for example, or in a lot of parts in, in each country. I mean, like, I know about what we are talking. <laughs> there are no countries in Africa which they can have 100% telecommunication coverage. R right or not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And according to the World Bank, it says that access to the internet remains out of reach of the most people in the continent, with only 22% reporting having access in 2017. 22% from the whole African nation. So with this po percentage, we cannot really, we cannot talk about implementing technology in education field. We cannot talk about online education. We cannot move for, for a world wha while we don't have the basics. And this is truly pro, uh, problematic. So, what what I uh, what we suggest, I think I uh, I believe that ASGF today it's a good opportunity for us to talk about restructuring education and youth development for the Africa we want. We have to build for the future through education. And I'm truly happy to be here today to, to discuss about uh, the, the barriers of digital transformation and why we are behind, despite, despite of all the efforts which we are doing. I think it's, um, first of all, we have to advocate for implementing technology and as you said, on restructuring education and make computing, physics, <coughs> math, technology as accessible subjects to all Africans. Each children have the, have the right to learn coding wherever he is based, if he is in rural region or if he is in downtown. Also, we have to encourage women to study computing and continuing studying computing because in some countries in the continent, like girls, they are not, I don't, I cannot say they are not allowed to study computing 
but uh, they are not encouraged to study compute computing in a way like uh, for example in in north africa when uh, the girls they are in high school in i in indirect way you can see that the 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 leaders of the high school they are guiding them to lit to literature section to education section in a way to avoid them going for physics or computing because for them those subjects are male subjects are not female subjects so we have to stop this and you have to encourage women to study tech fields because this is the future the work now began online work no matter section you have you need to be able to deal with computing so i want also to to highlight another topic which is uh, uh, equity in uh, distributing technology assets because in the continent all of the tech assets it's still in the capitals for example in uh, he, here in mauritania nuakshot you can find the good connection all of the telecommunication uh, distributors, mm. all of the facilities and technology. Mm. For people to get, to get access, we are all centralized in the capital. The ones who are in the other city, cities, they don't have those uh, privileges, mm. which is wrong. Internet mm. shouldn't be centralized. Mm. Mm. So we are facing this. It, it's kind of unjust and, and unjust the, uh, distrib uh, distributions. We, we are not equal. People in the rural region, they don't have the same access as us. And if mm. it is the case, we are assuming that those communities they don't, they are not educated as much as we are because they don't have the basics facilities. So we have also to, to advocate for equity, to advocate for the right of all of, all of African children, youth, women for having access to technology and to to conclude my intervention also we have to change the investment the the mentality of investment in africa governments and and uh, business leaders they start to learning how to invest in technology because now i come back to to my first uh, sentence which is it's the revolution it's the age of artificial intelligence it's the revolution of artificial intelligence and again ai it's about mind it's about design thinking it's about smartness that's ai it's the art of connectivity so governments business leaders have to invest in ai researching center have to invest in developing algorithm have to invest in african mind because this this the fourth industrial revolution is based on our minds, our intellectual capacities. Educated people, smart people, they are the ones who are able to understand algorithm, generating algorithm, and 
dealing with algorithm because today we are talking about the the algorithm ethics the ethics of artificial intelligence right the ethic of artificial intelligence audit system accountability all this new concepts it's coming on it's generating on we are talking about the digital laws so the world is changing and africa have to invest on on those studies on those researching centers because we need to stop of being can, countries which we are uh, exp, uh, importing technology we are not manufacturing technology which is incorrect we can't take technology take technology with her from uh, Chinese or Indians or Koreans or Europeans or Americans while while we have our own engineers there we can create it and this is how we really be able to restruct our education restruct our economy restruct Africa and realize the Africa we want yeah thank you Omo Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Maha. Yes, yes, yes. You're welcome. Thank you. Do you have Can any questions? Yes, I'm hearing you. Do you have any questions? Thank you so much. I mean, while you were speaking, <clears throat> I was writing a lot of things <clears throat> from your conversation, and I want to quickly summarize them. She said, most of the tech assets are in the capitals, and they need to be decentralized so that there can be equity in distribution amongst those who are not necessarily in the capital cities within the African continent. What she's trying to say is, if you are going to invest in AI for youth development and for education, we need internet infrastructure. And this internet infrastructure needs to be widely spread, not just in the capital, but should enter into all the different towns so that there's equity as far as the youth in all the parts of the country or continent can be you know, beneficiaries of. That's one of the first things I noted. Then she said, we must change the mentality of investment in Africa. That's what she said. She said, because AI is about design thinking and connectivity. And so, because we understand this, investing in AI research centers is paramount because the transformation of African minds is dependent or is directly and, and, and proportional to our growth as a people. So she gave so many recommendations. I just quickly highlighted this, invest in AI research centers, <clears throat> invest in African minds because <clears throat> a lot of transformation is dependent on our intellectual capacity. She said all of this and many more. Thank you, Maha. I do have a couple of questions. In your work with all, in your work at the African Data Research Center, what do you think is the level of adoption as far as the youth transformation is concerned from the work that you guys do? How many countries would you say are beginning to adopt AI solutions to develop the youths in their country? What's the level of acceptability within Africa? Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, okay, I'm hearing you, I'm hearing you. Uh, you know, uh, if you if we talk about uh, how many countries they are adapting uh, 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 AI AI for youth development, let's talk about uh, let's reformulate the, the the question. It's how many countries launched okay. their national I said, I said what? AI strategy? No, 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 I mean I understand you. I understand you. No, just some, okay, okay, okay. No, I got I got your point. I got through really your point. Okay. However, okay. the reality it's better it's better to ask how many countries how many countries develop their AI national strategy. We are in the age of advocating for artificial intelligence there. 
like we di we didn't go further you know the last time uh, happens the artificial intelligence summit in riyadh in saudi arabia yeah and there there were only the saudi arabians who have who launched their national strategies and implementing of youth in edu uh, of developing youth in education system in north africa non north african country even we have only egypt who launched last month they are the, they are the only one in the north africans who launched national ai strategy however the rest of the country not they don't have you get what i mean so we are really behind truly behind i'm telling you the truth we are still advocating about like for example me i'm i'm invited uh, tomorrow with one of the most famous radio station in tunisia and when we were discussed about the content i have been advised to talk about the meaning of ai me i was about i prepared about my speech my talk my points about uh, youth implement youth development ai so they told me hey, hold on we are still we have to explain to our people the meaning of ai well in this stage unfortunately we, there, there, there are not so many. And if we talk about AI and education, we talk, in general, we refer to South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Egypt, and somehow, uh, that's all. According to the 54 country in the continent. You got what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I, that's a rather that's that's a start, that's a low figure. We have to tell the truth. Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah. hearing you. Yeah. We have to tell the truth to our people. Yeah. That yeah. that's why yeah. today we are discussing we are discussing tech and yeah. development yeah. and again i will ask the same question why saudi arabia they could hold the ai summit international summit and why none of our continent can do it while Af why saudi arabia they are arabs they are under development why they can go for words and why we di we didn't So here, the answer is, all what happens, it's about political decisions. What we want. If we really have right political decisions that we are moving to AI and we want to invest in AI, we will do it. It's not about capabilities or anything, no. Countries are like us. They could do it. Like uh, in, in Emirates, for example, last year they have launched their AI ethics co curriculum, Emirates and the developed country. Bahrain, Qatar, all of the Gulfs, they could it. However, we, North Africa, we, we, we didn't move uh, forwards, other African countries too. So I think the problem is on our agenda. We are not putting AI, new technology on the top of the agenda. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. What you're saying today is a feedback for all of us at different levels of engagement. It's saying that Gulf countries are beginning, to, or well, not even beginning, they have been at the forefront of pioneering technology, digital technology. Mm -hmm. She's saying that why can't it be us Africans really creating even an AI entire? No, you know, she was saying that the United Arab Emirates they've created an AI curriculum that can be embedded in their schools. I believe that's what she said. 
AI ethics, yes, they are teaching AI ethics. They have their own artificial intelligence ethics. Wow. So the people, they, <laughs> they're really on the front line, huh? In Arabic, in their name. We do language. have a lot of work to <laughs> Yeah, I understand that. Um, so Maha, how do we move this forward? Considering the fact that where we are at now in Africa, we need to focus on advocacy to even be able to get this to be listened and adopted at any level of our government. Because like you said, we have to keep advocating. So how, what, what, what plans do you have in place? Or let me know answer, ask the question this way. Let me ask it in this other way. At the artificial data center that you happen to run, do you consciously mentor young people who in themselves will begin to advocate for AI in their different countries? That's question one. Yes. Question yes. two is, are they scattered across the continent? How do you, how do people get into this if they want to be a part of what it is that you do? Okay, first of all, I'm mentoring. We do have some mentoring uh, program for African youth. Plus, the most hard work for me is to creating content in Arabic in the native language of North Africa. Because the knowledge itself, AI knowledge, it's, it's generated in English. All of the, yeah. So we, I have this problem of bringing this language, these sciences into our own language. And it's not a simple translation. At the end of the day, you are faci facilitating these sciences to your own people and trying to make it adaptable for them. Uh, we call it uh, uh, la, la, la facilitation. I mean, like, because I, I realized by the time that the Franco Arabs, they have a lot of problem on understanding because all, all of this is written it into the, with different language. So we do have this problem. Yeah. The second, uh, pushing youth for advocating. Our youth, they don't need any push for advocating. They are there, they are conscious. They, they grew up with me, for example, I was born in 1987. So when, when I'm in, when uh, 2007, I was in my uh, 19th, I got a computer as a gift. And I, I, you know, at that time, I was the only one in the city who has a computer. <laughs> like it was, wow, <laughs> something very, really privileged, you know? <laughs> yes, in 2007, like who can have a computer <laughs> in Tunisia? Well, so now it's not privileged to have a computer. The, the mentality is changing. The technology is still yeah. accessible. So yeah. those youth, they have more conscious. However, however, they are facing an old school policies. I give you an example. In Tunisia, till yeah. now, we don't have law framework for digital commerce and digital economy. PayPal, it's not allowed in the mm. country. Cryptocurrency, it's still forbidden. Because when we ask it to the central bank why it is forbidden, I mean, like, we, I need, we yeah. need cryptocurrency. So they said because we are facing uh, terrorism attacks and we, we are, uh, we are afraid from uh, uh, bl uh, blanchiment d'argent and, and all of this, like uh, fraud and uh, uh, issue of cyber securities on so, and so on which is for me, it's a senseless because you can't stop our rights to get online payment because you cannot fix the problem of, of cyber security. And mm. also there are no laws. That's the other issue. Like there are no laws for startup, no laws for uh, digital uh, commerce and so on. This new economy, Required a new framework, required a new world, new laws, new legal system. All of the African countries, they, they are facing this. 
So they have to change yeah. the, the yeah. economic framework it's, itself. So our youth, they are advanced and developed. Mm. However, they are stopped by the legal framework and the whole of the national economic administrative system. This is how it is. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. This is serious. Yeah. It's serious. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Maha. I mean, I just want to say thank you for the work that you do to consistently speak to a matter that may not be widely accepted yet. You know, I can imagine some of the brick walls that may have you have, may have been getting, but that's why pioneers are needed, you know, and that's why conversations like this also exist so that people can see that the work Maha is doing is part of restructuring education and youth development for the Africa we want. We just need to keep partnering with movements like this or organizations like this that continue to Thank speak you. to the different things we want to see in Africa. But just then, um, before you go, there's still one more thing I'd like for you to share. I know this is mainly a, um, this, is, this, is, this is a conference but I want to, I want you to speak to this, and I don't know why this is impressed upon my heart. <laughs> you came from a, you came from a place where you are one of the many children who could have access to maybe the kind of transformation you have had so far. Those mm. pushing you to take. Can you share with me what your story was like, and the idea of sharing what that story is like is to be able to tie to what the average young African girl story is like this is what i'm saying so your own story in comparison what the average african girl's life would look like in the context of where you stay in north africa do you want to do that uh yes thank you thank you my story like um i come from a tunisian family middle class my father was well educated he was working in the tourism sections and he was very open my mother also She's an educated lady, uh, and she's open-minded. The proof that uh, I'm in my 34, and my mother, she didn't put pressure on me to get married or having children or, or come back home. So I'm truly honored and lucky by, by having mother and father as family. And I think being an author, and working in AI and traveling and studying in China, studying abroad, abroad uh, leading uh, tech project. This is related to the education which I had when I was uh, young. I think, yes. So I'm very grateful to mother. <laughs> yes, she, she was very, very open-minded. She, uh, she educated me uh, humanist values, especially being open, open-minded, loving others, accepting the others. Uh, yes, yeah, as, as I always say, it, I mean like it's very rare among Arabs to find someone at my age which is single and happy and didn't have any pressure. Yes, because in Africa, <laughs> like that's crazy. You cannot be in your 34, you're single, you live alone, you don't have kids, and your family give you let you in peace. No, this won't happen in our culture. No, never, never, never. <laughs> my mother will do this. <laughs> Thank you so yes. much, Maha. There are some no, there are some I, visionary I time because I'm grateful to her. She didn't educate me to have a husband. She educated me to be a leader, to be a financially independent. That's why I'm grateful to my mother. Yeah, and she's not putting pressure on me right away. She's encouraged me and doing my PhD. No. Yeah, that's why I said I'm grateful to them. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so good. So good. Thank I, you. I don't know why, why I, had, I have not asked any speaker on this platform this question. No, no, you have to, you have to, because her attitude gives me so the mental health. She, yeah, she, she is on my side against patriarchy, against patriarchal society, and on gender-based violence. We need you, our mothers at this stage. 
Wow. wow! Yes, at this yeah, at this age, I need my mother on my side. Yeah, that's why that's I'm that's very that's comfortable. Conversation. I'm very comfortable. I'm happy. <laughs> thank you, Omo. Oh, thank you. She said. She said. She said her mother is behind her against the patriarchal system in our society. Wow. So this is obviously speaking to parents, and I'm not sure who is going to hear this in North Africa, who's going to hear this in Central Africa, who's going to hear this in um, Southern Africa, who's going to hear this in East or West Africa. I'm not sure who's going to hear this. What she's trying to say to us is that the life of a woman shouldn't end up just because she's raised to be a mother and wife. Those things are great stuff, you know, but that shouldn't be the pinnacle of any woman's career. She grew up in a society where girls her age at a certain age they'll be told go and get married but her parents allowed her and that's why right now she's doing what she's doing with the african and um, um, data intelligence center and all the different things she has been privileged to do in her in her life at 34 right maha africa is proud to know you and i want you to speak an encouragement to a young lady or a woman anywhere who's listening to this right i need you to speak to them to encourage them I want you to encourage people to come out of their comfort zone, really. Okay, what I want to say to ladies who are willing to build a career in the tech field, dear, tech field, sorry, I want to, take, okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry, yes, what I want to say to late girls, uh, please, please understand and believe that tech artificial intelligence, computing, and all career or path you want to build and you want to go, it's about bravery. Arabs on the old time said, what's alive is a stand for bravery. Our life is a stand for bravery. It's all about bravery, courage. Be brave and never hide who you are. No matter say it, no matter try to pull you down, no matter try to control you, no. Have faith on yourself and be brave. And you will do whatever you want to do. Don't fear anything. Just be brave and continue. And don't fear an algorithm or coding. Because when you start studying it and you are not enough Courageous, you may fail, and you may all the time keep asking for help, for help, and you may f and don't. That's why I said, "Bit about bravery." Don't feel that technology, this computer, is on top of you. You are on top of it. You are on the top of everything. Have faith on yourself. That's all. Thank you so much, Maha. Thank you so very yeah, much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Maha says, have faith in yourself, be brave, the trials will come, but be brave. She kept saying, be brave, be brave. And I can understand why she's saying that. She, you know, the AI system seemingly may look like a male-dominated industry, and she's a woman who in the entire North Africa is blazing the trail and bringing new innovation, new knowledge, new awareness, new advocacy as far as the AI space is concerned. And she's doing it fearlessly and tirelessly. So, uh, you know, I like that she's emphasizing be brave because no yes. one is going to speak and say, Maha is here, let's go away. <laughs> but be brave. Thank you so much, Maha. This has been absolutely phenomenal. Jadel says, my take home from here is it's not where I'm from, it is where I'm going. It's not what, dri what I drive or what drives me. It's not what's on me, but what's in me. I am blessed to be here. Thank you so much, Jadel, for sharing. I will make my own trail. Fantastic. Look, Maha, see what somebody said. I just realized that I have been comfortable. I have been comfortable. Yes. I have been uncomfortable. Wow. Wow. This is so good. This is so good. Thank you so much. She said, somebody else says, learning a lot today. I will no longer follow um, where the path leads, 
but going where there is no path, I will definitely leave, leave a trail. This is so good. Thank you so much. This is profound. I love that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all so much for everything you have shared today. Um, Maha, um, before you go, speak to African Government Stakeholders Engagement Forum. Tell us, what do you think about the work that the African Government Stakeholders um, Government Forum does? And what would you like to say to us as far as futuristic events, futuristic plans? Just speak to us as a person who has been in the change-making process. Mm, African government has to work hard. <laughs> I love that. I'm, I'm not satisfied and I'm going to attend the IGF, the Internet Government, uh, the Internet of uh, the Internet Good Governance, IGF. No, in, okay, no, in, I, okay, well, I will let you speak to that. I didn't mean that. I mean us as an organization, African government. Ah, no, you, you. Uh, keep, keep, keep the work and pushing. Just push it. Just keeping noise at the end of they will listen, listen to us and hear us. We don't have any choice. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, you was, I, 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 I didn't want to cut you. Go, go ahead and finish your chain of thoughts about African government. Yes, yes I'm going to the Internet uh, Governance Forum, uh, led by UNECA, in uh, end of November. And there we will see what's going on. And I have a lot of recommendations. We have a lot of anger. I have a lot of things to, to share. Yeah, yes, that's senseless. Because we are talking about internet governance. The first time when I attend internet governance forum was in 90, uh, 2015, when I was volunteer at the African Union Commission. And from that till now, we have keep pushing, repeating, pushing, pushing. I mean, like, there are countries who are when they develop agenda they go through it and they work on it we we launch it african union launched the agenda 2063 2014 till now what happens on the agenda 2063 what happened with the aa we african free trade zone what happened with african free trade movement we have 11 countries who rectify the protocol of free movement of Africa. So I mean, like, we are talking about the African unity and so on, while we are not allowed to travel yeah. in a normal way in our own continent. Yeah, yeah. I can't this understand. is a major problem which we have to highlight. Yeah, yeah. We talk about like globalizations. Our right to travel while me, I'm not free in traveling in my home. Within the continent. Maha, God bless you. This yes. we, guys, we know, <laughs> honest crazy. women, men, everyone, honestly, I like what she just said. She said, We are taking up globalization and we, are, we keep advocating for globalization. Yet within the continent, we can't even move freely. And she said she's going to attend the Internet of Governance event in, in November and she has a lot to say to all the African leaders who are going to be there, to say to them, stop acting as though <laughs> the globalization you make noise about is something you truly believe yes. in. Yes. Because within your continent, we can move freely. I want to go to Ghana, all hassles. I want to literally, why? And we're talking about AFCFT and implementation. Mm. We need to speak to each other. We need representation on those tables, right? We need people, young people, you need to be in these rooms and speak so that they know that we're paying attention. We are watching. Sometimes we even need to challenge the way they think, right? Honestly, at this point, I feel like Maha, this has been the highlight of today's conversation. You want to go to that event and say to them, you keep talking about globalization. Meanwhile, within your entire own yes, country. Yes, and yes. And there yeah. and it will be a hard time to get a visa for Ethiopia. I can imagine. I yes, can imagine. So, I mean, my dear, <laughs> that's why I'm telling you there are a lot of things. <laughs> Yes. Thank you so much, Maha. Yes. From all of us at the African Government Stakeholders Engagement Forum, this has been a delight listening to you today. We look forward to Thank greater you. conversation. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Wish you a lovely day. All right, moving on very quickly, we're bringing on our next guest, who is a cerebral. I love this woman so much. I love her so very much. I've had the opportunity to interact with her at various capacities. 
I love her so much. Be ready to get blown away. Nicole Makosawe, she developed the tried and tested research-based crystallized framework, which delivers context-specific solutions in strategy, process improvement, business process, business process re-engineering, sorry, technology, human capital development, and business expansion through international trade, including intra-African trade and investment. With 14 plus years under her belt, working with a broad range of organizations across different continents, Noreen has led design development and deployment of strategy, technology, and market expansion projects that have generated revenue for companies to the combined tune of millions of dollars. Whether delivering keynotes at large conferences, giving talks to small group training or contributing on live panels and media discussions, papers, magazines, radio, and TV, Noreen candidly de delivers humorous, research-based, real-world thought leadership to inspire change, to inspire change, apologies. She covers topics related to strategy, business technology, gender equity, inclusion, investment readiness, peak performance, leadership, entrepreneurship, and faith. With a great round of applause, let's welcome Noreen Makosaway to today's conversation. Hi, Noreen. I'm excited hey. to have you here today. I am so excited to be part of this conversation. I've been watching the conversations earlier yesterday and today, and I'm blown away by the thought leadership that has come through on the platform. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for having us. Before you go into conversations you're meant to deliver, I wanted to share with us some of the things you have worked on pertaining to education or youth development so that we can take note of it. We have repertoires who are in this conversation taking notes so that we can add it to the entire white paper that will be developed post-conference. So if you do not mind, share with us some of the work that you have been privileged to do around um, both education and youth development on the continent of Africa. My background with youth development actually began when I was 17. I migrated from the country of my birth, Kenya, and moved to the United Kingdom to study. And I attended a church in the UK. At the time, um, I was invited by a friend of mine, a neighbor, attended the church. I was one of the youngest people in the congregation, so I was 17. And the whole time I sat in the congregation, I felt very removed from the conversations they were having. I, I, I could understand what they're saying, but I could not relate. And then there were younger people also in the church. So I was 17 and there was, I think there was 13, 14, 15 year olds in the congregation as well. And after about, I think uh, six months or so, I approached the leadership and I said, look, I know you don't know what to do with the young people. <laughs> and I feel very lost sitting with you. How about you give me the younger, the younger congregation, give us the storeroom in the back. We will not be in your face. We will not be in your hair. And let me lead the Bible study there. And they permitted me because they had no youth programs in that particular congregation. And that was the beginning for me of beginning to understand the needs of young people, the conversations they were having. Why? Because at the time I was within that age group, 17, uh, leading a group of 13, 14, 15 year olds. And I founded the youth group in that church that is still going on until today. I'm no longer there, uh, but it went on um, to attract young people from the neighborhood who just wanted a place to belong, to be heard, and to be understood. So that was my first foray into the whole youth space. Um, years later, as I became, uh, went into the professional space, began to develop my career, build my career, I still had a connection with young people. So outside of, of setting up the, 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 the youth group in that church, I became a youth mentor, even though I was young myself. And a lot of young people would come to me and ask questions, Noreen, how do I develop my career? I want to apply for this job. What do I do about this relationship? So it was very generic. I did not have youth training or professional youth training, but I had a passion for young people. Um, and decades later, as a strategic advisor, working with companies and, and working with 
young founders even, and advising millennial founders in different countries, in different industries, I have seen the evolution of young people. I have seen the evolution of conversations around youth. I have attended governmental development programs, conferences, discussing young people. And I have thoughts, I have concerns, I have ideas. Um, and that is my background with working with young people. So right now, with the work that we do, even though we work primarily with private sector and government, I run in a personal capacity, I mentor young people. I mentor young entrepreneurs who are really passionate about visions that they have, but they don't know how to actualize. They don't have the resources. They don't have the support that they need. I do one-on-one. -on -one. I used to do a lot of group before, but it's exhausting. And I feel like there's a lot of mentor, mentor fatigue on the continent, but it's still something that I feel uh, we should be responsible for as Africans, whether in diaspora or um, in, in our, our respective countries. I'm still trying to download your slides while it's still downloading. I think that you should also share with us what do you think so far. You have listened to all sister. I saw you in the comment session with us what you think. The, so get to some level of solutions that we can take to the table as Africans. Sorry, could you just repeat that? I think the connection was a bit, uh, it broke off, it froze on my end. Do you mind just repeating your statement or question? Okay. Yes. Do you want to speak to, I keep saying, okay. Do you want to speak to the fact that um, the conversations we had from yesterday were conversations some of have talked about since yesterday and how they can truly help us achieve our goals at I don't know why it's taking so long. Yes, absolutely. I have been following the conversations. I'm also trying to do something on this end to see if I can get you the presentation in another way. Um but uh yes, I I did follow the conversation yesterday. I listened to the speakers yesterday. I listened to the speakers earlier this morning and right now, uh, just before me. I love the different perspectives that we have going on the platform. I love the passion. I think what I love the most is the fact that everybody is bringing solutions that are breaking systems. I think I really like that. Um, yesterday, there was... Um, I think, what was her name? The founder of Jacaranda Hub in Zambia. And she shared some really fantastic insights around be, becoming mentors and taking responsibility for, you know, go taking the ladder back down and bringing people with you. That there's a level you get to where you can't go any higher. You can only go back down and bring somebody with you. I really love that perspective because I feel like we all have a responsibility. Um, as Africans, whether you're born in Africa or, or not, we all have a responsibility for developing the future, the future of Africa through youth development, um, supporting somebody through your resources, through your knowledge, through your know-how, through your networks. I really like that perspective. And I think also um, Dr. Tafa, I mean, Dr. Tafa brought some fire yesterday. <laughs> I really, really love what he said about um, young people taking responsibility and being humble enough to stay the course of being taught, even though they don't like the feeling of being taught and being disciplined enough to be mentored by people who may have difficult characters or characteristics and learning from them to then receive the impartation of knowledge and even investment. So he used, I think he used the, um, the, the, the system or the framework that is used in Northern Nigeria, where a young person goes into an enterprise and then is mentored by the owner of the enterprise. They pass the knowledge on, uh, they work for a period of time. And when they feel, the owner feels that they're qualified, then they, they pay them and invest in them 
to set up their own enterprise. And I really like that model of apprenticeship that he mentioned because it's not as widespread as it should be, but I feel it is a method of youth development that is um, is something that we should embrace continent-wide, but again, it's also culturally driven. So there's a mindset shift and a paradigm shift that would need to happen for other cultures to take on that type of apprenticeship. Um, and then Nicole, I think I love Nicole, Nicole Bussari's take on, um, on, on, uh, on developing young people and the, the programs that she runs to, to support young people to become better in their field or different industries and then preparing them for the workplace. I really like that. And today as well, Edith said young people are, um, they should not be invited to the table because they are the table. <laughs> I really love that. You know, young people are the table, whether yeah. we like it or not. And so if you take 70% of the population, yeah. we're crippled. So I really love that perspective. And then also, um, I think it's Ambassador Hassan or Dr. Yeah. Hassan who spoke earlier um, and his take on 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 understanding our power as Africans and the resources from the continent and then developing that, mm. uh, but also through collaboration and partnerships. I mean, he said so much, I really need to go back and watch it, but I really love his perspective on taking ownership as Africans, whether in diaspora, because he's in diaspora and he's working in partnership with, um, uh, mm. with high level institutions and high level um, individuals and working with governments and partnering to teach them about Africa, but also to bring Africans to mm. the table to understand who they are. Um, and the lady who just spoke, I think it's yeah. Mara um, from, from, from North Africa and breaking the patriarchal systems and being a woman who really <laughs> is about building her own future supported by her mother. I really like that. So there is so much information that has come through. Yeah. Um, and I think out of all of these things and the white paper that is going to be developed, I feel um, we have an opportunity to bring this collective of minds together from different parts of Africa, because you have the West Africa perspective, you have the North Africa perspective, perspective East, Central, mm. um, Francophone also, mm. all at the table, um, including diaspora. I feel like this is really a conference. I mean, I think yesterday I did wish, and even today, that this will be a, it would have been a physical conference because <laughs> I have so many questions for some of the speakers. So I hope that the next one is going to be a physical I was conference. Was the initial plan was in the country. Sorry? Okay. That's, that's the plan. I mean, those are the conversations we're going to have. I said, that's the, that was the initial plan. But yeah. um, those are the, those are the conversations we would have when we have a, a post meeting, you know. Yeah, those are the conversations we need to have. Um, I still have, I'm still having issues down. That's fine. I can present on my. Don't worry. You don't have to have that it on share the button. Attempt to bring it up and add it for the conversation. Okay. Just shall I just go ahead? You said you could present from your laptop. Okay, that's fine. I think there's a there's a time delay, so please forgive me if there's an overlap in our speaking. There's a time delay on on in the communication. So the mandate that I got from the Africa Governmental Stakeholders Forum. Um was today to to share some thoughts around the reality behind our current approach to youth development and the opportunity cost. So I'm going to just to use the slides as a guide, but this is really, I would love it to be a dialogue. This is why I was, I would love for this to have been a physical forum where we could, you know, share thoughts, ask questions. So please, if you have any questions, 
feel free to type them in the chat section and Justin, the team will share if, um, if needed. So this is really looking at Africa's, Africa's youth's present and future, the reality behind our current approach continentally um, to youth development and the opportunity cost. I'm gonna start with some numbers, why? Because numbers don't lie. My opinion would count for something, but really people tend to trust in numbers more than human opinion. So I'm gonna give you some facts and figures um, that come from different reports um, and you can research them yourself from the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, ETC. And I'm going to use a few numbers as, as we do this, uh, this presentation. 70% of Africa's population is young people. I think that has already been stated in this forum earlier today and even yesterday. Out of this 70%, 60% are unemployed. 60% of Africa's youth are unemployed. Seven in 10 men can read on the continent of Africa. And this is based on, I think, the Africa literacy. Uh, there's an organization that focuses on Africa literacy. Seven in 10 men in Africa can read. Of the population, only four in 10 women can read. So there's a big gap in our literacy um, on the continent. And, and the reason I'm stating this is I'm going to lead somewhere with it. There is an agenda 2063 for the development of Africa. And it's to get Africa to a position of being a global superpower. However, we are lagging behind in a number of things that can make us that superpower. Literacy being a big, big factor because if they're unable to read and comprehend, getting them to the point where they can understand uh, just basic mathematics and building businesses and teaching their children and transferring their knowledge onto their children is going to be problematic. So Agenda 2063 will not happen if we do not get all hands on deck to get us to the point of increased literacy and also increased employment. And when I say all hands on deck, I'm talking about family at very, very uh, nuclear level family, then the community and then private sector and government, everybody playing along to national missions to ensure that our populations are intelligent, they're literate, they understand how to compete on a global platform. Now, I want to push back on a narrative, and I hear this narrative a lot at global conferences. I've, I've, I've sat on different panels in different countries discussing um, discussing entrepreneurship, discussing strategy, discussing women in technology. But there is there's something that has always bothered me and it still does. And it's the perceptions we have of not just the continent. In this context, I'm going to speak about the perceptions we have of Africa's youth. And I want to speak about perceptions because it's not just the perception that the Western world, or let me say outside, the outside world, the world outside of Africa has of Africa, but it's also sometimes the perception that Africans have of other Africans. And those Africans could be Africans in diaspora, speaking about Africans on the continent, or Africans in one country, speaking about Africans in another country, right? So this is broken perceptions of Africa's youth. I wish the slide was on the screen. Um, just could you just check for me if you have been able to download, because I really want these images on the screen. For, to illustrate this particular uh, this particular point, is it possible? No. I'm afraid I cannot hear you. Sorry, just I think there's a break in the in the communication. I'm unable to hear you at all. Sorry, guys. Technology and technical glitches. Our apologies. I'm unable to hear just and communicate with the team. 
just let me know if, or you can type it. I have the YouTube page open. So please type and let us know. I think the connection is broken. Huh? Brilliant. Can you hear me, Just? I think the connection completely broke up. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Are you able to hear me, Just? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Okay, sorry, there was a break and a freeze on my end. So if you can hear me, please, could you go to slide number, number four? Slide number four. This one. Thank you so much. So go back, go back one. So thank you. So this is this is something I was I was illustrating the point on perceptions, the perceptions that we have of young people in Africa. And this is perceptions that are not just limited to non-Africans, but it also includes Africans in different parts of Africa having perceptions of other Africans. So this is when people speak of Africa's youth, a lot of times this is the image that they have of Africa's youth. Please go to the next slide. Did you to go to the next slide, please? Can everyone hear me? Please confirm you can hear me. I want to be sure you can hear me. Please confirm you can hear me. Okay, let me attempt to get our speaker back.
Okay, I will attempt to get our speaker now. We apologize for the slight lapse. Okay. Can you hear me now? Is it better now? Yes, yes. It's, it's 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 okay. In my, I, I'm not sure something happened. It dropped off. But I can hear you. What I yeah i don't know why it would pick me to do this but yeah <laughs> so yeah so please please proceed to slide, please proceed to slide four <laughs> hopefully we can get through this without any more challenges with the network i'm trying to the slides left also Yes, yeah, so I was speaking while she was while she Yes, I can hear you. I'm trying to re-upload the slides. So that's still re-uploading. Um, okay. so, so let's let keep speaking. Let's, just let's, let's, <laughs> let me just carry on. And then if you're able to get the slides up, then then yes. we'll just proceed that way. So I was really yes. trying to illustrate yes. the point of mm -hmm. the perceptions that Africans have of each other and the perceptions that the West, or let me say non-Africans also have of Africa, which get in the way of the development mm. of the solution that we need on the continent. So I was using pictures to illustrate that when we speak about youth on the continent, we are very multifaceted. We have so many different ages and different cultures of young people across 54 African countries. So when we talk about developing solutions uh, for education and youth development, we're looking at not just 54 countries, but thousands of tribes, thousands of cultures. For example, I think in Nigeria, you have over, two, over 200 tribes, and these speak different um, dialects or languages. In Kenya, you have over 40. I think they're 44. I don't have the breeze because every time, you know, a new language is discovered um, because people don't even know all the different cultures that we have on the continent. And then you have different countries with different. So when we're talking about youth development, we have to factor in the number one of countries that we have on the continent, the number of cultures that we have on the continent. Yes, we can have. Um, national solutions for education, but we also have to then contextualize those education solutions for the different cultures. I'll give you an example. Um, if you're developing a solution for a tribe, let's call it a tribe in East Africa, that's very um, liberal. They're not as conservative as a particular tribe. You might educate one young person in a particular way and end up offending another culture. These are the some of the complexities we have on the continent. Yes, we have national curriculums that all children go through, um, but beyond that, we can't just look at education alone. We have to look at the entirety of the person, the, the, whole, the cultures they come from, how they dress, how they speak, what they value, the foods that they eat, ETC, their mental health, um, one of the one of the speakers earlier, the keynote and co-founder of of this particular platform, Agsef, Edith mentioned when you're looking at at them, you you want to look at their emotional intelligence, their inter in, in their 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 IQ as well. So in developing youth, we have to look at the context of African cultures and the young people in those in those particular countries to develop solutions that are useful for them. So I wanted to push back against the perceptions we have of young people, because when we look at youth development, we are not just talking about underprivileged young people on the continent. We're also talking about privileged young people on the continent. We're talking about children who go to private schools as well, because even if they, they may have different uh, social challenges, there are some challenges that are that cut across the board, whether they're wealthy, middle class, or or are considered coming from the grassroots or underprivileged, quote unquote. So the perceptions we have have got to be taken into account when it, we're developing solutions, whatever those solutions look like. 
<clears throat> because we can we can develop a solution and target the underserved. We target those who have been largely excluded. But we must not forget also that there is young people who may come from privileged backgrounds who also need to be developed, who also need to be brought up to speed because you can't take one group forward and leave one group behind and expect that the continent is going to be prosperous. So I wanted to push back on that perception. Now, the second thing I wanted to highlight is the context of the continent. When we're developing solutions for education, the education of young people across these 54 countries that we're talking about, different cultures, different languages, uh, you have English speaking, you have French speaking, you have um, Spanish speaking based on... Uh, Lauren, can you hear me? I think there's something with our speakers at work. We apologize, guys. Our speaker is going to be back in a few minutes. We do have... We do have um, another speaker at the background. While we're trying to get our other speaker back, I think that um, what we can do is have the speaker who is back in quickly speak before our, pre our former speaker or comes up. That's what I think while we're waiting for her network to or the network because it's funny how all of a sudden her network is not. <laughs> but anyway, let's quickly. Um, introduce one of our policy panelists and then we will bring Noreen back just immediately after this. Um, Jumane Ntambulike is Tanzanian-born entrepreneur and technologist. Jumane is best known for championing and building stable innovation ecosystems in Africa. He is the company of, he is the founder of Sahara Ventures and Sahara Ventures is the parent company of Sahara Sparks event. Africa's largest event, innovation and technology entrepreneurship. Okay, on innovation and technology and entrepreneurship. Sahara Accelerator is a corporate sponsored and venture backed accelerator. He is mainly known in Tanzania as the first hub manager of Buni Innovation Hub and the champion of Silicon Da, Tanzania's first naturally formed technology district in the country's financial capital, Dar es Salaam. For two successful years, 2017 and 2018, he was voted as the most influential Tanzanian in science and technology on public voting facilitated by advanced media. Jumane is part of St. Garland Symposium Leaders of Tomorrow and a judge on MIT Inclusive Innovation Challenge. In 2014, Jumane was selected by GESCI as the best participant of the program Africa Leadership in ICT, a program that involved experts from across the continent. With a rousing sound of applause, please let's welcome my dear brother, Jumani, to today's conversation. Hi, brother. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm very excited and to engage in I'm doing well. <laughs> it's been such a while. How is business? How is family? Um, the business is, uh, is moving okay. Uh, my family is doing fine. It's a sunny day in Dar es Salaam. I'm attending a conference, Fantastic. so I'm outside the main venue of the conference to do this conference. <laughs> That's fine. We'll let you have yours quickly so you can go back to your event. So please go ahead and speak to us on policy recommendations and improving quality of education in Africa. Please go ahead. Okay. Your mic is muted. Great, great. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry, can you hear me? 
Yes, loud and clear. I can hear you. Okay, great. How do I navigate my slide? Or someone will be navigating I will. for me. I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. Okay, great. Um, so uh, in front of us, we have a very interesting picture. But basically, yeah. this is where our world is going. So digital transformation and digital disruption, they are going to change almost everything as we know it. And one of the crucial sectors that is going to prepare us for those changes is the education sector. So while in Africa, robots are not taking the jobs, but software are eating most of the jobs that we have. Argumented intelligence is becoming a real thing where uh, our graduates need to learn to work hand on hand with computers and digital devices to be able to stay competent in the job market. For example, uh, traditional causes such as uh, legal or procurement causes or arts, they are all being disrupted in one way or the other by digital tools and, and digital solution. If you can take me to the next slide, please. So when we want to rethink the quality of education, I think the first and most important thing is to have a collective definition of what do we mean by quality education. Um, quality education has been identified as goal number four of the SDGs, and uh, UNESCO primarily define it as education systems that incorporate delivery of appropriate skills, education systems that pay attention to gender parity, education systems that ensure you have relevant infrastructure, equipment, as well as educational materials and resources to allow people to attain quality education without forgetting having the right infrastructure and support mechanism, especially from a human capital side, to allow students and consumers of education to be able to attain quality education. So the key question is, uh, if these are the variables that forms a quality education, do we have them in Africa? We've been able to fix them to make sure that we're having the quality of education. Uh, take me to the next slide, please. In recent years, most of the African countries have been able to at least achieve uh, the mandatory, the goal that we have set by the MDGs and SDG in terms of the student enrollment. And if you look in most of the countries, especially uh, for basic uh, education, which include um, secondary and primary education, you will realize that we've been able to attain those numbers we have set in terms of enrollment. In my country, Tanzania, for primary school, we've been exceeding even the 100% goal of enrolling the student. But the key question has always been finding the right balance between enrolling student and also ensuring they receive quality education. The battle between quantity and quality uh, is continuing to eat uh, most of the African countries. As you can see in front of me, uh, that chart was um, published in the Brookings uh, Institute's article on the quality of education. And it shows the percentage of primary school students who pass a minimum proficiency threshold in Africa. And you can see the number is very low compared to the rest of the globe when it comes to basic mathematics and reading. If you look uh, where Europe is and East Asia is, and you can compare to where uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is, and then you can easily realize there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, take me to the next slide, please. To bridge the gap, if we continue to do with what we are doing right now, meaning that if we continue to do uh, business as usual with our policies and our strategies, to fix that gap is projected, we are going to at least need 85 years to catch up with our counterparts in developing regions, which makes this discussion around the quality of education and fixing the policies around quality of education one of the most important discussion that, as a continent, we need to have. Take me to the next slide, please. So why do we need to rethink education and why do we need to reform our policies? Africa currently is facing three major key issues. Uh, that are affecting the continent. The first one is the rise 
of the number and the increase of our youthful population uh, exponentially. Africa currently is one of the youngest continent in the world and millions of young people within the productive age are flocking into the job market. Uh, depending on the statistics and where you read, it estimates that 10 to 11 million youths are joining the job market in Africa every year. And our capability to create new jobs every year is somewhere around 3 million. Uh, in my own country, Tanzania, it is estimated almost 1 million youths are getting into the job market every year. And our capability to absorb them is less than 10%. And this has been happening for the past eight years. The picture you are seeing in front of you uh, on your left, that is not a football match. That is an interview in Tanzania. Those young guys, college graduates, have gone to take part uh, in an interview for a constable position for a local immigration office. So you can imagine these are millions of there are millions of young graduates across the African continent who in one way or the other coming from a very impoverished background. Uh, their parents have worked really hard to make sure they get education, but still they're becoming irrelevant to the job market. Take me to the next slide, please. But digital transformation and technological evolution is not leaving us alone. Every sector is getting disrupted. And while all these sectors are getting disrupted, our education system still remains the same. It is mainly around brick and mortars. Our strategies are around increasing the number of classes and making sure we have enough desks so that our students can go to the classroom. But beyond brick and mortars, what are we doing to catch up with this transformation? Africa being the youngest continent, in the next 20 to 30 years, most of the young Africans who are graduating right now might be irrelevant to the job market, which might have uh, a negative consequence to the continent. World Economic Forum is predicting by 2025, almost 85 million jobs will be dispersed by automation and technology. The key issues are our policies and strategies and plan at the continent level uh, designed to be able to cope with those disruption and those changes. If you can take me to the next slide, please. Another third chaotic problem that we are facing is a skills mismatch. As you can see in that picture, it's a very interesting picture. The banner that has been carried by a lady says, we are not lazy, we are unemployed. The key issue and one of the key challenges that is facing the continent right now, especially in our education system, there's a huge skills mismatch between what our education system is offering and what the industry need. So while we are facing the challenge of not having enough jobs, at the same time, we are facing the challenge of ensuring the few jobs we have actually our graduate possess the relevant skills for them to be uh, accommodated by those jobs. Please take me to the next slide. So what is wrong with our education system? I was reading a very interesting book by an educationist, African educationist called Karim Ilji. Um, he was talking about ar issues around under education in Africa, assessing education from the colonial days to currently where there's um, elements of neoliberalism in most of our economies. So the key issue is what have gone wrong, where we've gone wrong. So these are some of the issues that he identified. So the first thing is there's a huge disconnect between our education system and our economies. In a country like Tanzania, where we are pitching that we want to move toward uh, industrial economy, nothing much in terms of reshaping our education system to meet with the industrialization agenda. You would have expected strategies toward uh, establishing alternative reskilling platforms to ensure young people have skills around fabrication, and manufacturing that established, but nothing is happening in relation to what we're speaking. So this huge disconnect is happening across multiple African countries where the government is pitching one thing and the education system is going to another direction. Another issue is also poorly regulated uh, expansion of education systems. Um, establishment of schools is not well coordinated establishment of academic institutions is not well coordinated, poor standardization of materials and content that is being delivered, 
and also um, setting the bar very low for experts and human capital that is supposed to be delivering quality education. Uh, over dependence on external resources to finding even the most to financing even the most crucial sectors and issues within our education system. And there's been a lot of negative attitude toward promotion of local and indigenous knowledge. Instead, we are trying to embrace everything foreign, even if it's not relevant in our own context. We are so much focused on memory-based learning instead of critical thinking and competence-based learning. And also, uh, in terms of experts, there's the highest level of unprofessional educators, including unethical uh, practices among students, which is very common in most of the higher learning institutions uh, uh, in Africa. So what needs to be done? Next slide, please. First, we need to ask ourselves critical questions if we want to reform our policies. What is the purpose of education in Africa for individual and society? Because one of the challenges we are facing right now the definition of what education is and what was the purpose of education was defined during the colonial era and post-independence era, especially in the early years, and it hasn't changed since then. So there's a lot of confusion on what is the purpose of education and how education is integrated into our communities and societies. The second question is, how is relevant, how relevant is our current education system in terms of our context? Does it address the current challenges that we're facing? Is it feasible? Is it desirable? Is it relevant in terms of some of the problems that are facing our society today? We also need to reflect on our education curricula and what, what they should be in order to be able to meet some of the issues that we want to address. We also need to understand and develop interest on how our education system should serve. Who should it serve? How should it serve? And who should design how it serve? But also we should um, pay more attention and ask ourselves whether uh, our education institution uh, should be run in a more democratic way. Um, should it be influenced by policies and politics of the countries, which is very, very common in Africa uh, a ruling party might say this about the education and another party which wins change education in another way coming up with new policies. What is the role of teachers and educators in our education system? And also, what do we mean by good or poor quality education in our, in our, in our, in our, in our, in our own countries? And finally, in my last slide, please take me to the last slide. Few things can be done and needs to be done quickly. In terms of the system more relevant in local contexting grassroots challenges um, facing the communities today. Second, we need to look at education by numbers of beyond numbers of students enrolled. We need to revisit our key performance indicators and search benchmark that will allow us to measure beyond just quantity but also to focus on quality. We need to make our education system more responsive to cultural diversity, preparing the students to be local, regional, and global citizens. But also we need to future-proof our education system by ensuring policies aligns with digital transformations and global disruptions. We also need to make our education system more inclusive, providing equal access to all, and to be very careful not to fall into education apathy, where those who have money and income and coming from rich family are getting high quality education, and those who are less privileged are getting poor quality education. And finally, we cannot afford to have old policies and regulation. We need to rethink our strategy toward better future education systems. Uh, that is what I wanted to share with you, my colleagues, and uh, I'm open for uh, receiving comments or questions based on what was planned on the agenda. Back to you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Germane. I'll just remove this. I feel like I want to add um, 
Lauren on this call so that she and I can speak to you together. Lauren, is that okay? Please drop a comment if that's okay. Someone says, education is the foundation for any human society to evolve and meet aspirations in terms of social and economic development, peace and democracy. What is the role of education in educating the African youth? Jumani, do you want to take that? Yeah, so what is the role of education in education? Okay, great. Uh, let me, let me, let me. Yeah, so thank you so much for that uh, good question. So uh, if I can rephrase the question, what is the role of education in educating African youth? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, I, I, I think, first of all, we need, uh, as I said in my presentation, we need to make education more relevant because as the days goes, especially education offered at the tertiary level is becoming more irrelevant to African youth because of the challenges that are facing in the job market. So I think uh, the education uh, that is being offered should be able, first of all, to bridge the gap between what is needed by the market and what is being offered. But the education should also prepare the student to become lifelong learners instead of just accumulating knowledge to respond to questions. And the education also should be able to allow a uh, student to cope with the disruptions and digital transformation and other things that are happening within their, their environment. But also it should prepare the students to be problem solvers within their community instead of just uh, consuming solutions. Uh, and to reach that level of education is not easy. We need to be strategic. We need to work collaboratively together and we need to redefine our education policies and strategies. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Noreen. Are there things you want to ask um, Jumani? Because what he brings to the table is the policy side of this conversation, especially around education. So there are things you feel like you want to speak to him about, Noreen. Thanks, Just. Um, Jemaine, thank you so much for sharing your insights around uh, education and around policy. I think one question that, uh, that comes to mind for me when it comes to policy, development of policy, um, looking at the perspective of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, are there any plans that you're aware of uh, across the continent uh, through this partnership where policy is being developed to harmonize education one, either regionally or continentally. Is there anything like that? Or if not, is that something that we can look forward to in the future? Yeah, that, that, is, a, that, is, a, that is a very good question. I know that uh, 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 there is already uh, uh, policy alignment between country when it comes to STI, science, uh, technology and innovation. For example, there's a regional indicators on how to measure countries and benchmark them uh, on science, technology, and innovation. And that benchmark has been set by STISA, uh, which is focusing primarily on the SADC region, I think. Uh, but I'm not sure if there's the same kind of a benchmarking tool uh, uh, for African countries when it comes to what should we expect or what should be the output of our education system to influence the after agenda. It's something I can research on, but on your second question, do we need it? I think it's very, very important and, and we need it. When we are talking about uh, opening borders and allowing talent to move across the continent, as I said in my presentation, uh, we need to make sure we, through our education system, we create uh, talent that can fit into regional as well as global market uh, a young student graduating in in in, in lagos or lilongwe should be able to work in kampala or chigali or dar es salaam and that is the quality of education we should be able to 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 achieve and if we feel our existing higher learning institution might uh, face challenges to reach to that goal in time then we can look on alternative reskilling platform if you look at platforms like Andela, what they're doing with software engineers, and Gebea and some other platform, and like Moringa School in Nairobi, reskilling youth with relevant skills that are needed by the market and skills that are cross-cutting, which can allow them to work in any market. Those stuff can be done, but again, at a policy level and at a continental level, it really needs the commitment of our government and especially our leaders in making that happen because 
private sector can do to some extent, but in order to have like a massive transformation, it has to be done from the government side, to be honest, especially at the regional level. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Jumani. Thank you so very much. Other than that, um, what do you think is the willingness to implement um, the upskilling process or the reskilling process that you spoke about by most African governments? I mean, speaking to the governments within the region where you function, what do you think is the readiness or willingness of these governments to accept reskilling as a very serious part of our curriculum transformation in Africa? Uh, can you hear me? I, I had a technical glitch. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. So I think the willingness and the commitment, to be honest, is there. Uh, the, the biggest challenge is, do they know what they're supposed to be doing? Because we usually assume policymakers, in whom most of them are BBC, born before computers and all this crazy stuff that are happening to the world today, they are capable of designing policies that are going to shape the future of the continent. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, you went off for a second, but Hello, can you're you hear back me? now. Yes, I can, yeah, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, for some reason, my internet is starting to act up. So I was saying, uh, in summary, we need a branded leadership where these leaders... Yeah. Uh, working with other young leaders to be able to design policies that are more relevant to the current environment to address the challenges that we're currently facing and the future challenges. So willingness is there. The key issue is exposure. Are they exposed enough to make those decisions? Jumani, can you hear me? Yeah, I think he has muted. C can you hear me, guys? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, I, I, I had a bit of a technical glitch, sorry. What I was saying is, um, in terms of willingness of African leaders to take uh, these changes and to incorporate these changes in the policy and other necessary plans, I think what is needed is um, a branded leadership where exposed young people can meet and engage with some of the senior guys, sit on the table together to design these policies. Because one of the challenge, we usually assume that they understand these things. They understand the digital disruption. They understand how technology is shaping things and all those kind of stuff. Uh, I'm sitting as a board mm -hmm. member of Tanzania Education Authority. And sitting in that board, influencing curriculum and other things has made me to learn a lot that if we really want to see these changes happen, as young Africans, we need to have seats on those tables so that we can strategically advise on what needs to be done so that it can be relevant to what is needed now. So we should be more optimistic and also we should be able to challenge our leaders and sit on the table with them to design what is needed for the current and the future of the continent. Thank you so much. The other speakers who came here talked about the fact that. Mm -hmm. I hope you can hear me clearly. Now I can hear you clearly. I just missed like a statement. I missed, I missed your first statement. Okay. okay, I said the earlier speakers who came spoke about the fact that nobody will give you a seat at the tables. <laughs> How then do you get into these tables? Yeah, because you just said it now. He said, we need to sit at those tables where these decisions are made. Jumane, so you need to share with us, how do you get into those tables? Because I know you have been at those tables and consistently keep doing it. So how do we get yeah. into those tables to shape the conversations, I mean, to shape the decisions that will 
drive the kind of change we want to see? I, I, I think we should kick the door and get in. And, and what I mean by that, <laughs> what I mean by that, we need to be more aggressive. Uh, a, a lot of young people, even if you talk to them, as simple thing as voting, like why you're not voting, they'll be like, no, but when, even if I vote, it won't influence anything. And then we'll be talking on Twitter, like things are not working, coming up with hashtags and so many things. But you are not in the room where decisions are being made. So I think we just need to be more aggressive and request for a seat on the table. And nobody will save the seat on the table for you on a silver platter. You have to be more aggressive. You have to prove that um, uh, you can actually do the change. And if you get that opportunity to do that, don't let down other youths who has trusted you to have that seat on the table. That is all I can say. Ivana, you, you successfully actually answered this question politically. That was such a political <laughs> statement. No, really, don't you think so? I said, how do we get to the table? He said, you have to be aggressive. You have to break down the table. He didn't answer the question. He just successfully politically answered the question. <laughs> So I'm still going to come back to that question. Jomani, how do we get into the room? It's important. Okay. So you see, you know yeah. why I'm asking these questions? Um, mm -hmm. At different levels of the African nation, I mean, at different nations in Africa, there are elections mm -hmm. or preparations for elections going out, going around the different countries on the continent. And you would find mm -hmm. that it's the same sets of persons that are still mm -hmm. within the corridor of power. You would see it across mm -hmm. everywhere we are. Right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they are outside here speaking to change, speaking to power. But I mean, the decisions happen inside the rooms where we are not in. So it's imperative mm -hmm. that we know how do we break down these doors, Jumani? Give us two tips. How do we break down these two yeah, tips? Yeah, then, yeah. yeah. So we'll let you go. So I, th I think the first thing is we need to redefine who is a reader. The fact that mm -hmm. our, our, our definition in Africa, which you've agreed for you to be a leader, you have to be a political leader. First of all, to me, that is wrong. You don't need to be a leader. You don't need to be a political leader to impact change. I'm a, I'm a businessman. I run business. But I, I believe most of the work that I do in Tanzania influence people's lives. The advice I give to the government influence the decision they make and also strategically create opportunity for other young Tanzanians. So I believe, first of all, where you are with the influence you have, whether you're a political leader or not, what are you doing to influence change within your country? And I can mention, for example, in Nigeria, you and there some few other young Africans, you're not in the political positions, but you're still doing a platform, hosting a platform like this to discuss about these issues. I know you could have used this time to negotiate a deal with a client or something like that, but you have created this platform for these discussions to happen. And to me, that is the first uh, important step, redefining who is a young leader or who is a leader in Africa. Uh, Tony Lumelo is not a politician, he's a businessman, but he has created a platform where thousands of young entrepreneurs across African continent are benefiting from it. So I think that is gaining a seat on the table in one way or the other, because you can influence change. It doesn't have to be through a vote or a political party. It can be through any vehicle that you use to influence those changes. So again, let's define also the table we want to sit in. So that is first from my side. And uh, the, second, the second one is politics. Uh, we need young people in uh, political arenas. We need them at the local government authority all the way to the central government. And in order to be able to do that, as I said, we need to be aggressive. We need to go to those political alleys in which most of the time young people say, no, I don't want to waste my time uh, to go there and compete with that old guy. But when that old guy is elected, he will be making very crucial decisions for you. And uh, you, you, you reach in a very unfortunate situation in, very, in most of the African countries. Two of the African major economy, Kenya and Nigeria, they are... They are, they are, they are in the period of election, the Kenya, they've just got their, their, their president and you guys are heading to that direction. And when you talk to most of the young people, like, are you ready to vote these guys? They say, okay, we are voting them because we don't have options. They're the only people who are there. But deep down, we know uh, we have seen this before. We have been in this situation before. 
where we are voting someone because the only option we have. So I really feel um, we need those seats. We need young people who want to take part into those seats. And to be honest, I don't have a magic stick uh, to, to be able to do that. But my advice is we need to be more aggressive and also we need to redefine who is a leader in Africa. Thank you so very much. I will, I, I, I will request to stop there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have done well, Jumani. Be, be, Thank be, you before so I got in much. trouble with the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much. We get we get you. We get you. I liked how yeah, you used Tony Lumelu as a as a as an example. He's not a politician, yeah. but he's created yeah. seats at the table by just the work yeah. that he's continued to do. So simply yeah, put, yeah. Jumani is trying to say, keep doing great work. Keep creating opportunities yeah. for others. Keep lifting others yeah. up. Keep platforms others can become better and transform. Just keep being actively involved yeah. in the betterment of lives and society. And eventually, yeah. one day yeah. they will come yeah. to say, please come and help us. Literally. Definitely. That's and that's is. how influence works. Because politician needs influence. The moment you have the influence, they'll call you on the table. <laughs> you see? Jumani, you yeah. have it. Yes, that is. Well, you managing that information. Okay, thank yeah, you so much, yeah, Jumani. Yeah, this yeah. has been a very beautiful session from all of us thank at Access. Thank you so much and have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you so much, guys. And I'm very humbled and honored to be invited. Have a good day. You too. So thank you all. We're going to bring you back to be able to finish our session. We'll move on to the other speakers. Two more speakers for the day. Yes. Um, Dan and Lauren were bringing you Thank you, Just. I hope the connection will be better for us the second time round. Can you hear so me So what well? I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the stage. Yes, yes. I will leave the stage so that I don't cause an interference. But will you be able to hear me and navigate for me the slides? Absolutely, yes. Okay, I'm back okay. here. No problem. Thank you so much. Once again, um, I'm going to pick up my train of thought from where it left off. <laughs> we had technical issues, so our apologies for that. Um, but thank you for staying with us. So I started a, a, the presentation, or let me say, uh, I started the talk by sharing uh, about, about perceptions, the perceptions Africans have of each other as well as the perceptions non-Africans have of Africa. And I, I used different images. So just please go back to me, go back for me, just a quick recap, just in case anybody's just joined us. Um, yeah, that's fine. So these are the perceptions that people have of Africa. And this is not just non-Africans, but also Africans in Africa and outside having of other African countries. And you'll probably hear it sometimes with diaspora and saying, um, that the perception they have had of Africa is not the one that they experienced when they went to say Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, uh, Madagascar, ETC. Please go to the next slide. This is also Africans. Next slide. This is also young Africans. Next slide. This is young Africans working. Next slide. This is also young Africans. Next slide. This is young Africans. So with that part of the, of, the, of the ideas that I was sharing is the perceptions we have of young people influence the, the, the solutions we bring to the table for young people. If we have a view that young people are all underprivileged, then we bring substandard solutions. Or um, if we do not encounter the different variations of youth on the continent, then we do blanket solutions that do not serve everyone. So young people are quite multifaceted on the continent. And then when you look at their age groups um, based on the boxes that you take when you're filling out a form, a young person could be a 15 year old, 19 year old, 21, 25, and even up to 35. Those are considered young people. So when we're, so we're putting solutions together for young people, which groups are we looking at and which solutions are we developing for the context where they are? Because we need to be developing solutions 
for the underprivileged or underrepresented. We need to be developing solutions for the privileged because they also need support. We need to be developing solutions for young people in general, but contextualizing it to the needs that they have in the countries where they are or where they live or the challenges they're experiencing where, where they are. Thanks, um, Just Please uh, proceed to the next slide. The next, uh, and the next slide, please. So looking at the context of Africa's youth challenges. A lot of times when we, when we sit on different panels, that one of the, outside of the context that, that people have of Africa and the perceptions they have, they te there tends to be um, the idea that Africa needs a solution and Africa does need solutions. However, those solutions should be as many as the problems that Africa has. If you look at Africa as a continent and we're looking at youth development in this context, we need to be looking at the different needs in the different countries, in the different cities and, and addressing those needs. I believe um, Dr. Tafa mentioned this I touched on this yesterday, Dr. Hassan also touched on this, but when we're looking at the needs of young people on the continent, we need to be addressing the needs by country. For example, in Sierra Leone and Liberia, like Dr. Hassan spoke about today, we, we, we can go and talk about digitizing the economy and bringing them up to speed to the uh, fourth industrial revolution. But if they don't have something to eat, have we really served them? Uh, if we can go and talk, talk to young people about being motivated and going out to look for jobs. But if uh, I think Edith mentioned this is, is the jobs that we're telling them to go and look for, where are they going to look? Do they even know how to look for jobs? Do they know how to articulate themselves? I think somebody mentioned yesterday that there's graduates coming out of some of the top universities on the continent that cannot even put a letter together, a professional letter. So when you're looking at solutions for the continent, we need to be looking at those solutions by country. The young people in Kenya, what is the biggest challenge they have? The young people in Sierra Leone, the young people in South Africa, the young people in the different countries. So I'm, I'm challenging those on the call, those who are African, whether you're African on the continent or African in diaspora, when you're looking at making an impact on the continent, you, I would, I would recommend picking a part of the continent where you want to make an impact, understanding the challenges within that continent, within the youth, um, uh, demographic and addressing those needs specifically by that country. If you have the capacity to cut across different countries, that's brilliant. But then there are some countries that need more support than others, meaning your attention will be focused on one country at a time, develop solutions, systems, frameworks. And then when that framework framework or those frameworks work, then you can transplant them into other countries because the blanket uh, conversations we have about African development uh, conferences, the blanket conversations that are had, and I won't mention any organization specifically for fear of offending anyone, but those blanket conversations are as detrimental as we want them to be helpful. And instead of building a solution for Africa, let's look at Africa, not just as a continent, but as the different very unique countries with very unique challenges and very unique needs and develop solutions that are contextualized to those countries and the young people in those countries. Just please go to the next slide. I want to give you a case study and just to illustrate the point that I've just made. This is Collins. His name is Collins Odhiambo. Collins is a mentee of mine. I met Collins about six years ago. He reached out to me through one of my siblings. They recommended that he get in touch with me because he had a business idea. Now he's, he's a young person and normally he wouldn't have fit into the client base that we serve. But I believe in mentoring and I have mentored for many years and I mentor tech startups. So I paid attention and I said, Collins, as long as you don't waste my time, let us meet. And Collins and I started working together five years ago. When he came and we started working together, he shared uh, ideas that he had about a business that he wanted to, to set up and worked on those business ideas. And one of his ideas was mentoring young people 
in in Kenya particularly. But when we began to speak and um, his 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 worldview began to expand a little bit more, he thought about Africa as a continent. And so when he was putting out content on his social media platforms, he put out a call for young people to reach out to him. Young people, particularly young men, who wanted mentoring and coaching because he's very much about mindset shifts, transforming the mind of young people so that they see themselves as valuable and worthy and they show up in the job marketplace and then content for what it is that they want. What we did not foresee is when, when Collins put out this call and he put it out on, I think, Twitter and Facebook at the time. And he was keeping me updated on his progress. When he opened up, uh, um, I think he opened up a Facebook page, the number of young men across the continent who were reaching out to him were not reaching out to him for what he thought that they needed, which is mindset transformation. The young, the young men, even I was surprised, but this was good research for us because we were working on a mental health um we were working on a mental health paper for my company to understand how mental health is impacting businesses and how that's we need to transform strategy or, or design strategy that transforms companies in this space. And young people were reaching out to Collins because they'd reached the end of their rope and wanted to end their lives. So young men from Cameroon, young men from um, Central, the Central African Republic, young men from Francophone African countries, young men from Kenya were reaching out to, and asking him, I feel like, and saying to him, I feel like ending my life. How do I get myself out of this dark place so I do not end my life? And he did not feel equipped because he was very much about mindset. But here we were dealing with a mental health problem that was spreading across the continent. And this was something that we had foreseen happening on the continent based on the different development programs that were skewed towards young women as opposed to being inclusive of the young men of Africa who make a big majority of the population. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. So to illustrate that point, what when when, when Collins came to me with this um, update on what he was finding, he said, look, I'm getting a lot of uh, contact from young men what do I do with them? Because I'm not equipped for this. And so we had to begin to create solutions and spaces where these young men did not feel like they'd come to the end of their rope and they had nowhere else to go. So um, Collins began to work with international organizations who could absorb these young people because he did not have the frameworks or the capacity to take them on. And so in our study, we, we actually accelerated our... our um, studying the suicide rates on the continent because mental health was becoming a big thing even though we are a strate strategy consulting company and we do business transformation digital transformation and market expansion the mental health of africa was becoming a big concern why because there's a future of africa and there was a huge there's a huge move to invest on the continent, but a lot of investors, a lot of development organizations, and a lot of um, uh, companies are not paying attention to the time bomb that is mental health in young people. And this is just statistics for 2019 from South Africa, right? South In the suicide numbers in South Africa, I think right now they are ranked at number two globally. This is South Africa alone. We haven't looked at Nigeria, Ghana, and Kenya, which also rank quite highly. So 13, um, 13, 13,774, very specific number. Those, those are the suicides in South Africa in 2019. Out of those suicides, over 10,000, just over 10,000 were male. Well, these were young men. And then out of um, that, that whole number, 2,913 was women. And so this, this then begs the question, if we're investing so much in women, is there a possibility that we have forgotten the African boy child? And this African boy child is the one that we want to sit in in the agenda 2063 to make these visions for these countries happen. And I think that's something that policymakers, private sector, 
and private sector needs to pay attention. Why? Because we are employing these young people. We are putting them in our companies and completely forgetting to look after their mental health, their wellness, their mindset, investing in them, making sure they're okay so that our companies are okay. And if our companies are okay, communities and countries then become okay. So here's a question just to everybody on this platform, because this is a stakeholders uh, forum. Are we skewing and, and maybe um, creating problems for ourselves uh, by investing only more in women than in men, because we need to bring a balance back. I sat in a meeting about six years ago, and we were working on a women in technology uh, project in, in, in West Africa. During this meeting, there was a number of stakeholders who were going to finance part of the project. And there was a conversation around pushing the agenda for women development. I love it and I don't see anything wrong in developing women. However, I did push back in this meeting to ask the question why in developing the women there was no allocation for men. There was they were ticking their boxes because you know there's a huge wave to develop women and we must. But I think in developing women, we've also created a ticking time bomb of forgetting to be develop men and bringing them to the table so that they're able to cope with developed women and have those types of conversations. I say this because this was six years, I think six, seven years ago, and this was before the current massive wave of suicides in South Africa, as well as femicide, where there's a huge wave of young men who are very angry for whatever reason, for different reasons, maybe they feel overlooked, they, they feel underrepresented, and they're taking this out on the same people that they're supposed to be supporting, so fellow young women, or let me say fellow young people. And so there's a huge wave of femicide just in South Africa alone. I think we are seeing the same rise in West Africa, in Nigeria, where gender-based violence is growing. And I bring this conversation to the table because if we're talking about education and youth development, we cannot divorce it. We cannot divorce mental health and gender-based violence from the development because we have to go together to reach their agenda 2063. If we do not bring a balance, then we are headed for trouble. Next slide, please. The third thing that I want to touch on, and this is um, coming close to it to just to wrap up the conversation, is if we're looking at the solutions that are going to be impactful on the continent, particularly looking at young people, I propose, and I think this is something that we, we, we um, Jumanne spoke about. Uh, please just go back for a second to the, the previous slide, the previous slide the previous slide, this, uh, the, the one just before this one. And Jum Jumanna proposed uh, looking at, uh, not this one, sorry, just skip to the next one, the next one with the futuristic leadership development. The, if we are going to, if we are going to, thank you so much, if we are going to prepare the continent to be led by young people, who are right now 70%. And I think just mentioned this in the very early part of today's conversation. She said that agenda 2063 means that we're catching them really early at the early year stage, at the nursery school stage. And I think one of the speakers, I think it was uh, Dr. Hassan, mentioned that we need to begin to infiltrate their education at home with the cartoons they're watching and make them relevant for the continent and the, op the opportunities and the, the mindsets and the, the challenges of the continent begin to infiltrate the game, the game, the gaming sector where young people are playing video games and young children are able to play on the phones. Those need, those games need to be created by Africans to contextualize it. I think there is a company, a diaspora, a company that was founded by African, a, a, a couple, in the UK called Kunde Kids. And Kunde Kids gives, um, uh, has created a platform where young children, really young um, for toddlers who like cartoons and even their older ones, who are able to, they're able to uh, use this platform to learn different languages, whether it's Yoruba, Swahili, you learn different languages, but in cartoon form, so it's engaging, traditional songs from 
uh, Southern Africa traditional songs from West Africa. So that was a really um, important point that was made earlier, is looking at the future of leadership on the continent. Please go to the next slide. So if we are looking at transforming youth on the continent, transforming the continent itself through youth, Here's two questions that I propose that we consider. And I think because the white paper is going to be developed from this, this forum, where are we going in this country? And I put that in this country because, again, I come back to Africa being a co collective of 54 countries or the ones that are recognized because there they are, they are um, territories that are not recognized but are owned by um, former colonial masters were still operating on the continent. So where are we going in this country? Whether you're in Nigeria, you're in Ghana, you're in Lesotho, you're in South Africa, Kenya, you look at it in the context of the country that you want to impact. Where are we going in this country? And even, I'll just throw a challenge out there to ask you, in the country where you are, do you know what the national mission of your country is? just as an individual, as a private sector owner? What is the national mission of that entire country? And then what are the outcomes of that country? Um, what are the outcomes that country is working on? What are the, the, the areas of development that country wants to focus on? Is it roads? Is it youth? Is it women? Is it infrastructure? And what part are you playing in that? Uh, I bring the, I, I, I put this conversation, I put this, um, these questions forward because we need to be very intentional about the development of young people to be able to understand the national mission. Because we can say we're developing young people for technology, we're developing young people for employment, we're developing young people for different things. But what is the national mission of that country? Because you, you can develop young people for technology, but if that country has got other needs that are not technology, are we really serving the country? Do we have a critical mass of young people in that specific country who understand the national mission. And this is this then brings it to schools because schools are following very specific curriculum. Some of them are doing the British system of education, GCSE. Some of them are doing the Cambridge system. Some of them are doing their local systems that are developed. But whatever those systems are, are those systems actually even teaching the national mission of the country so that these children understand the part they're playing even as they're growing and even when they come out of university, they come out knowing this is the part I want to play in the national mission of this country. The second question is, what should we prepare for if once we know the mission of the country and i'm still on this young people matter what should we prepare for because we need to prepare globally sound youth leaders trained on the continent i think somebody mentioned about the brain drain and they you know you can't blame them because they want to leave and when they leave they see a better environment and everybody wants a nice environment. So instead of coming back to a broken environment, they go to the environment that has already been created by somebody else and they stay there for years and years and years. And then we have to beg them to come home and be part of the change. And if, if this is the case, then maybe we need to begin to change our local environments. We need to begin to create institutions on the continent that are not just one off, like the African uh, leadership university. That is one of the few, very few, that are doing this profound work of developing leaders on the continent. We need one of these in every single country. We need an ALU in every single country on the continent where young people can go into a leadership institution, whether the even the curriculum can be standardized and then contextualized, but we need institutions in every single country institutes of innovation in every country that are solving the problems of that country and then preparing that country to export something that is unique. Because even though we are Africa, Kenya should not be like Nigeria. Nigeria should not be like Ghana. Everybody should be exporting the best of what they have. So if a country, for example, like Tanzania, Tanzania and the Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo have the capacity to feed the continent. So if these countries, we can see their land is arable, we can see that they are very wealthy in land resources. 
Tanzania should not then begin to compete with an African country that's purely focused on technology. Why? Because their richest resource is land. Maybe somewhere else their richest resort is uh, resource is minerals and gold and diamonds. And maybe another country, their richest result is human capital. So we begin to focus on the best of that country, develop the best of that country, the human capital, and then we begin to export value within the continent through intra-Africa trade, as well as internationally. And then we become known for something. So Tanzania, I'm not saying this is the case, but it could be the case where Tanzania becomes known for the food it grows. South Africa is known for the beef it exports. Um, uh, which DRC, unfortunately, it has been plundered for many years, is known for the minerals. And so we need to ask ourselves what we should be preparing for. And once we know what we're preparing for, we then take the youth demographic and begin to train them to prepare for the future of that country. Because right now we're developing solutions on the continent that are now focused, whereas we should be looking at 10 years from now. If we analyze the trends, where are we headed? What are the problems we see ahead? Can we prepare for those problems? And I think the youth development solutions that we bring to the table should not be now focused because right now you have young people tussling with old people who do not want to leave positions of power. So instead of tussling with them, we prepare for the future, create the wealth that is needed for the future so that these young people have the influence, like Jumanne mentioned, they have the influence and the financial muscle to then have a seat at the table to dictate how things are run in those countries. So these are some of the ideas I just wanted to share in this forum for consideration. Um, I think I think there's a one last slide or this is the last slide, but these are the thoughts that I wanted to 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 table. We need to look at solutions. We need to look at our perception of ourselves on the continent, uh, each other on the continent before we even worry about what anybody else thinks of us. We need to look at um, uh, the context and the solutions we're putting at, uh, putting together we have to contextualize them. We need to look at futuristic leadership. Uh, and then we need to begin to solve local problems and then expand those local problems by sharing templates with other countries. What happens if nothing changes? We cannot afford to ignore the future of work and the future of education because those people are the 70% of the population now, the young people. If nothing changes, we are stuck in exploitation. And this is exploitation locally because when, he, when young people are not developed adequately, they're not paid well by the people who want to employ them. We're looking at going backwards because no country just stays static. We're either moving forward or we're moving backwards. So if there is no development of young people, we're looking at going backwards instead of forwards. And then the, the issue of inequity and inequality is going to stay with us. We want to change. We want to be seen as a superpower, as a continent. And so we need to really be intentional about the future of education and work through youth development so that we are not part of the exploitation and we are not being exploited by those who come into the continent to take out um, resources, to take out um, young people and take them to other countries, into the, the, the Middle Eastern countries and use them for slavery, things like that. Those are things that we have to be very, very honest about. These are the thoughts that I wanted to share. I'd like to thank AGSEF for giving me this opportunity to air my thoughts. Um, and I'd love to have an ongoing conversation around this. Thank you so much. I'm done. You're muted, just. Thank you so much, Noreen. Thank you so much, Noreen. We cannot afford to ignore the future of education and work. Thank you so much for sharing so nicely what you call, it was such a detailed presentation. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okie dokie, there's so much she said. But before we talk about the things she said, I want to quickly go through the comments. There's been so many comments. I'll just quickly read them and then um, allow us have conversations around what Noreen has shared. I will start from, okay. Said, Honorable Treasure Dominion says, Africa requires so many solutions, not just solutions, but homegrown solution, solutions, absolutely. 
Mogano Global says, wow. Honorable Treasurer Dominion says, Africa has consistently been taken from being robbed overtly and covertly, seductively or brutally, and that's the truth. Imagine. Um, <laughs> she goes on to say, okay, yeah, I think I have read that. I think I have read that. I'm um, just trying to go through the comment section. We need trade, not aid. Come on, establish your businesses here and employ the local population. Absolutely. Mental health and gender-based violence has been met and but has to be met and balanced. Absolutely. Um, if you feel the need to donate, please do so through small businesses. Those are the ones growing the economy. The government taps on the people and most nonprofits are addicted to internet. <laughs> people came with violence today. Edith, can you see? There's violence in the comment section. There's always Someone violence. <laughs> <laughs> Someone says I want to start creating a five-year content for financial literacy, literacy in cartoons. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Now a question. Jadel says, do we have a role to play in the development of our own continent? If yes, please, what are the roles? I think this person may be in the diaspora and wants to know what kind of contributions they can bring. When I say contributions, what kind of role can they play? Absolutely. I, I love that question and I'll answer it how I answered the same question about five years ago at a different conference. And um, I am diaspora, by the way. I was born and brought up in Kenya, lived in the UK all of my youth and adult life. And so I completely get it when people want to be part of the development on the continent. One of the first things I always say is you can watch as many reports as you can, documentaries. You can read World Bank reports. You can read World Health. There is, I mean, there is no shortage of reports. What I would say is, and I can give you recommendations for how to be involved. One of the first things I'll say is, if you're capable and able, get on a flight. Book a flight and get into the ground in whatever country you're passionate about get into the ground and talk to the locals don't talk to government talk to the local people ask them what is going on here what is the biggest need here what is your biggest frustration the reason i say that is even in diaspora a lot of conferences are held by diaspora about africa and yeah. they're based on international reports that have been read and documentaries that have been watched which yeah. are not 100 percent inaccurate but they do miss out context. They do miss out on the context. So getting on the ground is one of the things I always recommend. If you can afford a flight, book a holiday and just get into the country. The second way I think that would be really useful is these organizations in different countries that are diaspora led. And I think there's a huge, um, I think Ghana has got a huge, they even have an office of the president diaspora department that deals with diaspora investment and diaspora engagement. Kenya has the same thing. Tanzania has the same thing. There are a lot of diaspora offices in different countries. And so in your country, I would recommend have a look and see if you can contact your local, uh, your high commission or your embassy and find out what routes and channels they have for engaging between the country where you're living and the country where you really want to be involved. And I know because I've sat in round tables, I sat in a round table a few years ago uh, in the UK where the minister for Africa was talking to Africans in diaspora around what they needed in terms of investment and support to go and be an impactful business or impactful person in their country. So I know there's these plans, but like Jumanne said, when, when these forums are open, a lot of people do not get involved. They don't ask questions. They don't, don't even attend the town hall meetings or whatever because they exist. Those things exist. For example, I think Kenya recently put out a, a, a notification that taxes are going up yet again. And people did not read and did not attend and did not ask questions. So those types of conversations are happening. And if you want to be involved, you can be involved at your in your country through your chamber of commerce or through your high commission or your embassy and if you're able if you're able to afford it get on a plane and go into that country and talk to the people and then find out how you can embed yourself and either be private sector or be development or be charity whatever it is that you choose to be you can be whatever you want to be 
but come with a solution. But one of the things that I actually be very um, clear about, about especially around coming into the continent, is diaspora also tends to come with their preconceived notions about the continent. And that hinders relationship and that hinders opportunity. So come with an open mind or go with an open mind into that country. Do not come with prescribed solutions if you don't have the lived experience of being a young person in that country. Come and learn. Be open to learning. Let them give you what they need or what they're asking for. And then you come with the innovation and the solution and the resources to be part of the change you want to see. That's so good. It is. That's so good. That's so it's good. Amazing. And people can have a mandatory wow. subject just like maths and English language. I loved it. I loved it. Grace Grace says agriculture science, agricultural science should be a mandatory subject like maths and English language in Africa. I completely That's what agree we said with in the morning. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then she says Africa is going to become an exporter of food products. Absolutely. I mean, we talked about this earlier. Fantastic. Do you have any other questions for Noreen Edith so that we'll bring in our next speaker? I love that. Um, if you're to speak to someone in diaspora and you're to tell them. Oh, Edith is frozen. I think Edith's uh, connection is frozen. Okay. Did I come back? Can yeah, you, you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Let me say it quickly before I disappear again. If you're to speak to someone in diaspora and tell them why it is important for them to be part of the African solution, what would you tell them? I would tell them, if you're not part of the African solution, the colonization we saw before we were born is coming mm. back in a different form. Mm. There's mm. no better, better way to say it than that. Yep. One of the reasons why I became really passionate about being on the continent was this. I worked within a global investment bank for 11 years. And whilst I was there, I was reading and I was learning and I was listening. And I foresaw the, 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 the opportunity for the West because they were, they were studying Africa and they were investing and they were pumping money into not just this, but, but you know, um, in the investment banking sector. There was a lot of resources in terms of finances being pumped into the continent. But what really stood out for me was the, 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 the Can you hear me, Edith? Yeah, it's not us. I thought it was me at first. <laughs> and we need to hear this. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. What she's about to say, we need to hear it. So Noreen, Noreen, I'm going to remove her and bring her back very quickly. Oh, my God. It was so I think good. we need to hear what she's about to say. You know, she said something revolutionary. She said, she's still frozen. She said something so revolutionary. She said, the colonization that we knew of is coming back that's again. What exactly, in a different that's way. what I wanted her to finish. Oh that's my exactly God. the chain of thought I wanted her to finish. Because it's true. It's coming up, coming back again. It's even going to be worse than we ever knew. In yes. Africa. Yes. Because it looks like, it looks friendly. That's the problem. It's, yeah. not, it's not obvious. You know, it's hidden. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay, I think she's back at the back. Let me just bring her back. And then we can wrap up. Yes, I think it dropped off just when I was about to say something that might implicate me. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. It is what I was saying. She knew yeah, what to I knew yeah. what she was about to say. It's very yes. Yeah, so <laughs> so we're going to reword it very tactfully. Um, <laughs> a lot of resources have been pumped into the continent, but this time. Then they're, they're here to stay. Let me put it that way. This time, this, these are not the types of agreements that are going to be broken in 40 years, unless yeah. our leaders are negotiating agreements for the continent that are favorable for the continent. So um, in, in response to what Edith was, was asking, I would say this is the opportunity 
Africans in diaspora have to be part of the, not just the solution, but part of the reward for being a part of the solution. If you don't invest now, by the time you go back to whatever country you're going back to, the prices of land are going to be so exorbitant you can't afford it. If you don't invest in agriculture now, you will not be able to be the exporter, you'll be the consumer. If you're not part of the solution in developing uh, programs for young people, you're going to sit and your child is going to be the recipient of those things that are being developed without your input. So. I challenge every young person or old person in diaspora, whichever country you can focus on one at a time and say, I will be, um, and, and actually there's a program that uh, just runs called Kingdom Influences. I will be the influencer in this industry, in my country. I will be the one that the government of my country has got to call for my sector. I will be the educator that when they're developing the curriculum, they say, come and sit and tell us what we must do. I will be the, uh, the, 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 the economist who will be called to develop the solution or the roadmap for this country for the next 10 years. We cannot sit and be the spectators anymore as diasporans. We can't sit and do that and then be part of conferences where we talk about the problem. We have got to be at those conferences saying, I'm in the trenches, meet me in the trenches. I don't wanna talk about the problem. I am developing a solution, meet me in the solution. Here's my solution, buy my solution. So that's what I'd say to diaspora. I say it all the time and I'd echo it again. Do not be part of the spectators and sit on the sidelines and hope that Africa is going to be different without you. So good. I think that's a fantastic way to wrap up today's conversation with Noreen. I love how she said it. If you're not a part of the solution building process, your children are going to be beneficiaries of what you had no input. And at that time, you will have to take it whether you like it or not. Sad, but very true. Very, very true. So every single one of us in whatever capacity you're able to get busy, get involved, to get into the trench, let us start building for Africa, by Africa, not just with a view to stay in Africa, but to export our commodities, our products, our transformation, our knowledge, our culture, our art mm. to the rest of the world. This time, as admirable products and services or aspirational, that's the word, as aspirational products and services that the world will now want to truly, now you start using as benchmarks. For the longest time, we have looked at the world as benchmarks for everything. I think we should begin to change that narrative. And I see that um, you guys in the media and art space are beginning to truly do a good work, trying to tra transform Africa as the benchmark of all manner of things in pop culture. And that's one good aspect. Every single one of us now, whether in academia, in politics, in education, in every arena of influence, should begin to get busy or get involved in this change-making process. Yesterday, I said something I want to say again today. It may look like your, your droplets of water it's not making any difference in the large ocean. Don't be deceived, it's not true. It may take 50 years, it may take 100 years, but as long as you're daily moving in the right direction with a conviction as to what you see, one day it's going to make a difference. Guess what, people are watching. There's a greater constituency of people who are watching you that will never speak with you until the time is right to speak to you. To you. So you keep building, keep making improvements, keep innovating, keep transforming lives, Africa needs it. Edith, you want to share something before we bring in our next speaker? No, for me, I, I want to, again, encourage diaspora. I hope they don't feel cornered by us. But to encourage diaspora that we need to be the change that we seek. I encourage young people to study abroad. I studied abroad. Please go, get the knowledge, get the best. But when you do, bring it back to the continent. There's a push to, to believe that the West is where it is at, you know, where it's hot, where you'll get the most money, where yeah. there are the most opportunities, but we have been lied to. So let me, you know, undo that lie. There are opportunities and there is space for you on the continent. So don't shortchange, right? Don't sell your 
don't sell your inheritance for a bowl of soup. You know, I'm going to be a little bit biblical. Don't sell your inheritance for a bowl of soup in the name of bread for today. I think you need, I am completely fine with you refining yourself, maybe even doing a little bit of work to figure out how to better the continent and what to implement in the continent. But once you know what it is, and you have felt it in your heart, and you and you feel the nudge or the push to come back, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. You have a responsibility. Because if you ignore it and you complain like the rest of us, I, I feel like your complaints are a little bit hypocritical. So yeah. at, least, at least be at the location when you're complaining. At least. Or here's the other thing. You can invest. If you don't want to come back yourself, it's fine but support a local business that is implementing the solution that you feel called to or tied to or associated yes. with. Um, yes. Don't let that business struggle to go and look for funding from the white people. If you have whatever extra coins you have, oh yes, bring it home. Sharon is already saying it in the comments. Yes. So come back, bring it home. Even if you can't be here physically, there are ways that you can support. Really, there are ways. And there are ways Absolutely. that you can build business from where you are. You don't have to be physically here to build business here. You don't yeah. have to be physically here to solve problems here. You just need to be intentional. So diaspora, I'm challenging you to be intentional about the problem that might not be yours directly because you're living somewhere else. But there's family that you have. And who do you expect to take care of your family or your friends? It's your responsibility. That's all I'll say for that. Thank you and so thank you to Noreen for this. You know, because I feel like mind was blowing the entire yeah. time. The entire yeah. time. Thank you so much, Edith. Thank you so much, Noreen. I like the final part. I, th I think we have some young people here who have probably been burdened about what they could contribute to Africa. And I see that this will ignite some level of passion in them to start thinking, how do I be involved and get involved in solutions? I know this is not a, this is not a conversation to talk about purpose and all of that, but those are great places to also start because it's important to be working in a direction where you are, you feel like you're called to and you're passionate about, very important so that you don't burn out because the African climb is, um, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's, uh, it's peculiar, right? That's fine. Absolutely. Thank you, Jadel. Don't feel bad. Learn. Come back home where need be. Fantastic. So these are burdens in the hearts of people. They don't even recognize why the burdens are there. It's because there's something in them that belongs to Africa. But that's fine, Jadel. Take your time. Study. Get all the knowledge you can. Research where, where you can. Begin to understand the African climate where you can so that where need be, you can start creating solutions for the African continent. Thank you, everyone. This has been a fantastic one. Noreen, God bless you. We are going to quickly bring on our next speaker as we prepare to round up today's conversation. We're going to be bringing Mr. Enoch Tumwine. He is the founder and president of African Rebirth. He is a MasterCard Foundation alumni. He graduated from the University of Toronto, Canada where he studied political science and African studies and completed an exchange semester at the University of Oslo in Norway, where he specialized in international security policy, nuclear weapons revolution, and North and South development relations. Enoch Tumwine is also the founder and president of the African Rebirth, an organization that operates across Africa, whose mission is to define mediocrity, inspire and empower young African leaders to embrace peace, unity, and prosperity. He has extensive leadership experience as a delegate at the United Nations in the United States and is an ambassador of other international organizations like the Institute of Peace and Economics and a participant in peace building and human rights forums spanning from Africa, the United States of America, Canada, and across Europe. He recently worked at the, worked at the World YWCA as a global engagement and strategic communication specialist in Geneva, Switzerland. Would they, with a standing or with a rousing clapping ovation, please let us welcome Mr. Enoch Tumwine to today's conversation. Hi, Enoch. Thank it you. is great to have you here today. Absolutely. My pleasure, eBay. I'm glad that I'm here and uh, enjoying a journey well, 
in listening to a wonderful conversation about diaspora. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank so you. Please, where are you uh, from originally? Okay. Your Africa roots. Where where are you from? Of course I am from Burundi. Yeah. East Africa. Oh wow. You know I thought I thought Eritrea or Ethiopia. I don't know why. <laughs> you came, you came, you came with that, you know? That, yeah. that that vibe when you landed. That's how I felt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Enoch, we'll let you take us away very quickly as you give us your own thoughts on today's conversation. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the topic is revolution itself, uh, the role of young people. And um, it's quite interesting that uh, people say young people, but they are not really young. Uh, there's, uh, if you're 18 and above uh, or 17 and above, you're not really young. I usually say you're not really young to bite, you know, uh, revolutionally. So I think um, when you say people young, I think they, some mentalities is like, okay, I'm still a baby. Uh, I can be looked at, but you're not really young in the natural sense. And so, uh, because you are not young, you are not young to contribute or to change your life dramatically to a higher purpose. You're not young to dream. You're not young to uh, invest, like my sister was saying in the show. You're not young to cause change. You're not young to, you know, to hype the height of uh, real development. And that's how they, uh, the African uh, young people should be approached. And mm -hmm. so the conversations of being young, yeah, you might be young, but you're really old. Uh, people should be told that. Um, as when you say, when you go to this international organization and they say a 30 year old man and say you're still a young person, you're not young, you are old enough to cause change. Um, People in history, uh, right? For those who are Christians, Jesus was thirty-three. He changed. He changed the masses. You know, uh, most people have changed. Uh, you know, have changed the course of history in their young age. So, so the the concept of young, I think, need to be defined and be needed told. When so people say young people, you need to be specific and talk and remind people, hey, you are not young anymore. You're not young anymore. So that will be my introductory comments. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Because at the end of the day, I think yeah. um, something that young people, okay, not young, <laughs> something that age 18 to 35 tend to yeah. forget, and the rest of the world as well, yes. is that wisdom knows no age. You know? Um, it can come to any human being um, yeah. and experiences can teach at different levels. So I yeah. think also the concept of I am too young might not be something that young people pick for themselves. It's instilled, you know, it's taught. Yes, yeah, um, taught. And, and it's the, integrated and it's very in And then so like, oh, I'm still young, you know, I'm still young still young to participate in politics, still young to do business, still young to be uh, in, you know, mm -hmm. international platforms, you know, young anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so what's the, then how do they take advantage of the element of being called youth, mm -hmm. but then still not being young? You know what I mean? So, yes, yes. Yeah. How do they take advantage of that? So I categorize, uh, that's a very good question. I categorize African problem to three problems uh, or challenges. I don't want, like to call them uh, problems. One, Africa is facing an ideological shift. So I call it an uh, ideological orientation. And I will expand more on that. Second is economic prosperity. Africa is in desperate need for economic prosperity. Third, Africa is in a desperate need for strategic security. And I'll expand more on that. How do Africans, or the people called the young Africans, harness those three problems? 
and all those three problems there are a mess a mess opportunities involved when i talk about ideological orientations uh, when you look at the concept of africa right from the colonial period to this date uh, there is a lot of ideological shift so that those who look themselves as more english that those who look uh, identify them as that's why they call them francophony africa uh, french speaking africa portuguese speaking africa so people don't know who they are and if you don't know who you are uh, because it's it's your culture it's uh, it's your a concept it's your background it is uh, your, your visions that defines your identity so there is a mass uh, there is a, a, a massive identity crisis in young people but also across the board of africa identity crisis so how do you um, restrain uh, overcome identity crisis and that's why identity crisis cuts across it's in politics it's in social services it's in every sector business that's why we want to hold elections like uh, democratic west and also other african countries brag that they have term limits they have no uh, clue why that things are there uh second uh you, you find young people also to have the western standards that because has been defined as the epitome of success as epitome. so in the end in between there you are lost so you are either not too western and too african so you're in between so africans need to define that and that's why when i say the ideological uh, orientation that's why tribes fight uh, like in cameroon right now um uh, they, they some are fighting to be because it's a french uh, country uh, colonized by france some are fighting to be english so they say crash they don't know what connects them it's not the english language it's the identity it's their culture it's their history so africans need to overcome that so the young people need also to do that to define who i am what is my background what is my identity understand the global context of ideas power structure that that, that forms the world that's number one so young people need to harness that and the the beauty is they're still young they have not maybe crossed lines so there is an opportunity and there is no best time to be young like in this 21st century is i think for me it's the best time because it's a, it's a, it's a time of information you i think that he's i can't hear him i was struggling to hear him enoch i can't hear you I can't hear you, Enoch. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me, Enoch? Okay, let me remove myself again.
I still can't hear him. Can you hear him? I can't. I can't hear him. Yeah. So you know, can we need to um, let's remove you so we can add you again? He might need to leave first and then come back. The back end, right? Hmm. Maybe something happened to his sound. Okay. Okay, you need to unmute. Okay, try now. Let's see if we can hear you. No. He might need to come out completely and then. Click okay. The link again. Okay. Can you leave the studio? Leave the studio and then come back. Let me send him a message on his. Um... Leave the studio completely. Let me remove him because then he, I think he'll get it. Join again. I've removed him. Okay. So you okay. can now try to join again. <clears throat> but he was sharing a lot of great wisdom. And then I love the comment from Nicole Busari where she was saying, Bring the knowledge back home. Joseph, generation, rise up and be the solution makers of your generation. I love that. I love that. Because this is really the time for young people to understand. In Swahili, there's a saying that a lot of um, East Africans use, especially Kenyans. They say, Serikali's idea, meaning government help us. But then the question becomes, how can government help you if you're not helping yourself? Oh, there we are. So, uh, yes. you can hear me? Yes. Go ahead. So, okay. Uh, sorry about that. I thought you you're hearing me. But you guys, yeah. I got, I lost you, all of you. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, well, I was on a point of, uh, you know, ideological orientation. Shaping ideologies. Even the people who call themselves old or younger, there's an identity crisis. Uh, and that's why we always look outside for solutions, because we don't know our individual capacities, uh, our intelligence, our, um, you know, our uh, bigger perspective on who we are and what we can do and what we can, we can accomplish. So that's a, that's a big a big uh, problem. So second is what I call economic prosperity. Economic prosperity. How do I? Uh, how uh, Africa? How do we? You know, structure um, momentum for economic growth. That's a very key. And how do we? Um, how do we move from the independent state? Or a continent to more um, actually generating prosperity for ourselves. So, how people can participate in economic uh, prosperity? One, the young people have the energy, and I said there is no better place, there is no better time like to be a young person in this 21st century because there's a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of connectivity. Um, I can come to Nigeria. I, I know the information from Nigeria easily. You can connect to other parts of the world easily. So there's a lot of opportunity involved and how we can do that. Um, are you guys, do you guys hear me or something? Okay. Yeah. So that, that's number one. So young people need to understand the ideological capacity of wealth creation and be the core force um, of, uh, of, of economic prosperity. But also, uh, economic prosperity is a collaborative force. Is now how do we support uh, the young people who may have uh, access, lack of access to funding and access to you know, finance? That's when the stakeholders come in, the governments come in, private sectors come in to harness that. It's the role of young people to identify the the so the role of young people to identify those opportunities, like economic prosperity, investments, and most importantly, 
entrepreneurship and ha a harnessing entrepreneurship is a big deal uh, across Africa. Right now, uh, young people in Africa make the biggest percentage. So it's a song, everyone knows that. It's a common knowledge. Uh, so how do we exploit that um, energy, that connectivity, that uh, uh, that uh, you know vibrant system of people to help in uh, form uh, strong businesses across Africa? And the opportunities right now uh, there is the African Free Continental Trade Treaty, so you can easily. Uh, uh, so the young people need to know that there are some opportunities in place to do that. Second, my third point is, which is very big, is strategic security. How young people can navigate strategic security. What is strategic security, first of all? This human security and state. Uh, and state. When you all see these conflicts, when you all see this, it's young people who take part. It's, it's not old people who take part in these violent conflicts that affect our communities. And uh, when you look at Al Shabaab, uh, uh, Boko Haram, th those are young people getting involved. The Sahel, the jihadists, um, the the conflict in Mozambique. These are young people who take part. So, and again, it comes to my first point: How do we, uh, you know, scan through things of life in this dear uh, competitive age? of information and global affairs. So it's very, very important that we harness that. Uh, strategic security can be achieved when there is when the young people are educated, but what is security, you know? If you're told, okay, pick up arms, go fight a government, why should I fight a government? Scan through interests, you know? And then uh, they need to be told the, the African governments or African private sector, civil society, needs to come around and uh, harness people in peace building. And uh, yeah, something like that uh, can really help young people more. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ina. Thank you so much for sharing the data that you have shared. One of the things I want you to be able to share with us is how you have taken the expertise, the experience, the knowledge you have acquired in your years in the diaspora, have you been able to incorporate it into Africa? So I see you do a lot of groundwork within Africa, both strategic collaborations and even direct implementation. How have you been able to easily move what you do or you have acquired in the diaspora into the African market? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so it's the other part where you understand uh, that uh, Africa, those three uh, categories I've identified, ideological orientation is a big deal, like mindset shift. Uh, how do you orient people for economic growth and economic prosperity? And also, how do you maintain a future strategic security? And that's why we come in as African rebirth, uh, where we train young people in four areas. That's diplomacy. Uh, that's entrepreneurship and leadership and uh, peace building. So identifying all those uh, key sectors because we believe that the young people need to be uh, oriented um, uh, because a few people understand the global systems of power, how power is shaped, how power is uh, distributed and who initiates those power structures and systems. And for anyone who initiates them, they have an agenda. And agenda is interest. They want to achieve their strategic interest in the global affairs. But how do you train young people to understand that when people say democracy, for example, uh, is not really democracy, it's a soft power to, to harness an agenda. People will say, I will go on the street and riot and show my government that I'm dissatisfied, and something like that. It's just a show. It's like organizing a music show and that. So they, they need to understand why is, why is government, first of all, why do states exist? And how do you uh, project a bigger picture on international scale and scan through, through, through international affairs? and really scan uh, 
the intention or the the objectives of all those global forces. So that's number one. Maybe now young people should understand that that we live in a competitive uh, geopolitical world where there is competition for power, competition for resources, competition for everything. The world is competitive, and so. Uh, being in the middle is what have killed most of our young people or they think they take in taking things so i felt um, i felt uh, a conviction we need to enlighten our young people all this stuff uh, you know and also the about the point about leadership uh, people always when you are in uh, an african room or conferences people scratch rap uh, cast the leaders, the African leaders, it's a mentality like, oh, our African leaders, they have betrayed us. They have done this, this and this and this, this, this and this. But people forget it's just a work ethic that uh, sets you apart. But also when you look, those who criticize the African leaders, we the young people who criticize the African leaders, when you look at our work ethic, it's not different with those African leaders they criticize. So there is a mismatch in, in ideology and action. And, and so I say it's just a matter of time uh, that because we don't have that position yet, but when the capacity is the same, the ideological capacity and shift is the same. So what's the solution then? Is to build leadership bottom up because it's a question of society. It's not a question of who is on top. It's a question of society. When society is oriented for self-reliance, prosperity, and seeing things beyond the small, small tribes, the small ships, and look at the bigger picture of prosperity, maximization of interest. One of the things I have seen uh, with the young people, almost like um, an African group, people have not even governed. They have not defined their interests. Interests. What is the, my interest as a person? What is my interest as a country? We are washed by interests of other people. We're just lost in between that. So once people define their interests, I always ask this question. Um, people are so divisive with their ethnic tribes and everything. If you think your ethnic tribe is so important, when you, when you start a business, do you sell to their when people want will come to ask uh, to buy at your shop, uh, do you do you say, oh no no, this is my tribe. I will sell to your tribe. You know, so those are the interests I mean. Looking beyond, um, you know, everyday small small things and having a bigger projection for the future. Yeah. Hey, eBay. I love it. I absolutely love it. This is fantastic. I think now my other question for you would be, when we talk about youth development, um, whose responsibility is it, right? Or what would you like to see in the youth development space on the continent? Right, very good. So like an African saying that it takes a, vill a village to raise a child. This is not like only the work of the young people or government or private sector. It's defined, it's a collaboration. It's um, a, a lot of working hard. It's, it's, it's a teamwork. Uh, but like I said, if you want to succeed, uh, or if you want to step up, if you want to go higher, you always show fast, you know. So who is more beneficiary in, in this? Well, some people may wait on their governments, but their governments, who they also have their small interests to take care of. Uh, they, you have to show up as a young person. You need to step up. You need to aggressively look for opportunities. You need to speak up if you can. You need to define your interest as a young person. For example, as a person, let's not even go on the continent or general. As a person, as eBay, as uh, Edith, right? What do you want in life as a person? One, or I, I don't care whether you come from or your background or, or what, whatever. One, you need 
freedom. Freedom, economic freedom, financial freedom, uh, society freedom. You need, and I call that prosperity. Second, you need a better standards of living. So uh, an average person in Lagos doesn't, wouldn't care about who is the president. They care about if they have access to electricity. They care about if there is a rising prices of commodities. They will care about uh, if there is war in their region where they come from. That's all they care. So they need prosperity, assurance, and that's security. Uh, so you need prosperity, you need security. Third, you need uh, a world where you you can wake up and pursue your dreams, uh, you know, go to work, uh, pursue your dreams, uh, make businesses. That's all what you need as a person. Those are your interests. So where do we, where do people go wrong? Or where, where has Africa gone wrong? Is to take, is, the people have not defined their interests because a guy in the government who is maybe corrupt thinks taking all the money is securing his interest, but is creating insecurity in the future, is creating insecurity of jobs, is creating insecurity of a lot of opportunities missed. So getting all those interests, if people define as a human, define interest, then there will be less problems because I'll pursue my interest. My interest is prosperity. So I will look for better ways to prosper. And if you want to prosper, it doesn't mean you only sell to Nigeria or you only uh, look for opportunities in Cameroon. You go beyond. You And it, it even will go beyond your colors. Whoever supports your prosperity, you embrace. So that's where an African needs. And this is where young people should really define their interest. And then we go a little bit higher at the state level all those interests. You need a security. You need a secure country. It, that's what I call strategic security. And strategic security must combine all those efforts. Uh, prosperity. Your people are sure of prosperity. Your people are sure of jobs. Your people are sure of employment. Your people are sure of, uh, you know, they can wake up and go to work easily. And then, once you're secure as a state or as a country, also on the continent, you need to define your common enemy. Africa has never defined a common enemy. Who's your enemy? Because as you have interest, there are people who don't want to, uh, to succeed those interests. There are people who benefit in your disorganization, in your weakness, uh, who uh, would exploit that. You need to define your common enemy. Who is your common enemy? How do you tackle this common enemy? So once you define the interest, then you define a common enemy. And you can see, because when I say that, you say, oh, what do you mean common enemy? Are you creating an enemy here? No. Uh, you can see the world, how it is structured, the global structure of power and systems. Uh, you see like NATO. NATO defined Russia as a common adversary for centuries, period. So the, all the Western belt, they will rally around, you know, confronting Russia. Uh, they will rally behind at the global affairs. And you all see the efforts they work together in global affairs. So they are defined their common enemy. So Africa has not defined their common enemy. And that's why we in different, because um, Nigeria maybe thinks the common enemy is uh, Benin, or Benin thinks the common enemy is Congo or Congo. No. And that's why you see this small, small tribal influence because they think they're the common enemy. But they need to define their common enemy. Yeah. Love this perspective. I love, love, love this perspective. As Africans, we need to define our common enemy so that we can stand in unity and fight against yeah. whatever that common enemy represents, whether it's insecurity, whether it's economic. Um, 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 prosperity, whether it's youth development, whatever, whatever it is, we need to identify. And even if they are entities like nations or like yeah. institutions, we need to agree that this is who or what our common enemy is. I yeah. see that it is from what Enoch just shared, this is perhaps one of the reasons why we've not been able to unite as a nation. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Because I think so many times we're busy fighting each other that we forget to unite. So assuming even something like, we know that there's a debt crisis with China. And you have certain countries fighting that debt crisis. But a lot of Africa is all under that Chinese the same category, yeah. The same category, but to fight that, they fight as individuals without realizing that we are more powerful together than we are separated. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Thank you that. so much, Dana. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. We will definitely take these conversations further. Because the idea of uh, engagement between yesterday and today is to bring perspective from different areas, identify the solutions that may have been postulated here, and see how we can take these conversations further. So thank you so much, Enoch, and well done on the good work you do at African Rebirth. We look thank forward to greater much. conversations, greater partnerships as you continue to advance the African agenda at every level where you find yourself. God bless you and have a fantastic day. Thank you. Have a very good day. Thank you all. Thank awesome. you. Okay, guys, we're going to be bringing our final, I think, final speaker today. Um, she is going to be speaking on policy. Say that again. It's the final one for today. I'm even shocked. <laughs> policy recommendations on education and youth development. I'm going to quickly read her bio, and then we'll bring her upstairs. Oh, upstage. She's a phenomenal friend, sister, and we really went through identity crisis here. Oh, wow. There's something going on wherever Jadel is. Wherever Jadel is, there's something going on there because I see that was a trend in the comment section with a lot of people who were in the category where he's coming from, right? But I'll address that later. Debola Dejikurumi is a best-selling author, keynote speaker, ministry gift, public policy advisor, and transformational coach for visionary leaders. Through her work or coach, of coaching, consulting, and capacity building, Debola, Debola deploys her extraordinary gift of unlocking potential in people, institutions, and nations. She is the founder of Immerse Coaching Company, a professional coaching practice, executive director at Edition Hub Africa, a public policy and impact advisory firm. She's the president at Kingdom Leaders Global Alliance, a non-denominational Christian ministry. She's a certified visionary leadership coach by the Oleg Kono Nalov Global Coaching Certification, and a Gallup, in, Gallup Certified Strengths Coach. She is also a Thomas International Certified Workplace Personality Profile Analyst, Certified Job Evaluation Analyst, and Experienced Corporate Trainer. Debola Deji Kurume was learning consultant at Philips Consulting and has been on the faculty of organizations, including the Labor State Government, World Bank, Wando Foundation, Faith Foundation, Leap Africa, VFD Bridge, Olanu Ajayi LP, amongst others. Debola sits on the board of a number of organizations, including Sickle Cell Advocacy and Management Initiative and the Mindset Transformation and Aid Organization, where she provides strategic advisory on organizational design. Organizational design, pardon me, guys, senior leadership development, policy analysis and implementation, as well as program execution. And that's all about her in paper. I'm going to speak about her in person. She's my sister, she's my friend, she's my mentor, she's so many things to me. And I am delighted. You, you know, it is before I shared Accept Vision with you, I had shared with her. The minute I shared with her, she was like, we will do it. You know, with a certain conviction in her face, we will do it. And when I look at her face, I'm like, we will do it. She's like, yeah, we'll do it. And today, by the grace of God, this event is a success. We're bringing her up stage. With a rousing clap ovation, if you are in the session and comment session, please do well to welcome on stage Debola Dejikurumi. Hello, it is so good to have you here. 100% excited to be here and phenomenal work going on at the African Government Stakeholders Engagement Forum 2022. Well done. And well done, Edith. Excellent uh, moderation work. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we bless God. And it's amazing to have you here. And it's going to be mind-blowing. And the perfect cake we all need to wrap this up. 
Excellent. <laughs> so DDK, um, we have done so many, we've had so many conversations around education, youth development, some policy formulations or postulations as the case may be. We want you to bring your perspective to the table as we tie up the two day conversation. Because at the end of this conversation, what we hope to achieve is a white paper based on both academic and real time research, then the feedback of the speakers to create a document that would serve as a blueprint for all of the African nations to be able to solve education and youth development um, problems within the continent. So we would like for you to tie it up with your perspective on what sort of policies should we put in place to strengthen the solutions we would create, whether today, tomorrow, or whenever, as far as education and youth development is concerned. Okay, thank you so much for having me. And 100% uh, AGSEF is an extremely important uh, you know, and valuable contribution to the work that needs to get done on the African continent. What I also find inspiring about the forum is it is uh, obviously based on the paradigm that active citizens and um, intermediary institutions have to emerge on the scene and begin to close those uh, gaps that have been created by inefficient systems, inefficient markets, and inefficient governance across the African continent. That is how we're going to get ultimately to where we're headed. It's how we're going to experience uh, social reformation. It's how we're going to experience our goals for nation building and the emergence of a continent that we will all be proud of. So for everyone who is on this call and everyone who is going to have access to the replays, it's important for you to really begin to explore a more active role. There's such a thing as the office of the citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the office of the citizen of your country across the continent, and it's a powerful office. In the course of this decade, a lot of the most significant transformations that we'll experience across economies, industries, uh, sectors, and even religion and uh, culture will be birthed by these active citizens whether as individuals or institutions, standing alone, or more importantly, standing in collaborations, creating uh, exponential results. So latching on to the ongoing conversation, I will just be uh, sharing a few thoughts, um, both drawn from the field of uh, consulting for African governments, uh, personal expectations for what is possible toward the full utility of Africa's potential in the course of the next uh, seven to 10 years, as well as just my role as an active citizen of my own country, Nigeria. The first uh, highlight I would love to bring at this point, which is likely to already have been shared severally in the course of uh, today's, uh, the two-day forum, is, is the fact that, as we already know, the future of Africa is really in the hands of its youths. Now, Africa has uh, likely one of the most agile and viral population of young people of all continents in the world. Today, we have maybe over 450 million young people who represent about one third of the entire African population. And so if Africa is going to merge into the fullness of that uh, future that we desire for her across economic recovery, um, climate reclamation, agriculture, empowerment, uh, tech utility, you know, educational mastery, all of the arenas and pillars of, of key uh, growth and development that we want to see, we definitely need to have our eyes on our young people. And you already know, obviously, that there is an African youth charter that is being uh, mobilized and managed up until 2063 by the African Union, which is representative of the thoughts that we definitely need to make those big investments um, in the young people if we're going to see the future of Africa. So the African Youth Charter is a, a bold proclamation and a declaration of intent to focus on building the African young person along the lines of education and skill development, youth, and, uh, youth employment and entrepreneurship, governance, peace and, and security, youth health and sexual reproductive um, rights, agricultural climate change and environment. And these are key pillars within the African Youth Charter, running on um, as a bold proclamation and declaration of intent to focus on the young African person. And to hear us uh, really explore education and youth development 
as well as the policy considerations that we want to make at this forum is definitely um, uh, an action in the right direction. So let me jump on to some of the recommendations uh, on my mind about how we can foster education and youth development for the African young person. Number one, we have to undress, unbundle, and rethink education itself. Uh, I think one of the most limiting factors as far as education is concerned for Africa as a developing continent in comparison uh, to other developed economies, um, especially you know, in the West and you know, from a sense of a more global context, one of the most limiting factors is our approach, our thinking, our methodology as far as education is concerned. Africa likely has uh, a very restrictive thinking and a very restrictive approach to education and how it is deployed as a tool for mental liberty, emancipation, and development for the young person. So my first core uh, policy consideration uh, in this forum would be our rethinking of education. We have to uh, open up to a more expansive context as far as education is concerned. We have to begin to explore education through entertainment. We definitely have to become tech enabled and uh, significantly digitalized in the delivery of education so that it's accessible on wide scale and the resources required to deliver education since it's not on site is uh, definitely way reduced. So we have to explore alternative education that is tech enabled, that is driven digitally, that relies on communities and that approaches education in a non-traditional, non-certificated way. Uh, new approaches and alternative thinking to education has to focus on the acquisition of skills, competencies, expertise, and experience that closes the gap between um, where a person is and where they want to get to. So it has to be visionary in its approach. It has to be goal-oriented in its approach. And very importantly, it has to match the present market needs of a deconstructed world order. The world that we live in or the world that we were born into actually no longer exists. And so alternative thinking to education must upskill and um, um, expand the expertise of the African young person to be able to solve real-time problems in inefficient markets, whether particularly within the continent and even become globally competitive to uh, leverage and export their skill sets in other parts of the world. And we already see this radically happening with coding and tech skills and how they've become the bride of the West. So people who don't even have a university degree but are able to get into uh, the product development and coding, engineering, uh, tech-based expertise arena, uh, ramping up skill sets in a really short time compared to traditional education and are able to deliver real-time value to needs that exist uh, within markets in a uh, deconstructed world order. So we have to rethink our approach to education and every board from primary, secondary, university level, colleges of education, uh, technical colleges, and every kind of educational institute, especially that are licensed, funded, and backed by local, state, and federal governments have to really rethink um, the entire framework, the policy, the reward system, and the deployment of their educational frameworks. And I hope that uh, that is of value uh, to the conversation today. So 100%, we want to see a rethinking uh, of the approach that we take as far as education is concerned, shifting into alternative frames uh, and alternative models for education. Secondly, uh, for the transformation we're seeking to see, with youth development in particular, we want to explore collectives and coalitions. The kind of results that have been created in Rwanda, uh, to a degree in Kenya, in South Africa, and the transitions um, out of uh, Afro-pessimism into Afro-optimism is very connected to coalitions and collectives. I believe indeed that Nigeria has this going for her, 
but we require a more systemic and organized approach. What we experienced with the NSAS movement, for example, which was a, a social revolutionary tool to engage the government, present our own agitations, and push for reforms for good governance and, um, and policing is quite connected to how young people were mobilized into coalitions and collectives. So a key policy recommendation for education and youth development on the African continent will be the need to leverage coalitions and collectives. If we can uh, lean into existing ecosystems, whatever their purpose, wherever we find young people of similar interests, similar values, and who are, are coming together in large numbers, we want to begin to deliver our developmental outcomes, uh, whether through the government or through um, civil society organizations or through religious associations, you see, or even through um, other types of interest groups. We want to leverage uh, coalitions, collectives, and ecosystems to achieve that. So it's going to be, become important for the government, for government agencies, for leaders across all tiers of society to begin to seek access and influence with founders of ecosystems, gatekeepers of communities, and leaders of coalition. That is how we're going to ramp up impact very quickly. It's how we're going to get a large amount of young people mobilized in a particular direction. So whether you want to use these coalitions for national reorientation, which is really important, skill acquisition, uh, educational pursuits, you want to use it for uh, political mobilization or resource mobilization, we have to stop working in silos. We have to find youths where they are. I'm going to give you an example. One of our um, amazing social innovators at Ideation Hub Africa. He was part of an incubation program and he went on to um, establish a, a movement that was focused on empowering the boy gender as well as uh, making the boy and the male gender vanguards of protection against gender-based violence. And one of the strategies that he deployed was to take the message and the curriculum of men and boys as crusaders against gender-based violence. He took that message, the curriculum and the entire framework to NURTW. This in Nigeria is known as a very powerful um, mechanism with his own political structure of transport workers who have a strong coalition across regions and across uh, communities in Nigeria. So he took this powerful men as crusaders against gender-based violence message and he layered on the NURT collective, NURTW coalition, and it, it ramped up the type of impact that they were able to accomplish in a short time. So if we are really going to see the changes that we want to deliver uh, as far as youth development is concerned, we want to explore leveraging ecosystems, coalitions, and collectives. Now, something I should have said from the beginning that is really important is that the African Youth Charter, which is still carrying on its um, decade of the young person plan up until the end of this decade, continuing on to 2063, actually has within that charter the requirement for every African country um, to have a youth policy, a comprehensive youth policy. As at today, there are only about 35 African countries that have a comprehensive, uh, that have a youth policy. Of the 35, there are only about 18 that have a comprehensive ratified youth policy. And so the beginning of this conversation is to be able to agitate in the direction of a fully ratified comprehensive, all-encompassing, multi-dimensional youth policy. Nigeria, for example, which is my home country, has a youth policy that is not comprehensive, but is, as, uh, so is elaborate to a degree, but is missing out on an exhaustive, multi-dimensional approach to the key youth development issues that we're confronted with. 
So it's important that we recognize that part of our policy agitations, depending on what African country you represent, will even begin with recognizing if, ex if it is existing in your own country, uh, the presence of a comprehensive youth policy uh, based on the specific criteria and recommendations uh, from the African Union on the African Youth Charter. A third big uh, uh, key uh, policy recommendation that I have uh, as far as this conversation is concerned is the need for employment and employability inroads. Uh, on the Human Capital Index of the World Economic Forum year on year from 2019 up until its publishing of 2021 report consistently places a lot of African countries at the lowest rung of the scoring system of the Human Capital Index. Now, this is not because Africans are not smart or talented. Africans are actually some of the most talented, creative, visionary people in the world. So it's not about uh, talent, it's not about genius, it's not about expertise, it's not, maybe it's about expertise, it's not about creativity, it's a lot about the way our countries, the way African countries organize employment and employability infrastructure that allow young people to um, acquire market-based expertise be positioned within the formal work sector, create value and earn a reward for their value, as well as stay employable. So if we are going to make great progress with youth development, with education, we have to fix the infrastructures that drive employment and employability. So 100%, um, it's still a lot of conversations around economic development, economic recovery, uh, creating enabling environments and leaning into the future of work. So we have to rethink how we support small businesses. We have to rethink how we create um, internship opportunities uh, right from university in Nigeria. We actually have an internship fund that sort of seeks to manage the transitions for students from uh, higher institutions of learning into the world of work. But the conversation right here is all around the importance for strengthening um, access to, to the world of work and strengthening access to employment opportunities, except young people are gainfully employed and continue to be employable, meaning that the, the human capital development process has to be on a continuum even after a person has graduated from a high institution of learning and they get into the world of work, there has to be facilitations within the private sector that allow young people to continue to learn, continue, continue to strengthen their skill sets, continue to gain the needed exposure so that they keep being of value in the world of work. So employability and employment infrastructures are going to be critical because if there is no uh, sufficient economic activity through which a young person can convert their expertise, convert their talent, earn and be rewarded for the value that they create, young people are going to be derailed into social vices and they can easily continue to be mercenaries for political damage uh, by those who do not have the best interest of an African country at heart. Now, a key input I will add as I start to close out uh, my time here is a bit more focus on institutions. Even as we rethink uh, educational institutions from the primary level up to the highest in institutions of learning, and we start to become more tech enabled, more digitized, more, more market focused, and more non-traditional and non-certificated in our approach, we have to make key investments along the lines of curriculum reforms. A lot of African secondary schools, African universities, African nursing schools, African technology, uh, te technical colleges, colleges of education, catering and hospitality institutes do not currently have the type of curriculum that will graduate a young African person and make them globally competitive if they traveled out of the, uh, the countries and they moved to other parts of the world to seek 
and, uh, and uh, participate in meaningful economic activity. So we have to move in the direction of curriculum reforms for educational institutions in Africa. I'm currently on a program uh, leading ultimately to uh, earning a PhD, and it's a partnership between uh, about six American universities and about 12 African universities. And it's a, a program uh, on public policy and research. It's been a most inspiring experience. Of course, the strike has radically impacted the outcomes uh, that were planned for this program. But what I find is the input of developed climbs, and it may not have to be developed climbs, it might just be intra-Afro exchange, leading to Afro-genius. It may be Nigeria saying, we're really good now with tech and we can support Rwanda. And it could be Kenya saying, we're really good with uh, public policy and non-profit leadership and we can support South Africa. And we can make this intra-African exchange on our curriculum uh, development and reforms. We have to explore our bursaries. Government 100% has to expand education budget, has to expand youth development budget. There are always going to be so many young persons who do not have direct access to the resource required to attain the highest levels of educational opportunity to fulfill their life's aspirations. So bursaries have to be expanded, government-led funds and scholarships, as well as non-profit-led funds and scholarships. And I must commend the social sector across the continent because this is where I also provide significant advisory through my consulting firm. I must say that so many African nonprofits, civil society organizations, and social impact businesses have been of great support in providing scholarships, funds, and bursaries uh, for students' uh, educational access. And we have to rethink upgrading our on-site campus facilities. We have to think about linking, like I earlier said, training uh, institutions offerings to match market needs as well as exploring stronger partnerships and this will be my final policy a recommendation if we're going to make um, great progress as far as education and youth development is concerned we need to create stronger nexus between the academia the private sector and the government until we're able to leverage this power trial coming together in the policy creation process, in the program development process, in the implementation process, in the monitoring and evaluation process, we are going to continue to have unrealistic expectations of what the government can achieve. So we must mobilize along the lines of a cross-sectoral collaboration between the academia, the government and the private sector. Academia can provide a lot of advisory consultancy and research-based um, insights to the government. The government can provide the executive infrastructure to develop and deliver the policies and the private sector can partner toward its accomplishments and support in terms of funding, as well as the delivery of those core goals. This will be my strong policy recommendations at this time. Um, and I hope that it has been a valuable contribution to the exciting uh, conversations that have gone on at the forum this year. Thank you very much. Absolutely, KDK. Thank you so much. I'd like to bring on Edie to the something she would like to ask. I feel that this was properly well articulated in a way that our rapporteurs can take it straight to book. <laughs> if you see what I'm saying, we may not even need to adjust or add anything. DDK, thank you so much for your immense contribution. Okay. Like I said, I have seen her do this over the years. So it's great to have your contribution. Edith, is there something you would like to speak to DDK about just as she bows out to our final speaker? Yeah, I think while I was listening to her, I was remembering something that I've realized. If I walk into a bank, a chamber of commerce, even an institution, and it's a business space. So, for example, in the bank, you know, the head of SME credit, chamber of commerce, head of business conversations or partnerships or whatever. Universities, the person who's teaching entrepreneurship. I realized none of these people have ever been entrepreneurs. Yeah. And I think that is part of the problem. 
we have people who are creating infrastructure and are implementing this infrastructure, but they have never walked a mile in those shoes. So they are creating entrepreneurs that are not ready for the market or they are servicing entrepreneurs in ways they should not be serviced. Hmm. The elephant in the room. Yeah. <laughs> you. Elephant in the room. Yes. The elephant in the room. <laughs> the elephant in the room. Okay, let me speak to that just very quickly. <laughs> I know that this is, <laughs> this is where we are at as a people. In the next 10 years, are we sure of a way to get out of it? As far as our institutions are concerned, I'm not sure. But mm -hmm. what we as organized private sector can begin to do is create those platforms. And it is you recognize that this is how we came up with the curriculum for Africa University of Entrepreneurship to build entrepreneurs that will be graduated to become employers of labor, practicality of these experiences. This is how we created that solution. And by the grace of God, we begin to float it mainstream so that even universities within the continent of Africa can begin to see the model and incorporate it in the existing system. The exactly. problem is there's too much bureaucracy in the continent of Africa. They know the right thing to do, but there are people who must benefit from the wrong things. And so instead of us going heads on against the system, you create pseudo systems that will match so them and take over. So good. That's what we do. And, and that's the representation of what the African government stakeholders engagement forum serves to do creating a pseudo system so that after a while people begin to see that this is actually the right way those who we thought were leading us in that direction they have no clue can we follow the right people so and good. guys this will take time institutionalizing anything that is a movement takes time we really as good. africans will grow the skin the resilience to be able to build for the long term for the long term, if it takes me 50 years of my life trying to institutionalize what we have here, God helping me and consistently sending the right men, so be it. So that we show our people that this is how it is done. Even the God that we serve is not a God of quick fixes, right? He establishes foundations, he builds on foundations for replication and legacy building. So as with everything, we have identified that these are the challenges the people who are helping us become who we should become have no idea what it means to walk in the shoes we are supposed to walk in. While we attempt to correct those systems, let's create pseudo systems and attempt okay. to onboard the people who we want to step into these pseudo systems, then teach them to also replicate. Because the mentoring model of transformation is very important. That we identify those we want to pour into. While we're pouring into them, you are teaching them to go replicate the same thing. It's soldiers and body soldiers until we have an army that cannot be stopped. At that point, we compel the government to listen to us because they exactly. now see where a force that can yes. be stopped. Yes. This time around, nobody's instigating them. Nobody's the leader of the movement. It is different so people good. who have cut different paths and are driving different things in different arenas of influence. So that's the strategy I believe that all of us must begin to implement in the different things that we do. And very quickly, DDK, just before you jump out, I feel like you should be here while we address this. While we started earlier, we noticed that there were lots of students from a particular university in the US who were joining us consistently. And they kept sharing contributions and being a part of this conversation. But as the conversation began to progress, I started to notice that they were dropping comments around their environment in the school, not allowing them to express their identity as though they are losing themselves. And they're Africans from what I see in the comment session. And then was somebody like Grace Grace says, I'm, I was slipping into depression because of the pressures until one person introduced the code. And I see that it has gone on consistently in the comment session, attributing the fact that they feel stifled in an environment, even by some African lecturers. Some of them also are here. So this yeah. conversation is not about antagonizing any leader, antagonizing any lecturer. It's about saying, can we reach a common ground? What are the issues? And I'm talking to the, those in this university. I'm not going to call the name of the university because I'm trying to be very professional. I'm also trying to um, be, use wisdom to solve the problems. There may be problems here, lecturers and students. We are available to sit with you and your lecturers, you mean lecturers and students, to identify what the issues are and help you go you know, I mean, help you create solutions that will serve both parties. Because we do not want feedback like our children in those schools saying they're dealing with identity crisis because they're in a system. We do not want that for our African children. It's not something we're willing to entertain and continue to entertain. 
We would like for us to create a reasonable conclusion as to what the issues are and help you move forward. And so to take this conversation forward, my emails, I will drop them in the comment section. I would love for both the students and the lecturers to reach out to me, and then we will create a meeting where we will sit and talk about what the issues are and then create a solution going forward. Absolutely, we have the interest of your university at heart. We also have the interest for our African children at heart. It's important that we create this solution so that all of us can be at, um, I mean, uh, we can be at a level ground, level playing ground. And I almost want to say this is a, it's a plea to, uh, to the, the people who are concerned, both the university the lecturers and the students. I do not want us to move beyond it just being a plea. I want us to resolve it as a plea. Exactly. So do well to please as much as you can. I will drop my email here publicly, my personal email for that matter, so that both lecturers, teachers, whoever it is, would reach me and then we would have this conversation. We are in a progressive state globally. This is a global world that we're living in. Nobody should feel like they are being um, suppressed in any system, specifically when it's African children. We do not want that. So please do well to do, um, reach us as much as we can. I hope we have settled your grievances, those of you who are students and lecturers who are here. We thank you so much for being a part of um, what we have done so far. I'm not even sure why this happened. I believe God wanted this to happen <laughs> because this is the last thing I thought we would ever address in a forum like this, but I'm happy that this opportunity was created for us to be able to address it. So DDK, you want to speak to that, Edith? You want to speak to that so that we can move? Edith. Yeah, I think for me, it's just an awareness of, for, for institutions of higher learning that are looking to actually build the sort of young people that we're talking about. The reality is your lecturers will never be enough. I wish they could be, but they will never be enough. And what you need to figure out is how do you bring the public into learning? Mm. How do you invite SMEs? How do you invite corporates? How do you invite thought leaders into the university? And a lot of times you'll say, oh, it's difficult. We're not able to do it. Da, da, da. Have you asked us? Have you asked? Once you've asked and you've gotten maybe 10 no's, then I will accept it's difficult. But if you're not asking, if you're not seeking out these thought leaders, then it is your responsibility and it is your fault that we now have subpar students joining the job market, unable to service businesses, unable to consult for businesses, unable to build businesses. It is your fault. And if you want to change this narrative, then you need to bring the public into your institution. Okay. So good. So that's really good. That's really good, actually. That's so good. All I want to jump on is the moment she said the caliber of, in my own words, the caliber of students that have to be churned out from the future institutions of learning that would really deliver on the outcomes we're looking for can't just be those who work in one, have to be those who can build businesses and consult for businesses. You know, we've, it's really got to move from churning out talent to work within businesses only. Some have to build corporations. Some have to consult for corporations. So good. Edith is just, she got it going. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, DDK. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> All righty, guys. I think that this has been such a fantastic 20 plus minutes of our time with the lady DDK, the only DDK in the entire world. DDK, from all of us at Accept, we say thank you. God bless you. We honor you for coming here today. Thank Do you. have a fantastic day. So and our dear regards to everyone at Numerous, at Ideation Hub, at K Kingdom Leaders. We say a huge well done to all the great work that you do and continue to do and all the platforms you continue to create for us and many more who will come after us to continue to leverage on. God bless you. And we love you. Thank you, Edith. Have a good day. Bye. All righty, guys, our final speaker. I'm going to bring him on very quickly. I mean, I know you have had our conversations, Mr. Victor Busseli. It's great to have you here today. I would not want you to, I want you to take it straight away. We are past time, but I want you to quickly just take us away with your conversations. Yeah, I give thanks for your leadership. It's been a remarkable conversation. Um, um, and I, I'm so inspired and impressed by your leadership. So I give thanks to you, remarkable um, sisters. Uh, my name is Victor Bosele. 
I'm a husband, father of four. I'm currently in Ghana, West Africa right now on the Cebu traditional land in Central Region. And um, before I begin anything, I always give thanks to my creator and our ancestors and the original stewards of the various lands that we're on. And I want to give thanks to all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on. When I think about youth development and this work and the premise and theme of this panel, I think about the most important institution in the world, which is family. A lot of times when we, when we conceptualize youth development, we conceptualize it from the concept of teenage years and into career, when we should be thinking of from cradle to career. And from cradle to career, there's a continuum, and that continuum is predicated on how that young person starts. Who are, the, who are the wives, the mothers, the husbands, the fathers that are cultivating these children? And how strong is that family institution in building the capacity of these young people? Because remember, most young people today struggle through life identifying their purpose or passion. Or if they identify their purpose or passion, it's by default, not by design, because the world or community told them. Actual potential, purpose, passion, those gifts that you innately have are identified by your family initially and cultivated and invested in. When I think about my four children, I know their gifts, their talents, and me and my wife consistently invest and cultivate those talents. The world will not tell our children what their talents are at 16, 17, 18, or 19. And my children will never need a resume. That is a fact. Because the institution that we're building as a family, my children have the ability to walk in to opportunities as opposed to have to go and out and seek consistently. So we are, our, our young people are strong as the families that send them into the world. That's the first point that's really important to me. If for whatever reason, and remember, not everyone comes from a strong, solid, stable family. For whatever reason, you have to enter the world on your own and have to accomplish I think that part of that work is definitely predicated on your own personal development. Because remember, we can no longer have the luxury to enter markets. We have to create markets. And the way we create markets is through innovation. But innovation a lot of times is not cultivated within the current structures of educational attainment institutions. And this is not to knock the academia. This is not to knock institutions. But there's a difference between education, formal accreditation, and innovation. You can be educated by self-determined leadership on a day-to-day -day basis, reading, studying. Right now, when I was growing up, I did not have the ability to Google or to go on YouTube or study in almost any topic on the planet from a, a phone. So right now, young people have the ability right now to play on TikTok and make videos and facilitate pranks and do nonsense, or you have the ability to build your capacity as a strong African youth out here to solve problems. And remember, part of our potential, our purpose, or our ori, our, 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 our divine path is predicated on solving social issues. Many young people right now, and part of the challenge that we have on the planet is everything is about wealth acquisition. I've made it based off the material items I possess, or, or the resources that I've been able to acquire. Granted, I do not knock anyone that has resources as a husband, as a father, as the leader of an organization, as a business owner for almost two decades. I understand revenue diversification, resource acquisition is important. But the fact remains, we did not come here. The creator, our ancestors did not die through the transatlantic slave trade or, or our family members were not kidnapped through the transatlantic slave trade for us to acquire dollars or pounds or quacha or CB or Nara. That was not the goal when we were sent here. We were sent here with specific gifts and talents to make the world a better place. And if we once we get back to that understanding of why we're endowed with certain gifts and talents and abilities, it's a lot easier for us to enter in to marketplaces because then we'll create those markets. And through creating the markets, we're entering from a place of sovereignty. Because remember, the wealthiest people on the planet are not, they're not companies. They're not multinational corporations. These are families. These are family brands that have subsidiary companies. It's strong families that rule the world, not, not companies, not philanthropic foundations. And those strong families started with just one or two individuals that identified that they were going to focus on their passion, their gifts, and their purpose to solve a problem. And the bigger the problem to solve, they solve, the larger the profit margin, the larger the yield, the larger the impact, the larger the innovation. So, so those are my thoughts in terms of 
the importance of youth development. I believe that when you look at Africa and all its um, nation states, when you look at the African Union and some of the commitments made um, May 25th, 2012, specifically around the African diaspora, um, or what would be called the sixth region, I think it's very important to find ways and means to connect young people from the African diaspora to continental African youth, um, primarily because the, 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 that, that connection creates um, the, the, an opportunity for the sons and daughters of Africa to come together to really get out of some of the challenges that we're facing. And some of the most pervasive challenges, obviously, is climate change, climate action, climate mobilization, climate crisis and carnage. In two days, young people from across Africa are going to have global strikes. It's the climate strike on the 23rd of this year, of, of, of this month, every year. So all those Fridays for Future organizations across Africa that are on the front lines of the climate crisis and trying to impact policy around banning single-use plastic, around ensuring that there's a planet, a livable planet for folks to live on um, three decades from now or a century from now, needs to be supported. Their, need, or their work needs to be validated. Their work needs to be amplified. And I say that because what is the point of getting into the, 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 the goal, the brain drain? I'm going to leave the continent of Africa to get into Yale or Stanford or Harvard and make all this money and come back and save people. Or I'm going to enter markets and dominate because I'm a strong SME if we're not going to be able to live on the planet in a few decades or a century. So the fact remains that there's some pervasive global issues around poverty of women and gender and, um, equity issues, especially in rural communities across Africa. The poverty of African young people in terms of their brilliance and their genius, but the fact that they don't have the same level of equity in terms of access to capital that other young people across the world have access to. When they have innovative ideas, it's 10 times harder for them to get capital than others. We have a climate carnage happening across the world right now that young people are trying to tackle the solutions and can't get the ears of decision makers and major stakeholders and the folks that actually draft and write global policy. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I am optimistic. I believe that Africa is the future. I believe the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And I, and I believe that every global shift or change that's ever happened that has had some meaningful impact has come from the hearts and minds of young people. But we can't forget our elders and intergenerational collaboration. Because what an elder can see sitting down, a young person can't see on their tippy toes. So intergenerational collaboration, engaging our elders and community stalwarts who have been working on some of these pervasive issues, no matter what sector it is. It could be the finance sector. It could be banking. It could be climate finance. It could be agriculture. It could be technology. There are elders within our communities that have been working on these problems for decades. If we don't engage them and build on their work, um, the, 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 we're, we're at a loss as a community. So I give thanks for the opportunity to share, to contribute, and, and, and to be part of this remarkable movement that you two sisters are building. I love it. Thank you so wow. much. Mm. Wow, thank you so much, Mr. Victor Bonselli. I think I love when he said, my children will never need a resume. I love yeah. that. <laughs> I love that. That hit me. And it made me ask myself, wait, will my children ever need to use the resume to validate who they are? <laughs> These are valid questions, but I like that you took all our conversations. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. My, my son. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Son. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you, sis. Okay. I love that you took our conversation back to the family unit, which is truly where everything starts. Yeah. I love that you took our conversation back. And so I want those who are taking note of this for the white paper, I want us to truly highlight this particular area where he said, we need to go back to the family unit. That means every society must create policies that strengthens the role of the family unit, So that we're starting our entire building process from family into the educational system, then onto the graduation. And can you hear me? I feel like- I can hear be, you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Family. Okay, fantastic. <sighs> I, just, I just truly wanted us to take note of that. And then I wanted us to also pay attention to what he said, intergenerational collaboration. Yes. Intergenerational collaboration. Yes. We cannot become progressive and forget where we're coming from. Yes. We cannot become progressive and forget 
where we are coming from. Because if we do, we'll not be able to connect the right dots. Everything you have been sent to solve today started from, right? Until you're able to identify the link from the past so that you can connect it to the now, then draw dots to the future. It's so important. Edith, do you want to say something as we round up here? I love that. I think for me, while he was talking, I kept thinking about building legacy, which is something most people think about only when they are in their later years. And we forget that as young people, you know, you never know your time. But more than anything, pouring into someone else's cup will never reduce the size of your own. So I yeah. think having that wisdom to start building legacy and start not just duplicating yourself in others, but making them greater than yourself, I think that comes with a different level of this entire conversation where at the end of the day, we know that if anything were to happen, right, and we're not able to hold our current roles, that there's someone even greater that would step into those shoes. And the humility to allow that to happen, the wisdom to build this person, and the willingness to allow that handover to happen. I think a lot of issues on the continent is lack of willingness to release authority or to release power or to release wealth. That's our problem. The moment we get into a space of building legacy and are no longer threatened, be it by the older or by the younger people, and I think Africa will get to where she deserves to be. Thank you so much, Victor. Thank you. Thank you so much for your very contributions. Thank you so much, Victor Boselli. It was such a fantastic time to even have your report. He came with an energy that brought the room off, literally. <laughs> I love the energy. Thank you so much for everyone who has been a part of this two-day event. We cannot thank you enough. You consistently came in, showed up, listened, took notes, shared your feedbacks, asked questions. Without you, there is no African Government Stakeholders Engagement Forum because it's truly about engaging you to know what the issues are so that we can proffer proper solutions. To all our distinguished panelists, to our keynote speakers, we say a huge thank you. The African Government Stakeholders Engagement Forum is an institution that every year will pick one key critical problem area in Africa, gather stakeholders round table, create solutions, and then post and turn those solutions into frameworks that can now be passed to all the different governments in Africa. So that means every year we would have conversations like this. And you want to partner with what we, want, what we do, you want to volunteer or partner at any level, please feel free to use our official emails, info at agsef.org, or just visit www.agsef.org to be, see all of the things that we will be doing in the next coming years as God helps us. For the conversations we've had in the last two days, do well to share the YouTube link, whether you've watched on YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook, wherever you watch from, share it with as many people as possible, because these conversations really need to be heard. And I hear you when you say, we need to move from conversations to implementation. This is how we start. Without conversation, there's no implementation. Without conversation, there's no resolute conviction in the hearts of people to actually implement. So these conversations are making a difference, one conversation at a time. This was another very phenomenal event in Africa, and of course, globally, because we have people from diaspora that join us. And we know this is a tipping point for all of us in Africa, as far as achieving our One Africa agenda and all the different um, charters on the One Africa on the 2063 agenda of the AU is concerned. And from all of us, God bless you. We love you. We're going to wrap this up by just saying a closing prayer so that we can wrap today up. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for day one. Thank you for day two. Thank you for even putting this idea in our hearts. Thank you for sharing with us the burden you have for Africa. Thank you for teaching us exactly how to propagate what it is you had in your heart. Thank you for gathering the men because it was you who gathered the speakers. It was you who gathered the attendees. It was you who gathered everyone who was a part of this conversation. Father, we thank you. We return the glory to you because we know that this was not just a conversation. As we have obeyed you and set this conversation in motion, we ask, oh Lord, that the people, the partners, the wisdom, the strategies required to take this to a destination where we can uproot systems that don't serve Africa 
Africa and plants the ones that serve Africa, we ask that you release unto us in the name of Jesus. And as a collective, we decree that as we begin to implement these strategies, everything that attempts to stand in our way, Lord, we decree that they get out of the way because this, for so long, Africa has been at the receiving end of all the injustices globally. And as we have decided that enough is enough, we ask that you back us up with your presence, back us up with your wisdom, back us up with your power, back us up with the resources required that we may achieve that which is in your heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Amen. everyone, for all of us at Accept, have a fantastic day. We have come to the end of the AGSEF 2022 edit. I am excited. We did it. It's, yes, it's done. We, it. we bless the Lord. We did it. Oh my we did it. We did it. <laughs> All right, everyone. Bye. And for those of us who I dropped my personal email for, please, I look forward to hearing from you. And I don't know, Edith, I just sense in my spirit that there may be some level of attempted silencing of those who may want to speak up in this school. No, no, no. Let uh, them send the email now before they change their minds. I just... I'll <laughs> we haven't come to fight you. We've just come to help. We want to help. Yeah. And help is what we will do. All right, everyone, have a good day and bye.